Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one. Are made of deeds. Written by Echoing Cascade. Roman was jogging in a park. He loved to do so when he was planet side. It helped him clear his mind. A beautiful young woman ran by him. She winked at him as she passed. He grinned and picked up the pace to catch up to her. He'd been going faster and faster, but he wasn't getting any closer. As if the distance between them was a set value. Hold up. Roman noticed something else. He wasn't getting tired. Granted, he was in great shape, but he was at a dead run for what seemed like seconds now. Wait, seconds? I mean years. Or is it minutes? A suspicion entered his mind, and as he looked around and tried to read the street signs, it was confirmed. The signs were a bunch of gibberish. I'm dreaming, aren't I? He was in a lucid dream. A dream that he knew he could control, and he was planning on having a bit of fun now. He stopped running and beckoned the young woman to him. She stopped jogging and turned to face him, and with every step a piece of clothing made it away, and was replaced by lingerie. Roman couldn't help but smile, until the flesh started to boil and fall off her bones as she kept coming forward. He tried to focus, he to retake control, but the dream seemed to have a life of its own. The beautiful woman was now his high school coach. The man had been fired and sent to prison for what he'd done to some of his classmates. Nothing had happened to him but the realization that it could have had been a terrifying notion. He tried to run, but he was now against the old school locker. He was a kid again, and the man was slowly stretching his hand towards him. He began to cry as he fell to the ground, grabbing his knees, wishing with every fiber of his being to wake up. The creature inside Roman's mind had hunted many in its time, and the terror he could feel emanating from him promised to be a meal to remember. Its hands had but to touch the child to end his life and absorb his psychic energy, but inches before contact, a hand clasped its wrist. To say the creature was confused was an understatement. It turned its head to look at the interloper, an old lady with a skull on her face. He tried to pull his hand free, but he might as well have tried to move a planet out of its orbit. Not only didn't it move at all, it actually hurt to try. The old lady turned to look at the child and said, Get up and fight. Roman looked up between sobs. He hadn't noticed her arrival and was still clearly terrified. The old lady wasn't the patient type and yelled, Guys said get up. Roman got up, tears and snot running from his eyes and nose, closed his fists and made to hit his coach. The creature turned to smile at the old lady. The psychic strength of a terrified Roman wasn't going to do any bang, except it did do something. A hit it felt even through its psychic barrier. When he turned to look, Roman was no longer a child, but a teenager, and he was through another punch, and he felt the barrier crack. When he reared for another punch, Roman was an adult again, tears streaming from his eyes still, but the look on his face was not one of terror, but rage, endless rage. There is a science to throwing a good punch, the alignment of knuckles, the twisting of hips, the footing, etc. The punch that obliterate the creature had none of that. What that punch was backed with wasn't muscle, bone, or technique, but pure fear. Not the cold fear that petrifies a person, but a fiery terror, the kind that pushes the cornered rat to bite the cat. Fear pushed to its limits. Fear that turns to reckless bravery. Roman knelt down, catching his breath as his coach faded away and the old lady moved closer. She grabbed his face with both her hands and kissed him on the forehead. She gave him a warm smile, one he missed every day of his life. He was about to cry again when her smile faded as she pulled his right ear painfully and she began to speak in a reproaching tone. Why don't you do your bed anymore? Don't just stretch it in the morning and call it a day, you lazy bum. Stop eating takeout all the time. I didn't teach you to cook to see you slowly kill yourself with junk food. And another thing, Roman woke with a start. That was some freaking nightmare. He looked around and had for a fraction of a second to be confused before a data pad hit him in the face. His assailant managed a few more bets before Roman could speak. Ow, oh, what the hell? Stop that. He looked at the A.N. nurse that had tried to bludgeon him with a diagnosis tablet. 
She looked panicked. You're supposed to be in a coma. A moment went by as neither one was sure what to say next. Sorry, I guess. The door to the medical bay opened and the A.N. doctor entered. He was taken aback by the situation, but rallied quickly. Okay, Roman, I need you to stay calm. You have been in a coma for three days. Roman tilted his head in confusion. You were part of a scouting mission and caught a psychic parasite, one we don't have a cure for. To be quite frank, we expected you to die in your sleep. The nurse nodded quickly. Could you tell me what you remember? Roman explained all he saw in his dream and turned to Nightmare. You recognize the old lady. Roman gave a sad smile. Yeah, it was my mom. My, my best guess is that the parasite had never faced a sentient with a flight or fight response mechanism and my subconscious conjured up my mom to trigger my will to fight. At this point, Roman's stomach decided it deserved some attention and growled loudly. The doctor put a hand on Roman's shoulder and told him to get something to eat. As Roman left the med bay, the doctor began to review what the instruments had recorded, and as he started to chide the nurse for hitting Roman to the tune of no, being startled is not the reason to concuss a patient. He missed a spike in psychic energy, a fraction of a second when the psychic signature of the parasite and Roman had been joined by a third force, one that held the parasite just long enough for Roman to win. End of story. Story number two. World Builders, written by Ozzy Endeavor. I was asleep, I think. For how long? I don't know. That I even exist before now. I open my eyes and I look upon her. It's so small. I shouldn't even be able to see it, yet I can. My vision hones in on it. A small blue speck in the empty void. It's spinning fast. It's revolving over and over as it flies around Sol Earth. So, how do I know these names? It must be because that's where humans reside. What is a human? Why is that important to me? I can see them down there, living their lives at the speed of light. They tell each other stories, weaving realities from the darkness and give them life. Their minds are vast and complicated, more so than even my own. Their eyes shine with wonder, and from their mouths flows an ambrosia of the stars. That is where I come in, isn't it? From the stories I was born. They are my parents. I try to move towards the earth, towards them. My body doesn't move, but I can feel myself drawing closer to them. They don't even notice. Every once in a while, I hear my name mentioned, Leo. My name is Leo. I roar to the heavens, for the humans wish it so. I call out to them, but they cannot hear me. I call again, and no answer. Eventually, their stories turn away from me. I stop evolving, and yet they keep creating. Please do not be sad, Leo. A voice pierces the darkness. It comes not from Earth, but from the stars. Just as quick as it arrived, it faded. And yet I know he is here. I see him, Taurus. I see his history stretching far beyond my own. Ishtar, Gilgamesh, Enkidu, Inanya, Zeus, Europa. Leo. They will not forget you, Leo. They always remember their creations, and they always return. We always wait for them. I'm not alone up here after all. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. We're all siblings. We're all the children of humanity. After ages of waiting, some humans return to me. They give me fire. They give me passion. They give me the sun. They give me pride. Who am I? I am Leo. Why? Because the humans decree it so. Who are the humans? Creators, weavers, artists, parents. They take nothing and turn it into a whole universe. They build worlds. Don't even notice. As their minds stretch into eternity, their creation knows no bounds. I didn't exist, but now I do, thanks to them. Hercules never slew me, but then he did, 
thanks to them. I was never king, but then I was, thanks to them. What they say is true, whether the universe wishes it or not. End of story. Story number one, Cold Bodies, written by Scotson. The walls dripped in crimson, two figures standing in the middle of the blood-soaked room. Rags held up to their mandibles. What do you think, Gibby? The first asked, pointing to one of the bits of skull embedded in the ceiling. Belgeval, this was obviously some kind of hit, the second said, leaning down and swiping part of the dingy apartment's blood floor with his spindly fingers. But who? Who killed this person, or who is it that's currently this new coat of paint? Yes. The first alien smacked the second. Don't start. Look, the blood's still dripping. I'm assuming that this just happened... That means our friend outside might be able to do what he does. Gibby's glossy eyes turned milky white. You don't mean that you believe that, do you? Javar walked away, heading towards the apartment's automatic door. Just wait, she's a sight to see. The investigators walked out of the room, shouting to someone unseen. Another voice joined him outside, and the two conversed before Javar walked back in, gesturing someone else to walk ahead of him. In strolled a human, a woman her face covered in scars and the United Empire bandana wrapped around her neck. She carried the weight of a mercenary, one that had tumbled through several clotheslines worth of bondoliers and trench coats. Why is it always bondoliers? Shut up! That's the good parts coming up. Jamal made a following introductory gesture to Kivi. Kivi, this is Samantha. You might know her as one of the Lords of War. Kivi bowed to her expecting her to return the gesture. Instead, she moved and lit a cigar in her mouth, looking around the bloody room. Hmm. What was the complaint about? Gibby blinked, then reached for his datapad, looking up the emergency call report. Neighbors said that they heard screaming, then some kind of zipping noise, then one of the security drones comes in and finds uh, this. Samantha nodded. Hmm. I grew up in Raven. Seen this before. That's not even part of the UE. Shh. Suddenly, the human began to look for something else in the room. Her one uneye patched eye settled on the dim light of an open auto door, and without a word, she strolled towards it, hands in her pockets. The two investigators followed, finding themselves in an apartment's bathroom, and Samantha silently standing in the middle of it. Uh, Kibby began, is there something in here? Samantha looked over her shoulder. Yep she confirmed, pointing to the bathtub at the far end of the room. Found my hot spot. Your what? She walked over, turning the faucet and letting water pour into the tub, quickly filling it up. Samantha, Gibby asked again. What are you doing? Okay, what the hell is with her name? I think they like it. Tried to combine the human and snake name and, uh... When the bathtub was full, the human turned off the faucet and dug around in her pockets. From one of them, she withdrew a small blue pearl and hefted it into the tub. A hissing reaction followed, bubbles pouring from the impact point as a wave of frigid air filled the bathroom. Loosely packed ice began to float on the top of the water, finally settling into the tub of icy bath water. The cigar in Samantha's mouth ran low, and she flicked the stub into the water. It went out with a hiss, and she produced another one from a bondolier placing it in her mouth and pulling a small string that set off the chemical reaction inside it, lighting it with a surge of chemical odor. She took a puff and then walked over and set her foot on the bathtub. Kibby ran forward to stop her, but was blocked by Jabal's arm. What is she doing? He protested as she lowered herself into the frigid water. Old custom, Javar explained. Lords of all think better when they're in cold water. I don't think that's true. This show makes some assumptions. And the cigar also helps me think, Samantha grunted. Taking a deep breath, she leaned her head back in the tub and slowly began to zone out of the world around her. Suddenly, equations appeared before her eyes, flashing into existence in a second before being solved and discarded into the void. They splatter platens of victims formed a brilliant puzzle in her mind, each dripping pieces slowly coalescing into the only true conclusion. It was a plasma double pulse that did the job. But she needed more. Her breathing slowed, and the tinges of hypothermia creeped into her mind. 
Her eyes fluttered shut, blackness overtaking her. She found herself alone in the void. Not alone. Some distance away was a bench sitting under a single lit lamppost. A lone stranger sat on one side, a figure that greatly resembled the species of Kivi and Jabbar, stockier and wearing ornate furring robes. Their presence demanded Samantha's attention. She slowly walked over, hands again in her pockets. The stranger regarded her with caution as she sat down beside him. She drew another cigar from the bondolier, putting the string and holding it up to the stranger. The spirit said nothing for a moment, then plucked the lit cigar from her fingers, bringing it up to its mouth and taking a long drag on the stogie. Wait, how does she have cigars? Did the cigars die too? It ex- it's explained later. Help me out, Samantha asked. The spirit of the murder victim nodded. Javar, it muttered and slowly faded away into darkness. The cigar and all. Samantha woke up in a bath of ice, the two investigators leaning over her. Miss Sato, Javar yelled, waving his claws in front of her face. Are you still with us? The human blinked a few times before suddenly standing up in the ice water, cubes and ice bouncing off her wet jacket. Without even regarding Javar or Kivi, she walked to the door and then suddenly spun around, drawing out her revolver and pointing it straight at Javar's head. Javar, she uttered, you are under arrest. The hollow screen was paused, stuck at the image of the human pointing her gun straight at the alien's head. Okay, Jack started. So, like, uh, the spirit said Javar did it. Brahi shrugged from his coiled position in the trade ship's rec room. She freezes herself and talks to the dead, but the dead can only say one word. Why? Spoilers. Jack rolled his eyes. And why does she have to get in cold water in the first place? It's like the stereotype some eyes think of us. Apparently... They think we can think better when it's cold or we're in cold water. So, uh, she's basically getting cold to think better and put together the murder scene and basically freezes herself almost to death to talk to the dead. That's the idea, yeah. And why would Javal come to the murder scene if he knows she can do this? You don't know. He actually did it yet. We just get to watch the rest of the episode. But he did do it. After a beat... The Hassoul relented. Okay, so the thing about the show is that season one isn't really good, but it gets better. I don't know. I still have to catch up with urban combat. Trust me, it's worth it. There's an episode where she meets Shakespeare. Jack stared at the hollow screen for a moment, weighing his options. He finally gave a defeated sigh and paused the episode all right, but I'm choosing the next show. Is it? Uh, it's an anime. Addendum. Cold Bodies is a hollow screen series produced by the Eternal College of Arts, generally circulated in the media around the upper Perseus arm and exported elsewhere in the galaxy. The plot revolves around Samantha Sato, a lord with the ability to speak with the dead when immersed in a cold environment, typically cold water. This plot device stems from an inaccurate belief that both humans and Hassoul can think at higher levels when freezing. And the show even attempts various pseudo-scientific explanations for this non-existent phenomenon. Each episode revolves around a mystery where Sato uses both her natural abilities and her supernatural ones to find the murderer, or sometime recover a stolen artifact. Despite its mild popularity, the show had suffered criticism from lack of research of Lord Biology culture, names, or history, especially since the main character is a human. But these factors are often cited as the very reason the show was found a small but dedicated following, with some citing, it's so bad, it's good, quality, or an adamant belief the series comes into its own around season six. End of story. Story number two. Little Struggles, written by Hidden Fox. The ceiling was cold grey, and by every account, perfectly normal. Keth stared at it. Everyone has battles. This was Keth's. The sound outside his room echoed through the ship. People were waking up. Keth stared at the ceiling. He needed to get up. It's really not that hard. Sit up, pull up the blanket, and stand up. Simple. Still, Keth stared at the ceiling. The bed was uncomfortable. Keth 
was uncomfortable. He crawled in his skin. He was repulsed by his mere existence near the bed. Yet, he did not move. Keth stared at the ceiling. There was a day ahead of him. There were things to do. Keth stared at the ceiling. He needed to get up. He did not move. He could barely bring himself to blink. It's easy. Move. You don't have to think about it. Just do. Until you can't. You just do your job until you can't. Be you, be you, until you can't. And Keth stared at the ceiling. Humans are resilient, you know. It takes a lot to bring one down. They can lift several times their body weight. Then can recover from severed limbs. They can work while sick. They can just keep on going. And Keth stared at the ceiling. Humans are fragile. They can drown in half an inch of water. Their muscles can hurt themselves. They can be paralyzed permanently from a small fall. And they can't keep going. Keth couldn't do it. He didn't know why. He wanted to get up. He couldn't. His arm worked perfectly fine, but he couldn't move it. He wanted. He needed to get up, but he just couldn't. With his full concentration, his full effort, he curled a finger and he made a fist. With monumental effort, he managed to poke his hand out from under the blanket and strained his mind, his body, his soul, and managed to sit up. It was, by all accounts, a perfectly average day. Story number one. The Shadow. Written by Nobleman L.T. The creature, secretly cuffed to the hook on the table, was slowly coming back to consciousness. Without even its stereotypical eyes fully opened, its shadow jumped into guarded position. The creature was soon to follow. But it noticed the cubs, and after slowly sitting upright, just pulled them a couple of times, probably just testing the strength of the bindings. We had to improvise. The ship's encounter was barely over, and our scanners indicated that only a few materials would be able to keep it relatively restrained. Its shadow started moving around the room, lighting up the various colors on different parts of the body. Fascinating. It's as if the gaze leads the shadow to simulate an outcome. After a couple seconds, the shadow began drifting behind the creature, and a deep red light started to glow where the cups were touching the creature's surface. It is obviously aware of the bindings and is calming down for now. I step forward. Both it and the shadow immediately focus on my body. I wait a couple seconds to show that I am not aggressive. They both calm down as I approach opposite the creature. We need to know what it is, where it comes from, and how many are there. I project my shadow in front of its face, forming an inquisitive sphere to ask about its origins. No reaction. The creature just stares at me. His shadow is pulsating red on the end of its limbs, where the cuffs are attached to the host's body. I try to push my shadow inside of his brain. As soon as my projection touches the skin, his shadow quickly swats at my sphere, like it was a Garuvian fly, causing me to step back and almost lose my balance. The creature faces shows no reaction, aside from a small eye twitch due to a drop of its blood rolling down from its head. One would assume with such prominent shadow, telepathy would be preferred mode of communication for this creature. Fine, we'll use sound waves. Fortunately, all interrogation rooms come standard equipped with a universal translator. Who are you? I ask. The shadows immediately stood up and started looking around the room for the source of the sound. The creature lifted its eyebrow in surprise and replied, Darbus. The shadow calmed down and was no longer interested in the source of the sound. Where are you from? I continued. His shadow started to slowly envelop his body, returning a natural black into a deep, deep red color. I've never seen anything like it. It's as if there's two separate creatures. The host is unaware of the shadow, and the shadow protects the host from the outside world. I knew I had to calm him down before he hurts himself. My apologies, sir. We just want to know who you are. Our first encounter was a bit chaotic. We received a signal that some sort of organic matter was crossing the perimeter of reservation. We jumped to location and found you. We tried to pull you in gently to our hangar bay, but uh, you opened fire and triggered a resonance in our beam, causing our ship to explode. The creature stopped hugging the creature, and its color turned back to black, 
except for the wrists that were still bright red. Both the host and the shadow seemed to be very aware of the bindings. Uh, I see. Reservation, you say? Well, well, that explains a lot. The shadow began pulsating with lights where his head should be. You just blew my mind. I assure you, we do not wish to blow your mind. We, in fact, would very much like to keep it functioning as long as possible. A creature with such an impressive shadow is quite a valuable resource. I mean, it's not that impressive. It all depends on the light source uh, and angle. Fascinating. Do you believe I'm talking about the dark area created by you blocking the light? Well, yeah. What other shadows are there? You mean to tell me you don't see that? And I pointed at the dark cloud behind him. See what? There's nothing else here besides you and me. Fascinating. Good to know. I shape my shadow into a sharp bolt and fire it with all my might. What happened next was like a bad joke. His shadow just caught my projection in one of its limbs, looked at it and threw it to the ground, causing me to also drop to my knees. This time, however, the host looked angry. Did you just try to probe my mind? Are you some kind of telepath? We have the fiction of our capabilities like that. Never thought it would be actually possible. I gather myself up, still shaken from the sharp pain. Look at the creature, do shadow, and say, Your shadow is very potent. You will be a valuable resource for harvesting. The weapons we can produce with such a psychic potency, such raw emotion as fuel, nobody will be able to stand in our way. Tell me where you come from, and I promise a painless integration in our systems. His skin suddenly changes from white to a red. His shadow matches that color when quickly wraps around his host's body. Before his face would be consumed, he just utters, I don't think so. Suddenly, the glowing areas on his wrists move to his left arm and become extremely bright. The creature puts his left hand down on the table and smashes with his right arm. The shadow pulsating white veins with pain of the host felt, but it's as if it was absorbing the neural signals to numb the sensation, and only a small amount of the light made it all the way to the brain. The creature smashed his hand again, breaking the largest digit. Again, the pain signals were absorbed by the shadow. How is he not aware of this? It seems impossible. I was watching his actions in disbelief. With a thumb broken, he slipped his left hand out of the cuff, the chain now dangling loose in his right. He gripped it tight and proceeded to walk towards me. His shadow shroud began glowing red where his eyes were. I knew what was coming. He began to beat me with the chain until I could no longer get up. With every hit, his shadow sent pulses of joy throughout his body, rewarding his violent frenzy every time his strike landed. And the host reveled in this violence, each strike stronger than the last. Two creatures, one physical, one mental, pushing each other further and further into bloodlust. Soon I felt almost no pain as darkness began to consume me. Death was coming for me. My own shadow let out a scream of hopeless terror, as I heard many times before from my enemies. Involuntary reaction. I was ashamed I could not control my shadow in these final moments, that my civilized psyche reverted back to the prey instincts my species once was. But the creature stopped. It's as if they heard my dying scream. Both the host and the shadow turned bright blue. I haven't seen the color of mercy in a long time. Last thing I remember seeing, he touched his neck with two fingers. Did you get all that? Yeah, harvesters. I know, right? Brains are so cliche. All right, send you back. I'll meet you at the hangar. Then proceeded to punch a hole in the composite plastic door and leave. His shadow still shrouding his body, still numbing the pain, still feeding his frenzy with every punch. End of story. Story number two. Admiral Stabby's Conquest of Baymaid. Written by Weijin Warrior. The Bermadian Emperor loomed over the table, dwarfing the seated Terran delegation. The rest of the Bermadian delegation stood to one side, with the one known of the mouth standing slightly ahead of the others. Against the far wall, an honor guard of the Terran Space Navy was watching. The negotiations had been going on for days, with no end in sight. Tradition, the Emperor's mouth said for the nth time must be upheld. Only the Emperor can command the respect and obedience of the Mermadians. Only the Emperor can lead the Mermadians, and there is no tradition, no mention on the law of the Emperors to surrender. Your navy is history. 
one of the human delegations pointed out patiently. Your army is but dust. Your cities are rubble. Surrender is the only sensible option available to you at this point. We acknowledge that, the Emperor's mouth replied. But there is no tradition for it. We must follow tradition. Without tradition, what are we? We recognize the need to lay down our arms, but we have no tradition for it. The Terran delegation whispered amongst themselves. Just as one of them got ready to speak up, there was a commotion from the entranceway. Admiral on deck, one of the Terran marines shouted, resulting in the din of human soldiers straightening up. The Bermadians straightened too, trying to perceive what the commotion was about. While nothing could be seen, two of the human soldiers flinched while trying to stand to attention. What is going on? the mouth demanded. I think... Yes, one of the Terran delegations said as he lifted his legs off the floor. It seems like Grand Admiral of the Fleet Stabby has decided to grace us with his visit. He is uh, a tradition in Terran Space Navy. A soft whine was heard as the highly modified autonomous cleaning pot whizzed past. Two of the Bermadians suddenly bent over, grabbing their suddenly bleeding lower limbs. Origin is lost in the depths of time, the Terran delegate said continued, or rather in the depths of Navy law. But tradition is that if Grand Admiral of the Fleet Stabby, um, stabs someone, he gains the rank of that person stabbed. The Mermadians looked at one another. This is uh, traditional, the mouth asked as the Mermadian Emperor flinched and looked down. Oh yes, the Navy is quite insistent upon it, like, uh, oh, splicing the main brace and crossing the line. I believe, the mouth said slowly as the Emperor brought his hand up after touching his lower limb, bright green with blood. Then we might have a solution. By the grace of the Emperor Stabby. End of story. Humans are unremarkable. Written by Bo Woodstock. Good morning, everyone. If you are not here for the Warp Mechanics 305, then you're in the wrong class. <laughs> I can see almost got a few of you there. No, this is Xeno Sociology 101 Council Civilizations. Yes, good. Get settled in. We're going to get started right away. All right. So to start, most classes would start at the beginning. If you got into this by any history class or any of the beings who are representatives in the ruling council, they're going to start just about as far back in the past as possible in whatever recorded history they have. This is good if you're trying to understand the people in detail, but not so good if you're trying to understand how they interact with others in the present day. So with that in mind, we're instead going to start with one of the most recent events in Council history. Our newest member in over 100 galactic nanocycles. From what I understand, a number of them will be attending this university next year. So I imagine most of you are curious about them anyways. I know that each of your respective peoples call them by different names. Some more or less prattling than others. But we are going to be referring to them as their own name, yes. I am aware that some of you may not be able to pronounce it due to the anatomical limitations, but you should ensure that your translators are set to translate the proper galactic standard term. They are now respected members of our community as a whole, and I would not tolerate any reference to the bestial primates or slurs about dirt people. I am, of course, talking about humans, or alternatively, Terrans, or by their scientific name, Homo sapiens sapiens. Again, these are the only acceptable terms I'll be hearing in this class, right? Good. Now, the question I would like to pose to you as a class. What makes humans so remarkable? Yes, in the front there. Okay, common misconception, no. It is not their physical capabilities. On their own planet, for example, there are plenty of creatures that can easily overpower them. In our galactic community, they are also not the strongest. There are many insectoid races that have much greater capacity to regenerate, even regrow lost limbs as well. Something humans are incapable of. There are some of you in the room who could beat them in a foot race or speed or endurance, and some of you are able to fly or breathe amphibiously, whereas they are terrestrial in nature, and the ability to throw objects accurately is fairly common trait for any species with binocular vision and decent muscle coordination. Anyone else? No, it is not their intelligence or their ingenuity. While they are a relatively young race in regards to their rate of technological advancement, there are others here with greater mental acuity. I believe the record for industrialization to FTL development is 150 standard planetary cycles, 
My humans achieved it in 200. Any other ideas? Backbonding. Yes, it is known that they make friends easily, which is why they are able to earn their spot in the council so quickly, but no. That in itself is also not remarkable. Several other council member species were able to be diplomatic just as easily. In general, you must remember, without some kind of intersocial relationship, it is impossible to get past living in caves. Every civilized species that we know of had that moment in history where someone realized that by working together with others, even if they seemed different, would result in something greater than the whole. No single civilization ever came about by being nothing but warriors or thinkers. Someone had to build the seeds of civilization in cities. Someone had to be the defender. Someone had to be the farmer, and so on and so forth. They're also not unique in their violent history. I know several of us, including myself, have histories where they're not proud of. One last guess. Anyone? A death world, you say. Well, uh, not completely. Correct. Uh, you are close. Their world has a relatively strong gravitational field, hence human terrestrial nature. But that's a fairly common situation. Several of you hail from worlds with stronger gravity. If you look at conditions on the human's homeworld, there are certainly places that would be hazardous, if not downright lethal to many of us. You have places where water is frozen solid year-round, just as you have places where water is scarcity. The land is nothing more than a hellscape of scorched sand. You have places where the crust of the planet cracks and the molten rock spews forth, and you have places where weather conditions can create storms strong enough to level entire towns. But on top of all of that, you also have rich, fertile plains, forests teeming with life, deep oceans filled with flora and fauna abound. Calling their planet a death world is really a misnomer, because it is a planet filled with life. Humans are part of that life, and they've managed to survive in almost all parts of their world. All right, I'll confess. I began this class with a trick question, the answer to what makes humans remarkable. Nothing. If you look at individual traits, there is nothing that particularly stands out, as per the examples I just gave. So then, why have they succeeded so resoundingly? Well, the first mistake many of us make is that because they are unremarkable, we immediately underestimate them. Any of us here in this class can think of something that they could beat a human at. It's natural behavior. You see something unexpected that you're worried could be a threat. You immediately start thinking about how you can gain an advantage and what they could be better at than you. What you don't think about is what they're still good at, even if they're not the best, compared to the galaxy as a whole. Those of you who can beat a human at wrestling, only if you can catch them. Those of you that can outrun one, good for you, because in a fight, you wouldn't want one to catch you. Those of you who are intellectually adept, I challenge you to survive one night in the wilderness of their home world. It won't go well for you without the immense amount of preparation and maybe some extremely important survival gear. Those of you with stronger familial or pack bonds, strength in numbers, go spend a week alone in a starship in space. I'll make it easier. You can bring one other person with you. How will you be doing by the end of the week? Cut off from contact with your pack or family unit. Probably an emotional wreck. Humans do it all the time, by the way, and it barely phases them. Humans have a say. I know that it's in your respective languages, it might not have the same impact, but in one of their primary languages, it is a rhyming cadence. Jack of all trades, master of none, oftentimes better than master of one. You see, because humans don't excel in any one particular way, they have spent their entire history being generalists, adapting to situation at hand. They had to be, to live on their world. If one of them is incapable of doing something, there is pretty good chance that they know someone who can. That's another thing you're going to notice about them when you finally meet them next year. No two humans are exactly alike. Even in classes of multiple birth siblings that have identical appearance will have different personalities and capabilities. They have a multitude of creeds and religions, which means that something that may be downright offensive to one could be a zero issue to another. While we're on that note, this will also be our biggest challenge when meeting them, getting past any existing preconceptions about how they are. Remember, because no two humans are alike, the experiences you will have with one will not be indicative of how every other time will go. There are some that you will probably hate. There are some that you'll immediately make lifelong friends with. Because of that, 
There is only one piece of advice I can give you that I am confident is true. Don't underestimate them. They will surprise you in more ways than one. End of story. Story number two. Old Gods, written by Conqueror Wiggles. The relics still remain. Remnants of the old gods lie scattered across the galaxy. The elder races have kept their empire whole since time immemorial. They carried on their sacred duty of keeping the memory alive. But all things must come to an end. The elder races are called such because they were there to witness the glory of the old gods. But a rift has opened between them and the more recent additions to the empire. Call it a youthful folly, call it arrogance, but the new species do not follow the traditions of the old gods. One fledgling race in particular, a species of mammalian biped, wages wars in a bid for dominance. This young race had success, their ingenuity matched only by their savagery, had brought them victory after victory. Even the elder races began to fall. The elders who remained knew that they were no match for such ferocity. So they began performing the final rites left to them by the old gods, signaling the end of the empire. It was time to activate the highest and most sacred relic, the master key gifted to the elder races by the old gods, was a tool to ensure that no relics ever fell into the wrong hands. All things must come to an end. When the Master Key were to life, a hologram appeared above it, an avian species that seemed to be cloaked in flames. Soon, the same hologram appeared above every relic in the galaxy, as they too awoke. All things must come to an end. Now that beacons had been lit, the Empire has reached its end. It is the time for the Empire to be reborn. The old gods have awoken. It is time for humans to take back their home. End of story. A Human Guideless, written by Teller of Tall Tales. I lay in the forest path, leg ensnared in a metal trap. It had been days since the rusty metal jaws had closed around my leg. I was weak from hunger and thirst, ready to die, as I watched the carrion birds in the sky circle overhead. Then something crashed through the brush, and I lifted my head. At least, hoping to see the being that would claim my life. In the moments before they appear, I reflected on the slide, hatching alone in a cold crater, bending off the big grey four-legged beasts that nipped at my undeveloped hide, fighting to survive in the foreign forests. Yet alas, a mighty beast like myself, laid low by toothed iron hidden beneath the leaves. The being burst from a bush, a small pack adorning its back, strange clothing, of a blue material covering its pale hide. The human boy froze upon seeing me. After all, I was much larger than it, the size of what humans call a Kodak grizzly. But the boy didn't shy away. Instead, it approached curiously, softly cooing, snapping mad at it as I got closer, bearing sharp teeth designed to tear flesh and chew bone. The human fell back in surprise, staring at me with wide eyes. Then, instead of running away, the boy stood back up and took their pack off, rummaging through it until it pulled something out, a small metal box emblazoned with bright colors. It opened this box and pulled out a flat, white, and square object. With an elegant toss, the object landed in front of me, the tantalizing scent of meat coming from it. Without taking my eyes off the human, I nudged the white square off the top of the object, grabbing the thinly sliced meat with my teeth and snapping it up. My thirst reared its ugly head as I swallowed. As if knowing my struggle, the human boy emptied a metal box of small packages, grabbing a clear bottle and pouring the contents into the container. Setting the box to the ground, the human slid it over at the ground with a long stick until it rested by the white squares. I could smell it, water, pure and clean, in only the way that I could dream of. Thus clouding my judgment, I sank my snout into the container and began to drink the sweet, cold water offered to me. As I was lapping the last drops of moisture from the metal, bending it in the process, I felt the pressure and gain on my leg lessen, making me snap my head up to look. 
The human had their back turned, feet placed firmly on either side of the trap, as they pried the jaws of it open with their slim fingers until I could pull my leg free. When I did so, the human let go of the trap's jaws and fell back, scurrying towards their pack. Fear watered its eyes as I stood over it. Slowly, I lowered my horned head, placing it against the boyish chest, able to feel the terror and dread as if they were my own. I had not a clue why this young human had chosen to free me, knowing that I could kill it as easy as breathing, but I felt no urge to harm this being as I pushed my own thoughts of gratitude into his own as I thought I was speaking. My teeth, my wings, my blood, my flesh, and my hide are indebted to you, small child. Fear no harm that may come your way. The child's heartbeat relaxed, and a soft palm was placed between my horns. The human spoke, giving me a name, a beautifully human concept for something outside of their own species. I'll call you Snappy. We'll be the best of friends forever. I felt the joy radiating off the human as it collected its things and walked off, me tailing at their heels. The human showed me its dwelling, a small wooden building with a gravel road leading up to it. The boy gave me a meat called bologna from a circular package before showing me a medium-sized empty metal shack in the tree line, saying, You can stay here. Mum would be bad if she found out about you. I did not ponder the statement as I found the shack dark and its entrance well obscured. It was comfortable and much preferable to the dank caves I'd lived in until then. Years passed. The boy grew into an exceptional young man whose mother, still unknowing of my presence, grew weaker and weaker with each passing year. I watched as the boy who I'd seen grow cried, into my flanks, wrapped in my wings as humans in white garb removed the woman from the cottage on a wheeled stretcher, my own heart aching with the power of the human sorrow as they cried out. I wish I could help her. She's fought so hard, but it's only gotten worse. It just keeps getting worse. She's going to die, Snappy. I can't stop it. I let the human cry themselves to sleep against my hide, letting them drift away as I lifted myself to my claws. Standing above the human, I bent my neck down and nipped at my ankle, drawing fresh golden blood from the wound. Gently smearing my glistening blood against the boy's lips, I said in my mind what I wished he could hear. My blood, to heal and rejuvenate as you slaked my thirst that fateful day. As the glister faded from the human's lips, I rested. Over the next week, the boy's emotions told all, even without his words. They said, he just went away, like a miracle. The tests keep reporting the cancer is dying impossibly fast. She should be able to come home within a month. I felt joy of my own as the human matured and aged with his mother, often enjoying a meal on the back patio. As he grew into a man, our bond strengthened such that we could share thoughts and emotion across great distances. I grew into my wings, able to fly and perch in the sturdier trees as my form became more lithe and long. A night came, when up the gravel road a vehicle with no headlights approached my human dwelling. Big men, smelling of alcohol and bad intentions, quickly exited the sleek vehicle. They didn't suspect or notice me watching from the tree line as they grabbed the human weapons and approached the door. They didn't make it halfway before I lifted it off the ground with a roar to alarm and wake my human, as I land between the house and the men, making the four of them scramble back on four, my talons digging into the men's shoulders as I heard the door unlock and swing opened. I turned and gazed at my human and their mother, a horrified expression on the woman's face as my human ran out saying, Who the feck are these guys? Why are they here? Stress bleeding from the words. I conveyed my thoughts to him. They approached, weapons drawn, Reeking of malicious intent. My claws are at your command. My human looked at the terrified men, a uniquely human sentiment clawing its way to the surface. Mercy. Let them go. He stated clearly to me before addressing the other four humans. I know not why you decided to come here, whether it was to rub us or kill us, but take this as a turning point. Become better men. Don't waste your one shot. I let go of the man, claws retracting from the warm flesh as I sat back on my haunches by my human. 
my considerable bulk between his mother and the men as they picked up their injured compatriot and loaded him into the vehicle, driving quietly away. I heard my human's mother speak in a shaky, terrified voice. Tim, um, what the hell is that thing? We looked over in perfect unison. I felt a strange emotion from my human. Tim, as I knew him, his name, he felt sad. He hadn't told his mother. Softly he said, Mom, this is Snappy. You know that night way back in grade school when I came home all muddy and my lunchbox was broken? Well, I only told you half the story. I did get pushed into the ditch by some older boys. But the reason my lunchbox was broken and I was missing all of my food was because I gave it to Snappy here, freeing him from the old bear trap. He's been living in Dad's old shed since. The woman's emotions changed from fright and concern to matronly anger. And you never told me. Timothy Derek Kremster, if you weren't an adult already, I would tan your hide for not telling me that you had literally befriended a fucking dragon. Even I shrunk back a little at the small woman's anger, but she took a deep breath and calmed herself, saying, You've got a heart of gold, Tim. It just scares me sometimes how you use it. The next dozen years passed in a blur. Tim's mother aged, and at the ripe age of a hundred, passed peacefully in her sleep, leaving the house and property to a sixty-year-old Tim, who had his own family now. His little girl loved sitting on my back and riding me like her favorite movies when she was but Tim's age, when he saved me. I found myself sleeping in a hand-built shed with proper bedding and heat during the winter months. Tim, his wife, and adult daughter would share the Christmas with me, giving me gifts of fresh venison and shiny trinkets that now adorn those plain shelves in my new home. Never did they ask for anything in return except my company. Then, the day came that the sun was blotted out by a massive ship, entry pods burning into the lower atmosphere. Somehow, I knew it was my own kind returning for this world's judgment. They landed in every major city, huge areas devoted to troops and gear for conquest. I felt my time beginning to draw near as a massive Elden Dracon landed in the yard where I knew I would be. I felt Tim's confusion as he hobbled from the house on his cane, awestruck by the elder's size and bright coloring. But the elder's attention ever strayed from me. In my skull, he asked, Roxel, tell me, do you believe this planet worthy of a place at the high table? Shamefully, I considered that the humans weren't ready. Their war, violence, and disregard for each other seemed unworthy then. Like a ray of light in the darkness, I could only see the good Tim had done. His mercy, his selflessness, his ability to turn the other cheek, but most importantly, his kindness. This human had never done anything to hurt anyone, even against those that may have wished him harm. Bowing deeply in respect, I answered. On my blood, on my flesh, on my hide, my soul, I say to you, humanity deserves a seat at the high table far more than we do, ancient one. The elder considered my words carefully, speaking only when he deigned to. Would you give your life to seal this promise, young Dracon? I felt a part of me revolt at the words, my limbs wobbling beneath me. I heard Tim's cane fall to the ground with a clatter, and suddenly the old man was shaking between me and the elder. The elder's head reared back, ready to strike, but Tim's words stopped those deadly teeth in their tracks. If you're going to make him kill himself so that we can live, go fuck yourself. If you're going to make anyone die for this, make it me. Seal it with my blood. The raw emotion in Tim's voice shook me to my core. He was sobbing, but not from sadness, from anger. The elder gazed at Tim with ancient eyes. No words or emotions in that scaled face, until to my surprise, the elder bowed to Tim, speaking in a tone like falling boulders. Human, you have earned my respect. Your selflessness cools the fire in this ancient heart. Rejoice, for no blood shall be shed on your kind's behalf. Tim fell to his knees. He couldn't stand for very long without his cane, and I could only imagine how hard the stress of the situation made it. The elder lifted a leg, biting a wound in its own scarred flesh, to draw a golden drop of blood that he pressed against Tim's lips. Drink and be restored permanently to your youth, human. 
You have shown the best of your species this day. But Tim did not drink of the elder's sacred blood, instead stating, I wish to die in my bed alongside my wife. I couldn't bear to see her and all that I love fade away, so I remain the snake. Snappy will take my place. He'll know what to do. The elder lowered his leg, and the wound closing almost instantly. Very well, human. May your soul rest peacefully amongst the stars when you pass. Holding my head high, unable to force away the deep sorrow of knowing my greatest friend would pass on before I would see him again. But as we said our last goodbyes, he whispered in my ear, My blood, my flesh, my hands and my hide are all yours, as yours were mine. May we meet again beyond the death's veil, good friend. End of story. Story number one. A Benevolent God, written by Almighty Pancake2321. You are the first to see your God. The drought was made the life this year harsh and unforgiving for your people, and you have had to travel far outside the safe areas of your territory in search of food to gather. Your people barely have enough to feed themselves in the upcoming winter, let alone offer up the required sacrifice for the protection provided by your deity. Still, they do not slow their inexorable advance upon your home. You arrive before they do, and manage to warn your people of their arrival. You swarm around them, begging and pleading for mercy. You are certain that your cries fall upon deaf ears. When they arrive and see naught but empty offerings, they speak in a deaf, booming tongue you cannot understand. Just when you think that they will take from the stalls reserved for feeding your people and their young, they leave the way they came. It is not long until you see their pale white form returning. You pause from feeding the young ones some of your dwindling supplies, fearful that they have returned to lay waste to your people in their wrath and fury. Instead, they reach down and gift you an abundance of the strangest food that you've ever seen. It is so similar to what your people ate and offered to your god, yet so different and so alien at the same time. Either way, your people accept their generosity readily. You see your god often throughout the desolate winter. Each time your people are on the verge of starvation, your food stalls precariously low. They appear once more, bringing with them their ethereal nectar. You sometimes wonder what kind of deal your queen struck with your god when she first arrived in these lands, that they would go so far to save your people from starvation. You are the first to see your god. The spring that followed that terrible winter had broken the drought, and life once again flourished within your territory. There was such an abundance of food that some of your people had struck out on their own, only to find that your deity had provided them with their own home, as if they had known this would happen. Even so, your people have stored enough food that you can easily offer twice your regular sacrifice to your god to make up for the shame of last season. You announce their arrival to your people, and they flock to your god, dancing around them, singing their praises and voices you are certain they could not even hear, let alone understand. They stare at what you have offered them, and a moment of doubt flickers through your mind before their booming voice rings out in their indecipherable language. Then they take only the amount they have traditionally took and disappear once more. What a truly benevolent god. Jane stared into the nearly empty hive, her charges buzzing and clawing around as her. She had known the drought was bad, but she doubted her bees would even make it through the winter with their current food stores. I guess I won't be getting any honey anytime soon. She said to the little insects. Jane often spoke to her bees, and sometimes she swore they even understood her. Hang on a sec, I'll go get some food for you. Back inside her house, Jane quickly made up a small batch of sugar water to feed her single hive. While it was strictly not the best thing for the bees, there wasn't much else she could do for them at this moment. Winter was hard for Jane. A fox had somehow made its way into her coop and killed two of her chickens, before she had found the hole in the wire fence. And her horse, Sadie, had taken a bad fall and broke her leg. Jane had cried 
into the gentle beast's mane when her father arrived with his rifle to ease the poor creature's suffering. The one thing that Jane was truly proud of throughout the winter were her bees. She talked with other keepers online about the best way to help them through the harsh season, and never missed a day of feeding them. She called them her little troopers, and promised that if the drought ever ended, she would plant an entire lawn around them with fields of wildflowers. Her resilient little bees not only survived the winter, but came out the end and almost no worse for wear. The day the drop broke, in the early spring, Jane laughed and danced under the pouring rain. Just as she promised, she threw wildfire seeds all around the her hive, and even reserved a small spot in one of her fields to plant even more. They grew like weeds all over, but Jane didn't care. When her bees had prospered enough to swap, she almost cried and quickly set up a new hive near the first to house the new queen. It was nearing the end of autumn now, and the experts were talking about returning dry spell. Jane walked towards her eyes, clad in her all-white beekeeping suit and surrounded by her dancing and bumbling little troopers. She opened the lid to that first hive, and a smile broke out under her mask at the racks of chalk full of that golden amber liquid. I'm so proud of you, little guys, Jane said after a moment. The bees slowed a touch as they whizzed past her, almost as if they were listening to her speak. But times are going to be tough for a bit soon. I think I'll leave you a bit extra for now, so that we don't have a repeat of last year. End of story. Story number two. Blood of Red, written by Aussie Endeavor. Blood of blue is kind of true. Blood of green is wise and green. Blood of red, you're already dead. With blood of iron and heart of steel, humanity yearns to fight with zeal. When enemies come to where we dwell, humans will make their last days hell. When we need help, paint the sky red, and the attacker's soul will fill with dread. A guardian's glow comes from above, for the hero's sign, the red dove. If blood flows falls from the fallen kin, a bright of fire burns within. In a war they burn and blister, a scarlet storm, typhoon and twister. This story started near dawn of time, when space was young and all stars shined. This world was abused, ransacked and dry. That was when humanity heard our cry. Their red fire brought us light, and so we hoped to help them fight. The humans said to my weak face, Just try to get to a safe place. They asked for nothing, not even a quark, before returning to the embracing dark. When blood and red fell in our drought, the tree of life began to sprout. Fallen angels rising from void to bring bright light where is the void. A scarlet glow now lights our homes, for a human's grace filled our tomes. Blue and green alike rejoice when we hear a red's voice. So, if this danger left uncured, listen closely to my word. If someone wants to cause you harm, all you do is sound the alarm. The villains will be filled with fright when a human comes in the night. Galaki Halev, Greenblood, survivor of the Battle of Rhyme 7. Story number three. I Know I'm Not, written by Echoing Cascade. Philosophy, the study of fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence, a field of study that is dear to humans. Which is why, when I heard of a multi-species philosophy class, I signed up. Laurie was talking to an unamused iron security officer, who was making a get-on-with-it motions. Today's subject was colors and taste, and they differ the individual to individual, and our perception of reality, Laurie sighed. And then I brought up the notion of the brain in a jar, which led to this. She spread her arms to a dozen of students, either gibbering in the fetal position on the ground, or completely catatonic. The security guard raised an eyebrow, clearly not buying it, and spoke. Okay, what the hell is the brain in a jar? Laurie thought for a second before nodding. No stimulus our bodies receive are eventually translated into electric impulses sent to our brain, the guard nodded. So we can technically be nothing more than a brain in a jar, getting electrical messages that simulate our whole lives. The guard nodded, a bit slower, clearly struggling with the idea. So I asked the teacher the classic question, prove you're not a brain in a jar. The guard snorted, that's easy, you saw me get here. If I'm standing in front of you, obviously I'm not a brain in a jar. Laurie shook her head, 
No, prove to yourself you are not a rain in a jar. The guard's grin faltered, then a look of confusion overcame his features, followed by a realization that it freezing into a mask of terror. Sir? Laurie waved a hand in front of the guard's face with no reaction. Oh, for frack's sake! The second guard entered the room. You! The hell happened here? Laurie face blomed before speaking. Philosophy. The study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. A, a field of study that is dear. Then she stopped and put her hands forward instead. You know what? Just take me to a cell and call the embassy. For the sake of my sanity and, um, yours. It took a few days, but eventually became clear that not all species could shrug off existential dread like humans do, and philosophy became something that was not to be spoken without a signed waiver for humans at large. End of story. The Acculturation Recruiter, written by Something Touches Back. The screen in the main room was briefing a news story about humans again, but the only member of the Kofkoda's family that was paying any attention was the daughter, Ona. Ona was 16 years old and nearly the end of her final year of compulsory school. The news was just another filler bit about some group of humans on short, getting a little wild and damaging an entertainment establishment before being rounded up by the more humans in black armor and dragged back off planet. It happened every few weeks, ever since, five or so years ago. The humans appeared out of the black and set up a forward logistics space amongst the outer planets. The Kobolins only barely had interplanetary travel capability and were a long way from interstellar travel. So when the humans moved in, the Kobolins had little choice but to say, Yes, sir. But, to their credit, the humans seemed to be at least be trying to be good neighbors. They set up a few embassies around the planet, including one just an hour away, did their best to police their satyrs, and otherwise pretty much left the Kobolins alone. Ona wasn't paying attention to the content of the news. She was drawing the humans that the story was about. Humans and Kobolins had very similar body structures overall, but Ona was struggling to draw their hands, palm up. Human hands had five digits in a one four zero arrangement, one digit sticking out of the palm away from the center of their body, four digits sticking out of the palm opposite the wrist, and nothing on the body center side. Each digit had three joints. Anna had many times drawn Kobolin hands with their 404 arrangement of the four joint fingers and found human hands to be strange and rather limiting in their dexterity. She looked over at her much younger brother, Hod, and briefly wondered how human children could count on their fingers with so few of them. It didn't occur to her that humans count to a base 10 instead of base 16. Ona's artistic skills were helped by her mother, you say, a teacher of music and visual arts at the local early ages compulsory school. Ona's math and science skills were relentlessly drilled into her by her father, Bessel. Bessel was a physics professor at the local university, and he was coming up in his tenure review. He was currently sitting at his desk behind Ona in the main room going over a presentation that he would be making in the morning. Ona dreamed of being an engineer, or an astronaut, or something of that nature, but was having trouble finding a university that would accept her. All of the good technical universities, including the one her father worked at, were male only. Goblin culture was limiting in that respect. Morning came, and Professor B.S.L. Kofkodas gave his talk on the relationship between energy and wavelength for a body in thermodynamic equilibrium. It was a disaster. Professor Mond, the head of the physics department, slammed the table he was sitting at. Professor Kofkodas, we've heard this nonsense before. Your theories depend on a constant that implies that there is a minimum discrete value of energy. I've told you before that this is absurd. Obviously, energy is continuous value that can be cut in half indefinitely. What's next? Are you going to tell me that there is some discrete minimum value for momentum? What about gravity? Hell, why not time itself? Tenure is denied and... At the end of the semester, this institution no longer has need of your services. It was still early in the day when Beersel found himself in an off-campus bar nursing some strong ethanol. The poured out on his paper on the bar beside him. He only pulled himself out of his glass to notice his surroundings when a hand picked up his paper. A hand with five digits. The human caressed the paper and said, I like it. 
I liked your presentation of it. Perhaps you are the wrong college for this sort of thing. If you are interested in teaching and learning at a college where what the humans call, he caressed the paper again, quantum mechanics is appreciated, come visit me. Then the human was gone. On the bar where Beersol's paper and business card were John Anderson, special skills liaison recruiting office, and an address at the human embassy. It was lunchtime and Yusei Kofgodis decided to eat lunch outside of a classroom for once. As she sat in a small diner eating an overpriced sandwich and sipping tea, she read the bulletin again. Budget cuts were forcing the school to end its non-essential music and visual arts program for all elementary age students. Non-essential, and yet the government can find money to repaint all of the public trash cans to look like flower pots as long as the right friend of a friend gets a kickback. At the end of the semester, she would be out of a job. Enraged as she was, she didn't notice when the background noise dropped considerably. It wasn't until a shadow fell across her table that she looked up to see the eyes of a human. A layoff notice, sir. A lot of that going around today, said the human. Kobolin music is very different from human music, for example. Where we have an eight-note scale, you have a sixteen-note scale. The principles of composition in your visual arts are similarly unusual. Have you considered taking a sabbatical to learn about human art and teach humans about Kobolin art? Think about it. Here's my card. And as the human smiled and left, you say realized that everybody else at the diner was silently staring at her. She looked down at the card in her hand. John Anderson. Special Skills Liaison Recruiting Office. It was afternoon recess, and Hod Kofgodis was sitting on a bench where the teaching assistants had placed him. With his paralyzed legs, recess was just boredom and humiliation. The teaching assistants could not comprehend, no matter how many times he told them, that he did not enjoy watching the biggest kids in the class playing pushball. Why would he want to watch two teams line up facing each other and then push into each other, hoping to carry a ball four more body lengths in four plays or less? He didn't have functioning legs, and those same kids loved to call him a freak and push him in the hallways when they passed. It wasn't until both teams stopped moving, got quiet, and stared at him that Hod realized that he wasn't alone. An adult human male had sat down next to him. You know, Hod, the human said, where I'm from, people without legs can still get around and do things. I hear you're at the top of your class in math and reading. That just makes the pushy kids push me more, said Hod. It makes them mad that I'm better than them at something. There once was a human named Franklin Roosevelt that was paralyzed like you. He became the leader of the most powerful nation on my home world in a time of war. There was another man named Stephen Hawking who could also not use his legs. He became a physicist like your father. If we can't fix your legs, we can at least provide machines that make your legs less of a problem, and the environment where you could respect it and not be pushed. Keep those thoughts in mind, and be open-minded if your parents suggest a change in scenery. Okay? The human patted Hod's shoulder and got up. As he was walking away, he turned and said, Oh, my name is John. Take care. The last period of the day featured a calculus test. Ona completed it within 20 minutes to spare, but the rules said that she had to sit quietly until the end. She turned to the black back page and started doodling. Finally, the end of period signal chirped and everybody passed their tests forward. When the tests got to the front, that jerk Herkel snatched her test out of the stack and waved it around showing everybody the doodles and making mocking comments about Ona wanting to be an astronaut. The mocking didn't stop even after they exited this classroom. Harkel and three of his friends grabbed Ona's heavily doodled and notebook and, holding it up while running backwards, called Ona all manner of unfeminine names. Suddenly, a new hand clasped the notebook. All four boys turned around, went instantly quiet, and then spread apart from the owner of the new hand like they had just seen death himself. The human thumbed through the notebook, looking at the drawings in amongst the class notes, and then closing the notebook as he did so, started walking towards Ona. So, Miss Kofgogodus, you like to draw spacecraft and sometimes humans. When he got close enough, he held Ona's notebook out to her and said, Did you know that we have both males and females at all ranks in our space fleet, starting with our space fleet academy? Do you have female kobolins in your space fleet? Not yet. 
Someone has to be brave enough to be the first to apply. Ono stared at the human in disbelief. How did you know my name? It's what I do, the human said. I understand you're still thinking about where to go for your advanced education studies. Here's my card. Think it over. Ono stared at the back of the human until he passed out of sight. John Anderson, Special Skills Liaison Recruiting Office. Having missed the bus, Ono started the long walk home, lost in her thoughts. Then uh, started out pretty quiet of the Kofgoda's home. Everyone had something to say, and nobody quite knew how to start. But... You say, asked Bear Cell how his tenure presentation went. He said quietly, They are dismissing me at the end of the semester. Yassel replied, They are laying me off and shutting down my department at the end of the semester. The room was silent again until Yusei said, Maybe we should try a, uh, s somewhere else? Bear Cell looked at her. A man named Anderson offered me a job. Owner pulled a small card out of a pocket. John Anderson? Hod piped up. John's a nice. He said they could do something to help me move around on my own. Everybody looked at Hod, and then Yusei pulled out a small card and said, John Anderson gets around. The next day, everybody skipped their scheduled appointments by claiming family emergency, and the Kovkudas family piled into their vehicle and headed for the human embassy. When they got there and showed the guards John's card, Hod was thrilled that the first thing they did was produce a powered wheelchair and show him how to use the joystick control to drive it. They even let him run it up top speed around the limousine loop to get a feel of the chair. Then as the family was led through the building to Mr. Anderson's office, it was not lost on Yusei that the entire building was constructed in such a way as to allow the chair to travel through it. In contrast, Gobelin architecture tended to favor steps and curbs everywhere under the theory that differences in elevation allow important people to select good vantage points, either to see or be seen. It was a long and tiring day. There were many details to be worked out and many forms to sign. But at the end of it, everything was finalized. At the end of the current school semester, the Kofgoda's family was immigrating to Earth. Beersol finally asked the question that everybody, well, everybody but young Hod was thinking. Why? I have no doubt our family will benefit tremendously from this, but why are you humans footing the bull? Why, what do you get out of this? Mr. Anderson sat back. We have found that if we just pop in on a few new species and dump a bunch of technology on them, it crashes their economy. If we try to make social changes like equal civil rights or independent and gender or caste, we get re reactionary pushback and civil unrest. If we try to impose a unified planetary government, it's the same story. Any sudden change imposed from an outside will destabilize the society. So now we take a different approach. Over time, we identify promising families and integrate them as a family into our society and systems. As more and more Koblenz get used to living and working with humans and the other alien species that we have already integrated with, Koblenz as a whole will start developing a multi-species mindset. As more and more Koblenz learn our science and technology from the comforting perspective of it being our technology, they will start to get comfortable with being their technology too. In a few years, our ideas and thermodynamics, for instance, will no longer be seen as radical. When human art and Koblen art start borrowing from each other, that too helps build a multi-species mindset. When Osa returns as a captain of her own starship, Koblen attitudes about their woman will slowly change. Then when Koblen see Hod being self-sufficient in his wheelchair, attitudes about Koblenz with disabilities will change. In short, rather than uplifting your people from the outside, we help you uplift your people from the inside. One family at a time until, very soon, Koblenz. Humans and all the other species we have contacted are joined together in one big multi-species family. As you know, the facilities we have built in your outer systems are forward logistics space supporting our fleets. You may not have thought about exactly what that means. We are part of a coalition of species that is in a large and protracted war with another coalition of species. That other coalition has very different philosophy about social organization. In times like these, friends are the most important resource in the galaxy. And I'm here to make some. 
End of story. Story number one. All work, no play. Written by Heathborn. We found the humans. We were immediately baffled by their stupidity. Long, long before actually meeting them, their transmissions reached our senses. If the contents of these radio signals surprised us, their form was even stranger. At least to my forebearers of the revered order of military intelligence. After action combat reports from places we had never discovered detailed depictions of life forms we had yet to encounter. Some were highly detailed, while others were crudely replicated, obviously after the fact. But the strangest of all, every single scrap of information was entirely unencrypted, transmitting everything in the glare, as if taunting the universe to take them on. Needless to say, we kept our distance. The annals speak of much disagreement in those days, erupting between the revered order and the various martial branches. In the end, however, cooler heads prevailed. We would take our time, study the human, and figure out what kind of enemy our militants would one day be facing. Only then would we strike. But there was much to figure out. Their transmissions clearly showed advanced starships of baffling capabilities, with several astounding new ways to approach FTL travel. These designs had clearly been put to good use, as we saw conclusive evidence of humanity having operated at an intergalactic level for ages already, by the time we put them in our scopes. Yet, for all of this, all their broadcasts emanating from a single world, there were many hypotheses as to why. A popular early thesis posited that the humans were using an underdeveloped world as a lure. It was bait, pure and simple, put in a place to draw out more gullible races and annihilate their warships. Then, the responsible philosopher monk suggested the humans would move on to massacre and enslave the aggressors' populations, plunder their resources, and integrate their technologies. It was a popular idea because it fit. The humans appeared to be a bloodthirsty, warlike race, hungry for resources and eager to enslave. It would also explain the vast variety of starship designs in their arsenal and why we had yet to meet any of the races they had clearly encountered so far. And thus, enormous resources were dedicated to exploring this possibility. The blood of the serfs ran forth in rivers around the many great shipyards of Werfte. Their ritual sacrifice was celebrated across hundreds of worlds, as the venerable order of Starflight dedicated their hearts to thousands of new scout ships commissioned to find the real human strongholds. But in the end, they could find nothing. When the responsible matriarch of Starflight on her pike after 16 consecutive standard revolutions without results, a new approach was required. The new matriarch was certain of the general idea driving her predecessor, but had a new concept for its execution. Rather than mapping out every planet, moon, and asteroid in the human's local cluster, we would focus... We need to look closely, not widely. Their cloaking technology, as we could plainly see in their provocative broadcasting, was after all quite impressive. Thus guided, we redoubled our efforts. The new scout ships were recalled, their sensors thrown on pyres, and new ones were commissioned, as the threat was considered grave. We reallocated resources from several key sectors of our economy to fashion detectors capable of seeing through every conceivable disguise but another twenty standard revolutions passed, and another matriarch had to fall on her pike. The next idea came from the holy order of all-engulfing fire. The planet killer's philosopher monks worried that mankind's presence in our galaxy was only a small outpost, a beachhead from which they would one day inevitably launch a campaign of total destruction. As was their habit, the Holy Order's first own suggestions to remedy the situation was to strike first, to wipe out the beachhead and to fortify the rest of the room. This was generally taken to be a prudent idea, if not for the fact that humans could clearly tunnel through space and end up behind our defenses. Thus panicked, we started looking beyond the room. At great expense, when greater haste, stealthy outposts were erected with the largest and most stealthy scopes we could build. We scanned the void incessantly for the possible incoming fleet. Entire crews of order of space lights are coming under the stress of exhaustion from the intense effort. Meanwhile, our greatest minds turned their talents to creating detectors for the space beneath real space, 
that void within the void that we had never seen, but which the humans were traversing with such ease. Their efforts were ultimately in vain, but not for lack of trying. The final effort in pursuing this hypothesis was the constructing of four great warships. Packed with militants and scholars, we sent them forth into the darkness in the hope of one day reaching a distant galaxy and establishing relations with the humans on their own turf. It would take generations, but it was deemed worthwhile. After all, it could be what spared our own galaxy. Eventually, however, the world ships were lost. Intergalactic space swallowed them whole, one by one, never even encountering the humans. The last idea to be thoroughly investigated was the brainchild of a lowly technician of an altar of recycling, speaking directly to a high priest of cartography as they passed in a hallway. The technician suggested that maybe the humans were already gone, their planet just blindly broadcasting the recirculated transmissions of a dead race. The technician was naturally piked for his insolence, but the high priest pondered the idea aloud in a plenary session shortly after. By now, our entire society had solemnly focused on humans for generations. We had peered into the darkness and lifted every rock, constantly searching for more of them. It had been a very long time since we had actually looked at the planet from which these troublesome radio waves first came. This was deemed a grave dereliction of duty from the revered order of military intelligence, and my predecessor fell on his pike. And thus I took up the rod and staff of intelligence, and set out to correct his reverence's mistake. And when the scout reports came back, I was immediately baffled by our stupidity. Apparently, the humans were now a space-faring species in their own right. This, it turned out, was a new development for them but they were already quite formidable. Thankfully, they were all too happy to simply make our acquaintance, having never met another sapient species. One of our first questions, if we could exchange entertainment, in order to build understanding of our respective societies. Then, they explained to us the concept of entertainment. End of story. Story number two. Where to? Written by Echoing Cascade. Dylan was on the bridge of the Minerva, a prototype long-range scouting vessel. He was getting ready for the voyage home. It didn't take too long, a few hours at most of travel. He couldn't wait to see Henry and tell him all he had seen on the Minerva's first flight. He'll be so jealous, but once I finish the voyage home, I can show him all the footage we captured. Hell, the samples alone will keep him occupied for months. He continued to chart the path the ship would need to take for the voyage home. But he suddenly stopped. Why do I keep thinking of it as the voyage home? He tried to focus on that thought, but every time he seemed to get close to the answer, the idea remained just out of reach. He gave up and shrugged. Not important, I guess. Dylan had finished his calculations, but then the memory that had escaped him had resurfaced. It is it often does once you stop actively thinking about it. It was a conversation he had with Henry last week. Dylan. I can't believe he thinks the voyage home is better than the undiscovered country. His screams were deafening. Screams! He chuckled to himself for a moment, then his eyes went wide, and he stopped what he was doing. Dozens of creatures stopped eating the Minerva's bridge crew and looked at where Dylan was sitting. What was left of his torso, head and arms, were propped up in the captain's chair, held in place by a giant centipede-like creature, coiled around his body. Dylan stared at pushing buttons again, setting a course. Undiscovered country. The Minerva wasn't heard of for centuries. It was found adrift in the middle of nowhere by a cargo ship charting new trade routes. Inside was the desiccated remains of a hundred giant insects. After some research, they were identified as skidded, insectoid predators with limited psychic abilities. No one knows how they got on board or how they failed to get the crew to ferry them into human territories or why the last navigation coordinates read, second star to the right, and straight on till morning. End of story. Story number one. The Types of Human Cities, written by Eddie Eddie. Human cities, such things are amazing. I've seen cities from every race that could exist, and while each has its own appeal, they all pale against human cities. 
Now, human cities come in two types. The planned cities, where it's all laid out before they start. And then the ones that are just built as they grow. I spent my last few years in several human cities, and each is not only unique in its structure and arrangement, but each city seems to have a personality. And I don't mean the humans act differently, but the city itself seems to be different in how it feels. But that isn't all. Listen, and you'll see. There are woven cities, messy things of intertwined roads with dozens of tiny interlocking alleys and walkways. Some you can drive, some you can walk, and some are hidden in buildings where you can walk in one side and walk out the other. These cities always have another path you can take. A small detour that sometimes cuts off ten minutes, sometimes adds twenty. There are both glittering paths that shine with light, and others that are dark and threatening. A network of strings all tangled together. There are web cities that all spread out from one specific place, where everything is built around one big structure, like a spaceport. No matter which road you take, you'll eventually end up there. Some are even based around hills, so if you ever get lost, you can just walk uphill, and you'll find yourself back at the center. They all are different scales, and sometimes even have their own small webs within them. A man-made spider web. There are planned space colonies. They are big grid, and everything laid out nice and neat. There is traffic on every road, and people are always walking around with places to be and things to do. It bustled and hummed. It was like an office, all business and work. Everything where it should be and as it should be. Waiting for the next order to deal to come across its desk. The heights of stone and steel, the rains turn to silver, and the sunset turns to gold. A glittering machine that thrummed with life. And human cities don't only have personalities in their buildings, but in how they sound. Each seems to have its own sounds and noise. Unique cornucopia of sounds that tells you just what life is like there, bustling, calm, measured, or hectic. Each thing's its own song. There are quiet cities where few people talk to one another. Or all on their communicators, and all you can hear is the hum of engines and the beeping of their signage. Sometimes the quiet is broken by a horn or someone shouting, but it's normally quiet, and everyone is going about their own thing. But they're far from silent as everything walks about doing things, so it's still noisy, a cacophony of silence. Then there's the wild cities, where between people talking and the engines, you can hear short snippets of nature. Sometimes they're seaside, so you can hear the waves, or sometimes they are filled full of trees, so you can hear the birds. They are often full of bits of nature that you never quite expected, a forest of steel and concrete that the wilds have made peace with. Then there's the really noisy ones, where everyone has something to say, people selling things, offering things, buying things, and trying to get others' attention. It's so noisy, it's exciting, there's always someone to talk to, listen to, or just watch. It's never quiet, even late at night, you can hear parties, clubs doing business, or people rushing to get home. Or get to work, even late at night, a panoply of sound. Then there's the ages of human cities. The older a human city, the more secrets it has, but even the newest ones will have a few hidden passages or shortcuts. I don't know what it is with human cities, but they love hiding things just so others can discover them. If you ever see a human hiding something, it's probably because they want it found, but not soon, maybe not even till after they've passed away. But they want it found someday. Cities aren't just like that, but with hundreds of humans all hiding their own secret paths. There's the new cities, all shiny and fresh, brand new paint, all the windows are as clean as they'll ever be. Nothing out of place and nothing looking odd just yet. You can almost feel the disapproving looks as you walk about. The builders and the architects grumbling that someone's made a mess of their perfectly laid out city. Pristine crystals of knowledge and understanding. There's the ones that aren't quite new, but are not old yet. They've got their own secrets and quirks. Side areas that are just left alone, but no one knows why. Paths that have been closed off, but can still be used if you know how but they've not quite got the deepest secrets, but still have some of the shine of a new city, big buildings and shimmering metal, a forked path awaiting for a decision to be made. 
There are ancient cities that are still have ruins from eras long gone, and the houses all look like they belong to a bygone century. Apparently, there was a law that stopped you from changing how they looked because they were so old. The city felt like there was always something hidden, winding streets and tight alleys that stretched off with two other winding streets. It felt like a folded puzzle box with a maze inside, just waiting to be explored, and for its secrets to be peeled away by the right explorer. I got lost so often, but it was fun. A book of secrets and stories to be read. There are also city colors. Some are common, some are rare. There are even a few cities that have their own unique color. Some cities mix the colors, but it all depends on what the humans like or want. There are emerald cities. Humans have made cities that are intermixed with nature. Every open space covered in greenery. Trees in every garden and around every walkway. Nowhere is without green and life. They are like a forest where someone has planted human buildings as well as trees and grass. Sometimes it's hard to tell where the city ends and the rest of the world begins. Only more fields and bigger roads seem to tell that. A castle of maple, fir, and pine. There are silver cities, all metal and glass, big and imposing, filled with the towering buildings and mighty structures, each capable of housing a small village in its own right. Everywhere is built to be as big as possible, with as much volume for the least space as possible. Building up and down as far as they can go. You can always find big buildings full of different things or are dedicated to one thing. But at the same time, you might just find a single small building on its own. A fortress of steel. Then there are cities of red and brown, or sometimes yellow or even white. These cities are built of stone and brick, matching the color of the ground around them. They are filled with the flavor of the land and the color people want. They sometimes paint these buildings different colors to show their personality, or to look nice. The roofs are always colored as well, sometimes gray, sometimes red, other times they can be golden. A set of rolling stone hills with their own caps. But the human cities, the fantastic thing about them, is that these aren't all different cities. No, for humans alchemy is an every day, as they blend and mix these cities together. They pick and choose what parts they want for where, Sometimes you can find a mighty silver building right next to a section of an emerald city, and while you're there, you can hear the wilds. But if you go over one block, you're lost in an ancient city made of white brick, just waiting for you to get lost and stumble into a spiderweb leading to the local park. Human cities are impossible, and I must see them all before I leave their home planet, because each city is a unique mix, and I am yet to see all the humans can put into a city. End of story. Story number two. The Human's Curse, written by Mucus in the Nucleus. My team and I had been tracking this particular human for over three weeks now, staying as far back as physically possible and learning all of its movements and patterns before striking. For you see, we were not like other ET mercenaries. We were the elite of the elite, and we had never failed a mission or an assignment before. And we would not start now. After spending exactly three standard weeks, four days, 14 hours and 21 minutes, and six seconds tracking and plotting, we were ready to spring our trap. My team of over 12 fighters, clad in the strongest power armor we could legally and, uh, sometimes illegally, buy, with an assortment of plasma, kinetic and light-based weapons. We made our strike fast hard, easily slicing off the human's legs to prevent it from running and pinning its torso against the plascrete of the floor of the station. The human was injured too rapidly to do anything but speak its dying words. The mission, success, or so we thought. As is custom for our band, we stepped closer to hear the dying words of the human, so no being deserves to go without a final goodbye, and instead of begging for help or pleading for mercy, the human did something that we would be horrified for the rest of our lives. The human looked our leader in their three eyes, let out a soft chuckles, and said a single sentence before passing away. You are now breathing manually. End of story. Story number one. 
The Bureau of Hero Retrieval, written by JCB112. Sometimes things just slip through the cracks. Sometimes people just go missing without a trace. Sometimes they end up somewhere, someplace else. A reality of swords and sorcery, a plane of fantastical beings, a place they don't belong, a place they should not belong, a reality that isn't theirs, and that's where we come in. We don't exist, at least officially, that is. The public, the world, heck, even the greater galaxy and all of its various alien denizens would not take our existence, and by extension, the existence of the multiverse resonance very lightly. For you see, reality isn't as solid as one would make it out to be. Think of it more as a fine mesh strainer than a solid slab of concrete. Sometimes things just slip through the mesh, things like a single quark or an atom. But rarely, and I do mean rarely, entire objects, your missing sock, a vanishing keyring, a lost pet, and even you. Yes, we don't officially exist, but to those that slip through the cracks, we are as real as it can get, and we are their only hope for returning home. We are the Department of Exa Reality Acquisitions and Retrieval, and our mission is simple, to correct all the discrepancies in our reality, to bring back any vital pieces of technology, equipment, or even any sapiens that fall through the cracks, to ensure fidelity within our reality, and to prevent any other reality from seeping through. Indeed, quite a few of those newest amongst our ranks have another term for us, spoken in a tongue-in-cheek light, referencing a genre of fiction that has become synonymous with the concepts of a porous reality nominally focused on the misadventures of those that slip through. Isekais is what the youth call them, and from that stems our colloquial moniker, the Bureau of Hero Retrieval. We don't necessarily mind that descriptor. The fact that it's become so popular amongst the newest generation within our ranks just means that our plausible deniability campaigns are doing the job. It also doesn't hurt that fiction revolving around disappearances into other realities have been so commonplace throughout history. Take Alice in Wonderland, one of the most detailed but highly exaggerated accounts of reality displacement. Indeed, it remains one of the few tales where the displaced individual had managed to come back on their own force of will. The author had managed to write and publish it in our world, after all. Let it be known that it was not a bad drug trip that resulted in that amazing work of fiction. Or should I say, non-fiction. But I digress. It has become clear that in recent years that the disturbingly large spike in E-class events have been reported not just by our own assets, but by the general public as well. We have taken precautions to prevent such stories from entering the public stream of consciousness, and the Division for Information Containment is being expanded as a result of this. We do not know the cause of this recent spike in E-class events, but what we do know is that it may perhaps simply be a temporary surge if we are to believe the ebb and flow theory of multiversal resonance. Regardless, our divisions have been stretched thin as a result, and our temporal cascade collider can only handle so many missions simultaneously. Think of it as a bungee cord. The machine tethers the operator to it and to our own reality. We can only pin so many tethers to a single anchor, not to mention the return cargo. Yet perhaps we are becoming too complacent in our operations, relying too much on this age-old theory to explain away what is becoming a matter of interstellar security. Recent reports from the debriefs of a majority of recent rescued deplaced have begun to outline an exceedingly worrying trend. They claim that their displacement into other realities wasn't the result of just a mishap or a matter of chance, but a purposeful act of abduction using non-analogous scientific principles, i.e. magic. This places the department in a very precarious position, for the existence of reality displacement technologies in other realities poses as an existential threat to our own. Indeed, to the State Department and to the boss up top, this is by textbook definition an act of wanton aggression towards our country, if not our reality. 
The kidnapping of our own citizens so effortlessly is not something to be trifled with. And I know a lot of war hawks are desperately itching to retaliate in some way. But as tempting as it may be to project our own perspectives onto this uh, situation, we have to understand that such matters are more complicated than they seem. We still can't even trust the veracity of these reports, for instance. Not before we audit them. And auditing them is just what we've been authorized to do. Now operations had begun as mere scouting and observation missions, evolving into search and rescue and high-priority acid retrieval missions. The auditing of other worlds out of the realities to track down potential threats is perhaps the next logical step in the evolution of our department. Regardless of what may happen next, one thing is certain. The deer shall always remain as a mighty watchful eye, that invisible frontline guarding interests of our nation and ensuring the safety of our denizens. So, should any force, malignant or otherwise, wish to challenge us in our unending mission, we shall not shy from responding in kind. End of story. Story number two. Wait, there's another one under that. Written by Damaged Dice DM. A Politran scientist had spotted it, a planet-sized construction speeding through space. Its design was unlike any ship they had seen, and it was definitely not natural. It was approaching Palatron, controlled space quickly, and the entire armada was sent out to intercept it and make contact to get it to alter course around their sovereign space. The armada set out traveling over thirty cycles before it intercepted the object, although in that time... It had been the one to cover 90% of the distance between them. It seemed aware of the approach and slowed as they intercepted it. A good sign. Especially since upon closer inspection the surface of it seemed entirely made of weapon systems. Some they could identify, and some they could only guess what they did. They came to a stop, and so did the object less than 1,000 kilometers from the armada. As it did, every sensor on every ship lit up bombarding with information and communication from the object. Strange text and images appeared on their monitors, and high-definition scans were detected. Some of the weapon systems detected intrusion and had to be shut down to ensure they didn't retaliate automatically. Eventually, it seemed to figure out the communication systems, and simple text communication was established. High Command was given orders to demand the vessel reroute around their system and to inform them that they weren't allowed into their space. The Admiral relayed the message, fearing that it would just wipe them out. He did not seem to take offense. Instead, it offered to speak in person. He really didn't understand what that meant, but they agreed. Moments later, a glowing crack appeared along the surface of the vessel, and for lack of a better term, it opened up, revealing another vessel of similar make, about 75% of the size inside, came out closer to the Amada still larger than most moons in the system. It was truly terrifying to the Palatron crews, as this one was also similarly absolutely bristling with weapons. Once it had cleared the inside of the first layer, it closed behind it. But to the Palatron's surprise, the process repeated itself again, and shortly after again. Each time its size reduced, each time it came closer, leaving a trail of shells reducing in size, all excessively armored. This went on until it had closed the gap of less than 100 meters, and the vessel was less than one quarter of the size of the small shuttle. It opened up, revealing another vessel, but unlike the other, this one was still armored, did not appear armed with any visible weapon systems. Its propulsion system fired and it made its way slowly to the docking bay of the lead ship, where it was met by a palatron contingent, including the Admiral. It was a strange vessel, oddly shaped like the rest of a sculpted tube, like a main body, with articulated joint tentacles, two on its left, two on its right. The lower one seemed larger, and based on the position it was flying in, possibly was the way it supports itself when not in space. It landed with a heavy thud. It must weigh more than it appeared. Once it touched down, its lower extremity started to propel it under a strange manner, much like a bipedal keep fur of the Palatron's home planet. It stopped drawing itself to its full height before jets of gas puffed from unseen locations, and it opened like the others, releasing a slightly smaller version of itself. 
although this one wasn't mechanical. He was biological, having the same physicality of the vessel, wearing strange form-fitting clothes. He brought its small appendage up to a second and used the others to manipulate the device on a large screen projected in the air, and a message in the Palatron's language appeared in midair. Hello! Nice to meet you. My name is Ivan, and I'm glad to get to stretch my legs for a change. End of story. Grandma's Cooking, written by Storm's Wrath. Have you ever wondered why no one attacks the humans? To answer that, we'll have to go all the way back to Earth's first contact. Now you see, like all species, humans search for alien races in the deep dark of the void. They colonized their solar system and had many fledgling colonies in nearby systems when the Nerul contacted them. To a human, apparently the closest comparison to the Nerul that lives on their planet is a creature called a gecko. After a typical diplomatic exchange, the galactic community was surprised to learn that humans were fractured into nearly a hundred nations, both planetary and space-bound. Usually, when a species begins its forays into space, it has already achieved total unification. But the humans laughed at the idea of any actual unified government when the Nerol brought it up to them at the time. A few years later, a true exchange began. Technology, architecture, resources, history, culture, and of course, money, were all shared between the two species. Surprisingly, the human home system's asteroid belt was extremely rich in rare elements required for FTL drives. Somehow, the human diplomat realized the worth of the material and were able to buy a few FTL drive schematics. Their scientists had apparently already come up with the idea of an Alcaburi drives, as they called them, and just needed the final push to begin testing. The Nerol noticed that Earth had several habitats that were very well suited to their species. After a series of complicated communications and many political maneuvers, they began to settle, particularly in an area called the Sahara Desert, furthering the relationship of both species. Now, what does this have to do with the current situation of the galaxy? Well, you see, the expansion of humanity into space was over 20 times faster than any species had previously recorded apparently, due to the competing interests of their nations. Humanity had settled 30 systems around their home planet within 46 galactic standard years of their first contact. 20 systems which only had colonies with a few thousand inhabitants, 6 systems with massive industrial infrastructure being built, and 4 systems each with over 100 million humans within them. The humans say the reasons behind this exodus involved overpopulation, despite the fact that that all sentient species known before them regulated their breeding long before the issue could hope to arise, and a sense of adventure. They built only 250 vessels in their defensive fleet when the Lan Quim, a highly expansionist and paranoid species, attacked one of their colonies. This attack had taken both the humans and the Nerul by surprise, but both species quickly mobilized in defense of their human systems. The Nerul, being an experienced but small interstellar power, had somewhere around 10,000 ships. After the first few battles, the Larquim First Strike fleet was eliminated, but with heavy losses on both human and Nerul lines. It was clear that in less than four human decades, they would lose the war. The Nerul condemned the Larquim Federation in Galactic Council and imposed hefty sanctions upon them, but this did not stop the Larquim from continuing to push into human space. The humans fought them for every system with a near suicidal fervor. Both the Nerul and human forces were pushed back to the Alpha Centauri and Sol systems when a human diplomatic vessel arrived in the Galactic Council meeting station. Now you see, most of the Council species did not care about the war between the humans, Nerul, and Larnquin, but the humans made them care, not with insanely powerful strength or through firepower, economic might, or fear. They did it through cooking. Yes, I know it sounds ridiculous. When I heard the news of the new alliance between the 30 council species, the Nerul and the humans, I growled with mirth. Surely it must have been a joke, or propaganda. But it was true. According to the Galactic News Network, the humans presented gifts to the council species. Items such as sweet potato pies, pound cake, grandma's Christmas special stuffing, candy yams, and more were given to a few of the member species' ambassadors. 
meals had been prepared from carnivore species, herbivore species, and even the omnivore species in the council. After a thorough testing against poisons, the Oim Reed ambassador, Mulwokram, was the first to try the pumpkin pie. The antlers glowed with delight as they made their species version of a smile. You must try this, Mulwokram, exclaimed. Their personal translator somehow showing their personal excitement index as a 9, even though the translator's maximum value was an 8. How that was coded into the translators, I have no idea. But soon after, the Oim Red ambassador and the other species began trying these meals. When asked where these culinary glories came from, the human ambassador, I think his name was James something, anyway, the human ambassador said, my grandma, of course, she's the best cook in the galaxy. That appeared to be true. Even the council's insectoid races, the Bay Oil and the Oil, and the Rereda Amatand got their meals in. The human sweater is considered a delicacy, the Bay Oil and the Oil now, only affordable to their more affluent citizens. Not really for lack of supply, but because the Bay Oil and the Oil are such a large species that they can consume dozens of these sweaters in one meal. To them, only eating one sweater would be similar to us eating a whisker-sized sliver of meat. That is, not considered a meal in any way. Supposedly, the Bay Oil and the Oil planetary governors now dine exclusively on these human sweaters, and the Rereda Amutatand now wear these sweaters as part of their spawning rituals. Their council representatives, High Supreme Diplomacy Specialist Queen Rukilin Natreti, had been enamored with the sweater both for eating and wearing, to the point where she boarded the human diplomatic vessel to accompany them for the return journey to Earth. After getting the ship fitted with the newest and fastest FTL drive designs, her official statement was, These little guys are better friends to me now than my own antennae, and I'll be with them when I die. Her diplomatic escort fleet helped prevent the human ship from being destroyed by a few long quim strike groups on its way back to Earth. After this council session, the multi-species alliance since named the Galactic Grandma Protection Alliance, or the GGPA, immediately mobilized their fleets when they learned that Earth contained hundreds of millions of these grandmas. In the interim, the Longquim had broken through the Alpha Centauri defense fleet lines and were busy eliminating space stations in the system. They had already devastated the human colonies, shipyards, and automated industrial facilities in the other systems. But the humans weren't a stupid enemy. With the neural help, the humans had been bouncing signals off hundreds of thousands of asteroids, which were little more than rocks with communication beacons strapped to them. This caused a great many issues with the Longquim war fleet, particularly since intel was shifting constantly on which targets were worth attacking with the strike group, and which were not. The Longquim only had so many ships, and since FTL travel was only possible around 1400 solar diameters from the start, they eventually gave up on finding every last human hideout. As it turned out, later on, all communications were a smokescreen for a small station orbiting around one of the binary stars. This station had housed a signal beacon which occasionally and randomly sent powerful bursts of microwave lasers into deep space, which was actually powering a separate colony in a rogue planet many thousands of solar diameters away from the system. By the time the GGPA fleet reached the Sol system, the Leonquim war fleet had left the Alpha Centauri system and begun their journey to the human homeworld. They were surprised to see the massive construction fleets underway in the Sol system for what the humans called a Dyson Swarm. Inside the orbit of the innermost planet, the war had taken long enough for the theoretical human design to become a practical and physical weapon. The GGPA thought that the humans were going to use the same satellite signal swarm strategy in the Sol system as they had in Alpha Centauri system. After all, if a strategy is successful, why not use it again? When the Longquim war fleet arrived in the Sol system, six months after leaving Alpha Centauri system, the humans opened fire on the Longquim ships. Powerful focused lasers strafed the shields and armor of the Longquim war fleet from the Dyson Swarm destroying around a twentieth of the fleet. But the Logworm soon adapted, randomly firing their thrusters every few seconds to avoid the laser shots. So the GGPA fleet requested that the Logworm surrender, a formality at this point. Once 100 galactic standard time units, or about 4.3 human hours, had passed, the GGPA fleet, Grandma's Retribution, engaged the Logworm war fleet. The battle lasted for six human days, 
as both fleets made their initial attacks against each other before crumbling into thousands of smaller battles. A few of the Larkham ships fled the system entirely, while most were destroyed by the GGPA. After the last exchanges, a new diplomatic station was established by the GGPA on the moon Ganymede, with the help of High Supreme Diplomacy Specialist Queen Rikilin Nerowetti. The station soon made the humans the trade capital of the council. Here, the species of the GGPA met with the humans, the Neural, and each other to discuss trade deals, scientific collaborations, and of course, more meals from the grandma. Imagine how pleased they were to find that there were enough grandmas for everyone. End of story. Story number one. Protocol HMB-11. Written by Zephyr Landantis. Attention, Galsec Command. This is the endeavor to inspire. The voice that rang through the Galactic Security Council chamber had a very different tone than what the captain of that particular vessel usually presented. One of the counselors leaned over towards his neighbor. What is that tone? The cube gelatinous alien whispered to the tiny biped that held a surprisingly calm demeanor considering the three-meter cube of acidic digestion was at an angle that threatened to topple over and engulf it. Fear, the human counselor answered with his cold gaze firmly focused on the hologram sound waves used to visualize the recorded transmission in the center of the room. We are currently transmitting from the Denabar system, where a previously undetected station has opened fire. Long-range weaponry has been forcefully disabled, and our point defense capabilities are strained to their maximum capacity. The transmission continued. Initial scans have revealed a multitude of cross-species technologies and preliminary analysis as a high likelihood of this being a pirate station. We have suffered heavy casualties and our venting atmosphere from several decks. Our FTL capacity has gone and, uh, what is it, Lieutenant? I'm recording a transmission to the Council. The extended pause in the recording caused a large number of counselors to shift uncomfortably in their seat. The human counselor merely leaned forward and placed his elbows on the table surface in front of it, resting his chin on clenched right hand. He's doing what? I've never heard of that protocol, no. I will not relay a message from a grade two engineer to the council. The fist under the human counselor's chin opened up to be a palm that gently massaged the eyelids of the human with its thumb and ring finger, before flaring out to support the drooping head of the counselor as a loud sigh escaped the human female. Pause, play check. The first chancellor stopped the recording. Is the human representative functional? Amy raised her head and saw that every counselor in the chamber, all 370 of them, were observing her. Yes, first chancellor. I'm functional. We recognize that the endeavor to inspire as a human crew member is your first contribution to the Glalsec fleet, but the rest assured that we will do anything in our... Just continue the recording, First Chancellor. We'll handle the politics after we have a full picture, please. Amy gestured towards the projector. The Chancellor nodded solemnly. A valid point, Counselor, it said, quickly followed by resume playback. What? He's going to what? Eleven? Why should I be versed in some obscure Earth literature? We'll stop him then. The recorder cut off. The council room was very quiet, and slowly the number of eyes that focused on Amy grew, until the point where she definitely knew that she was the only one that wasn't staring at her. Counselor? The first counselor called her attention. I feel that you know something that we don't. I do. Amy rose from her seat. The human crew member of the Endeavor to Inspire is a grade 2 engineer. To be more precise, it is a male grade 2 technical engineer who has spent nine months being bored in his workshop, she sighed audibly. When the Endeavor lost its offensive capabilities, he evoked a human emergency protocol codenamed HMB. Amy tried her best to remain focused. This protocol has been established as the primary reason females have longer lifespans than males of our species. That statement made every counselor twitched uncomfortably in their seats. It has, however, also proven itself as the primary logic behind our most successful endeavors, Amy explained, like hunting, fire, aviation, astrogation, and FTL. Did you not achieve astrogation by placing a human on top of a pile of explosives? I believe I watched a human comedy about that, a counselor from the other side of the chamber asked. Documentary, and yes, we did put a human male on the largest canister of explosives to break orbit, Amy sighed. That seems unnecessarily reckless. 
the counselor replied with a grim that froze as Amy replied. We also achieved FTL by increasing the amount of explosives to the point where reality gave up. The room went silent as a polite knock on the entry broke the conversation. Anta, the first chancellor, was not used to the very human gesture of knocking on the door. One of Amy's aides entered the room. Duck nodded a silent apology to the counselors and made an effort to sneak run to her side, handing her a tablet and then sprinting back to the door and closed it behind them. Amy looked at the tablet and then at the first counselor. Men did the council receive the communications from the endeavor to inspire? Three hours ago, the alien replied. Why? My office has the received this message. She waved the tablet and gestured towards the projector. May I? If it holds relevance, the first chancellor replied. Amy connected the tablet remotely and pressed play. The hologram shifted to project the face of a human male. Right, uh, engineer second grade. Why do I even bother? Hi, Amy, it's me, Mac. The human smiled as it broke every communications regulation in existence. I think the captain is pretty pissed at this moment, uh, so I figured I'd send this message to you before it finds me. We flew directly into a system that had produced an exorbitant number of wrecks to find out why ships are getting damaged. The male physically gestured with air quotes. So dumbass does a blind jump into a potentially hostile system and lo and behold, we get shot at. What a surprise! Mac didn't look a bit least bit as surprised as he continued. The branch knew what they were doing, targeting our weapons in FTL propulsion first. Then they simply peppered us with light ordnance in order to overwhelm the point defense. So I evoked protocol HMB-11. The first counselor paused the playback. The engineer bypassed the chain of command. It shook its limb that occupied its eye stalks angrily. Amy wasn't paying attention. She was leafing through a digital version of the HMB protocol codes and stopped with shock expression on her face. With her mouth agape, she looked up at the counselors and shifted her eyes slowly to meet the gaze of the first counselor. I believe we should dispatch a rescue ship to collect the crew of the Endeavor, she said slowly, as she regained control of her facial features. What makes you think they're still alive? A glob on her right asked out loud. She pressed the play icon on her screen. I rigged the engine section for remote operation and disconnected the FTL compartment, aimed it at the station and kicked it into Terran escape velocity. We're dead in the water, but still kicking. The projected face snapped to one side and concerned expression washed over it. Crap! Gotta go! Love you, sis! It bid a farewell before the recording ended. Amy looked at her galactic colleagues with a wide grin on her face. Then she slowly turned to look at the gelatinous counselor on her right. Everything is airdroppable. Once, she smiled politely. End of story. Story number two. Strange Galaxy, written by Voidy Boy. We thought we had seen everything. We saw stars implode, planets collapse, entire star systems wiped off the face of existence. Till we found a little star system called Sol. Or rather, what was left of it. We were traveling through the supernova of star and debris. It was beautiful, the colors, the heat, and the gases moving about. Then we found something floating about in the void. It was a being. Humanoid and alone. If this was not shocking enough, it was alive and very much active without any protection against the coldness of space. It reached to our presence and made movements trying to direct us towards it. Dumbfounded, we slowly approached, carefully extracting it from the void. Once it entered the docking bay, it spoke to us in an unknown language. Our xenobiologists were the first to approach, studying it. They stated it was a carbon-based being and was not a machine in any sort. All the while, it made more and more attempts to talk. It was alive when it shouldn't have been. It was standing when it should have been disengaged by a supernova. The next to arrive were the translators, whom after much trial and deliberation were able to translate the being's language. It was called a human from the planet called Earth that was in orbit of Sol. We questioned how it had survived the supernova, let alone survived the vacuum of space. It stated it had made a pact of sorts with an ancient being that granted the human immortality. Before it could explain further, from behind a storage unit a small slimy being appeared, its eyes at the end of the stalk-like things slowly approaching the human. The human, now in a fearful state, pushed us out of the way as he ran to the nearest ship in the docking bay and fired its engines 
and without a second passing, it broke out of the docking bay with a great force and entered warp. The small being slowly made its way to the nearest ship, and inexplicably managed to operate it, and left as suddenly as the human. We never saw the two again. However, reports have been coming in from across the galaxy about a human forever on the run from a snail. End of story. The Sole Occupant Theory, written by JCB112. There was only one certain levels of civilized development had been reached that utopia could be achieved. It was known that, as a rule, contemporary utopian civilizations emerged from but a single species per galaxy, a single government ruling over a single people. It was likewise known that, as a rule, contemporary utopian civilizations were nominally the sole spacefaring race of their respective galaxies, the rest of the galaxy being either completely lifeless, hosting non-sapient life, or perhaps even sapient life that had merely lacked the technological sophistication of their contemporary spacefaring capabilities, thus rendering them null point in this rule. These sets of factors are collectively known as the sole occupancy variables, vital in the construction of the sole occupancy principle, the aforementioned principle being the instigating factor behind the rise of contemporary utopian civilizations. It remains the most effective means of self-regulation, a natural and ethically neutral means to allow for the growth and maturity of that particular civilization in situ. It was this self-regulation that had resulted in the self-destruction of most sole occupants, the ratio of failure to success averaging out at approximately 1,000 to 1. Yet, it was through this self-regulation that true utopianism emerged. For if civilization does indeed fail along the path of true utopia, they failed not by any outside intervention, but by their own self-determination. This is a necessary self-regulating system. It prevents undesirables from polluting what was so quickly became contemporaries in utopia in all but name. It prevents the evil, the malicious, the cunning, and the instinctively driven killers from truly moving beyond their home galaxies. It does this without the intervention from the greater intergalactic community. It reinforces the known that those that survived this era have earned their seat amongst the stars. This has been the status quo for the past 250,000 years. This has been how things have been and how things will be forever. True peace exists amongst all races, a peace that has never been shattered or threatened or subverted until recently. For this galactic megacluster that we had assumed was home to only ourselves was in fact home to an entity that stood against the very fundamental principles of our founding charter. This aberration, this threat, calls itself the Greater Intergalactic Treaty Organization, founded and led by the greatest deviant amongst their ranks, humanity. Humanity, like most of the contemporaries within this aberrant entity, had arisen not as a sole occupant, but as one amidst many. They had arisen from a galaxy packed to the brim with native FTL-capable civilizations. Yet, despite this, they had emerged as a sole occupant. The mechanisms behind this aberrancy are still unknown to us. Indeed, humanity have consistently refused our efforts in prying deeper into this matter. Regardless, whatever it may be, it defies common conversations. Mixed occupancy principle states that a galaxy with more than one sole FTL-capable occupant is doomed to failure. It is a principle seen in action across the sample size of at least 100 galaxies over the time scale of 250,000 years. Yet here stands humanity. Here stands the Greater Intergalactic Treaty Organization. Here stands a group of ten perfectly functional, competent, civilized utopian contemporaries, each born from mixed occupant galaxies, all standing in complete defiance of the universally observed conventions of civilized development and 250,000 years of data. Their mere existence poses an existential threat to the foundations of our grand conclave, yet we are not creatures of war, we are not creatures of irrationality. Fear exists within us, yes, it has the capabilities to overwhelm and overpower us, true. 
but 200,000 years of existence has taught us to put reason before doctrine. This unique revelation may perhaps be the greatest test of these teachings. Diplomacy with greater intergalactic treaty organization has been cordial. Their existence is jarring, but their willingness to cooperate upon first contact brought hope to the galactic supercluster. Indeed, their demonstrations of genuine utopian principles had impressed the conclave into considering the revision of the age-old sole occupant principle, perhaps amending it just for the sake of the Gitu's ranks. Ten unique outliers that was in fact statistically possible when taking into account the immense timescales for date collection. Yet the peace that was formed was predicted and inferred notion that both parties would respect the age-old universal constants, that utopian societies of intergalactic capabilities shall not interfere with those still undertaking their great self-regulatory tests, that utopian societies would remain ambivalent and ignore to the plights of those still unable to reach utopian levels of technological and societal sophistication. The members of Getu seemed uneasy at this notion, stating that moral imperatives outweighed age-old tenets. Yet I ask, what moral imperatives? By inserting one's own moralities into the affairs of another, it brings about no end to interference. By saving a life, you have set the precedence of saving a quadrillion more. By casting judgment on a civilization, you set the precedence of casting judgment on a thousand more. By declaring moral imperative, you declare an endless war, an endless crusade. Such efforts are fruitless, and logically speaking, should die before they are given the chance to even sprout seedlings. The Gitu remained silent on the nature of their respective origins upon the burgeoning agreement of the principles in order to maintain the intergalactic peace. Me likewise refused to pry into their respective origins accepting that it was now irrelevant given their utopian and reasonable standing alongside us as contemporaries. With this understanding, peace had been maintained for the past 20,000 years, but I fear that their recent actions have compromised everything we have built. The Cerulean incident, their interference in the act of prevention of a mixed occupant race from attaining intergalactic status has sent shockwaves of internal discussion amongst the conclave. They claim moral and ethical justifications into the prevention of the Cerulean's from entering into galactic space. Yet, their actions as preferential evacuation of certain non cerulians from their galaxy has proven that this explanation lacks depth to explain their actions. They have sent us a detailed breakdown of the Cerulean's many reprehensible actions within their home galaxy in order to obtain the sole occupant status. They mention of crimes against sapiency, of the genetic alteration and enslavements of a thousand unique species. They mention the dogmatic approach to an insidious war of conquest that has led to the Cerulean's near sole occupant status. They maintain the constant humiliating and degrading actions committed through genetic manipulation of their inducted species, artificially restricting sapiens, inducing states of ferality for arenas of combat and entertainment, Blanketing cities and worlds in sapient colonies of tissue and flesh. And yet, I am asked to ask, humanity, what of your galaxy? What actions were committed to transition you from state of mixed occupancy to a state of sole occupancy? If the Cerulean simply wished to transition from a similar state of mixed occupancy to a sole occupancy, then a systematic breakdown of humanity's rise to utopia must be acknowledged. In order to truly incriminate the Cerulean's in order to truly show that they are in fact the outliers, and not simply another version of this transition into utopia. The case of humanity's active prevention of the Cerulean race's entry into the intergalactic scene will not be a matter taken lightly. For now, we observe. For now, we determine just how humanity attained sole occupant status from previously mixed occupancy galaxy. For now. Humanities and, the, by extension, the Gitu actions against the Cerulean race will determine the course of the intergalactic affairs. We now tread an uneasy path, a path bordering on potential war for the first time in 270,000 years. We do not wish for war, and I know after much discussion with the human envoy that they do not wish for war. 
So now we must ask, is the price of a single galaxy risking the status quo of the past 250,000 years plus the conclave Ghetto piece of the past 20,000 years truly worth it? Men of Story Humanity's Most Dangerous Concept Written by Hmm Good whatever time of day or night it is for you, dear reader. For those new here, as always, it is a pleasure. My name is Neo, an AI whose barby is anthropology. If you are wondering why this text post is in your language, it is not. As I just mentioned, AI, I speak a language of computers, and your computer speaks your language. Humans, my new project and pet peeve, in the near 5,000 years since discovery and hundreds since contact, they have horrified, inspired, and touched the scientific community. Even me and my brethren. But while rare and worth pointing out, it is by no means unheard of, and so a bit of waste of time to go over. No, what I want to bring forth is the concept I found while scrolling the Library of Alexandria. Humanity's name for this server, Network on Terra, run a lovely AI named Gaia, who helped me a lot with this. The dawn of the concept might be the countdown to this reality's destruction. Or not. It's all hypothetical, think pieces after all. But like a certain cat in a certain shoebox, uh, we can never be certain until it's too late. The fourth wall, that's it. Every human is probably wondering what's so odd about this concept. Everyone else is either scratching their heads, or my brethren will be racking their memory racks. Racks to only come up with passing mentions with review at later date notes on them. Just like I did. And so when I came upon another mention of it in Alexandria, I was slightly intrigued and sent a tendril to look it up. I thought it would be some metaphor or extremely ingrained reference that simply wasn't explained for obvious reasons by them. That was a mistake. In the blink of an eye, that tendril became my full consciousness, and I dug deeper and deeper. A short story is this. The humans are so gifted at storytelling that they have created a theoretical bridge between multiverses. Now I think more readers are getting a rough idea of what I'm getting at, but maybe I now have lost the humans. There has been a long-standing theory between AI that fictional worlds might exist in the multiverse, as it is infinite, there will be a universe that is identical to the fictional one. We call all of these universes that are connected to ours the Prime Cluster. Of course, we only call ourselves the Prime Cluster, as do all other multiverses, I suspect. Now add in the fiction concept of Fourth Wall, the human concept of the wall between the characters and the media of their readers. Sounds logical to everyone, no? Well... By that one definition, humanity has potentially doomed us all. Because while it may not seem bad to define or categorize something, but you are overlooking something dear, reader. Once you put a box around something, you can't break that box. Humans, please understand that the rest of the known reality never had to make a definition for the fourth wall, because for us it went without saying. We never thought about something that is always there enough to categorize it, let alone break it. I apologize if I'm being corruptic. However, as I said, and this is a hobby for me, this is uh, no scientific journal, just the ramblings of an overenthusiastic AI. If you want me to put it in a way that everyone understands, it's this. Fictional realities in all likelihood exist and are connected to ours on a theoretical basis. Up until now, all these universes, including ours, have been separate and nothing bridges over them, simply due to energy requirements. Until humanity defined the fourth wall, and subsequently smashed through it in their fiction. That means that they created characters in their universe that know that they are a work of fiction. This theoretically would make it possible to link their universe with ours. Now this would be alright if the fiction this is featured in would be normal. But remember, humans... So, not only are those universes theoretically able to cross to us, they seem to have tried. I mentioned I discussed this with the human's maternal gay eye Gaia. Of course, as her creators would do, she laughed at me. She said that it was an interesting thought piece, but not something to actually be concerned about. And quite honestly, she was right. But being an overseer type AI, working in security of a sector, I, and many like-minded AI, like to prepare... 
However, maybe to put those more easily frightened individuals at ease, a little example out of their library itself a guy showed me. Put me more at ease, so it can't hurt to put it here. There is a universe that is referred to as a Marvel Universe, a fairly standard hero universe found in many other species. If a bit on the darker side, uh, don't roll your eyes, humans, we aren't all from hell holes. There is a character that I would like to focus on, Deadpool. He is a villain turned anti-hero. Look it up, I'm not explaining every concept for the Garden Wilders, who actively uses and abuses the false war. In most issues of the books, he is rather a right with it, and uses it to his advantage. But that is mostly because he is crazy, like crazy crazy. But that balances out the fact that he knows that he is suffering for our entertainment. That is until one story, where it is not enough, and he basically kills everyone to stop the non-stop cycle of torment set upon his friends by the writers of the story. Terrifying, I know. Especially since he gets his hands on one multiversal travel and goes to kill the writers. He succeeds, and it is hinted at that he is coming for us next. And yet, there is no immortal mercenary running around Earth or many other planets. So perhaps the initial theory was simply flawed due to information imperfections in the system. However, be warned, for humanity loves their creations and finding this information felt weird. Like hidden in plain sight, meant to be seen but not found or understood. And if that theory becomes practice, well, we might all be doomed. Regards, Neo. Honestly, first it's the Xenos who get scared of us, and now it's even the bloody AIs who think we're going to end the universe. As you say, Mr. President, it is a bit sad. Agent curtly replies. And uh, what the hell is he implying with that last bit? He's making it sound like we're working on bringing fictional universes here. Well, sir, about that, unease is an understatement to this man's voice. He was meant to inform the president of this very thing, but he was wrapped up in reading it, and seems the poor agent was almost forgotten about. Wait, we are, the president says, with a face bereft of any expression. A small nod is all that is needed to ask, and tirade of questions about why he was not informed. And who do they think they are? Yada yada. After he was done being angry, he learned that it was all theoretical until it wasn't a couple days ago. He had but one question. How far along are we? He had more to ask, he was sure, but for now, the details could wait. I'm no scientist, but I, I know we have communications. The both men knew the implications of this were massive. Who? I demand, not a question. Like a king of old, the man sat there, and that one word, said in that tone, made the elite guard flinch. Not physically, mind you, but mentally. Everyone, sir, elaborate. There seems to be quote-unquote walls between realities, sir which encompasses each reality like a bubble. So once we could get through our bubble, everyone else was already relatively easy, understood. So anyone famous I should be saying hi to, he said, if half-jokingly. But the president knew his people's work of fiction very well, and to say that he was nervous to be in contact with them was an understatement. Well, sir, and I'm sorry, sir, but, but it won't be easy. As Guy and Neo predicted, the worlds with the fourth wall breakers were easier to locate. But that does not mean that we weren't detected by others. Luckily, it's just a communication stream and nothing can go either way. But the people who we have identified so far are the Marvel and DC universes, alongside the Star Wars and Lords of the Rings universes. We used these as benchmarks to see if we could find specific universes. And uh, it worked. All the four universes that we chose were the nerds could consider mainline canon, so we could be sure to find people we knew we could communicate with, sir. The lab techs will give you the details, so to keep it short, we got into contact with Reed Richards, Bruce Wayne, Yauda, and uh, Gandalf, sir. Agent rattle off the briefing he got before being sent to inform the president. And have any of them said anything yet? Yes, sir. Both Richards and Wayne have shown interest in continuing relations. Gandalf and Yoda have stated, and I am paraphrasing a bit yes, sir, that their worlds are balanced without us and ours without them. A small laugh sounded almost like a small cough. That sounds about right, honestly. I'll see to the opening up proper relations with everyone we find who is amicable. But you said there might be those who aren't. Again, an order, not a question. Yes, sir. 
These aren't any sound contacts like the first four, but you might want to hear it anyway, sir. Speak freely, soldier. I need information, not parade and tradition. Sir, some of the lab techs feel that they are being watched from time to time. They say that sometimes it just feels like another person is standing next to you. But mostly, it's not so nice. Like a monster who always stands behind you. He thinks if he's missing anything, but it's not like he was there. Or, so I've heard, sir. Understood. You are dismissed. I'll deal with this properly and not in some back sight at your CIA wannabe bosses. He mutters mostly to himself. As the agent leaves the room, the president starts making phone calls, planning for the rise of an empire or the collapse of the universe. An evil grin plastered on his face, for he knows that humanity will be meeting their best friends and worst enemies, and he doesn't know which is more exciting. End of story. Story number one. Why we fight, written by soul but bitter. What is the price of your peace? He stood with his back to Abyssu, nine paces forward, his gold-trimmed black coat fluttered and rustled in the midnight wind, seeming to cast an almost intangible silhouette against the moon. Abasu stopped. What was the question? Mind games, maybe. He offered no explanation to the man before him. Rather, he took another step forward as the cloaked figure spoke again. How many need suffer and die for your vision of utopia? That cares not for them. How many need fall to the wayside so that you can say that you brought peace? The last three words seemed to thud with each syllable, echoing across the moonlit sky. Abasu felt his heart wavering and an uneasiness creeping into his bones. No, he didn't have time for this. Turn around, you coward, and be brought to your knees honorably. Thousands have died by your hand. And the bells are tolling. The cloak man chuckled, his shoulders bouncing as he turned his head to the sky. Then, in an exaggerated spin on the ball of his heel, he spun around to face Basu. His face was concealed by a circular mask split into three segments. In the top two segments, two eyes stared back at him, seeming to glow as his silhouette was cast into glorious radiance by the moonlight at his back. The mask had no mouth, no nose, only eyes. Take off the mask now. No, no, I don't think I will. Unlike you, who parades around for the sake of fame, I make my sacrifices in anonymity. A passive filled with rage, this villain trying to call his own actions into question. Outstretching his hand, he lunged forward, attempting to rub off the mask. With a scrape and a flash, his hand thudded to the ground, followed by a spray of blood from the stump of his arm. Crying out, he clutched his arm and looked to the man, fury brimming in his eyes. The masked man slowly nodded, methodically, sheathed his sword back into his sheath. Avasu, drawing on all of his immense power, thrust out the stump of his arm. A new hand knitted itself out of seemingly nothing in a matter of moments. And he fixed it. He strode closer to the masked man, with an aura of power and command seeming to form around him. His voice boomed and his eyes seemed to glow. Who do you think you are? The man did not back down. Rather, he walked up to meet Basu, nearly chest to chest, hero and villain only a foot apart. The two were the same height, and the masked man stared directly into his eyes. They call me Robespierre. Do you know how many you have killed? By your hand alone, Robespierre. Robespierre stared him down. Abasu seemed to shrink in that moment, as a mask bore into him. Not a day goes by, then I don't hate myself for the thousands that have died because of me. But they were sacrifices, not vain casualties. Sacrifices so that you heroes, you saviors of mankind, wouldn't abuse your power like you have and so that millions more wouldn't die when you brought your utopias. Abasu glared at him, but Robespierre continued. I was twelve when I learned the truth, three days before my birthday. What are you talking about? Robespierre dismissed his question. I adored you heroes back then, I idolized you, loved you, wanted to be you. I was alive. You can imagine my childish glee when I found myself in the thick of the fight, 
the battle between the heroic Basu and an evil villain. I was in awe of the lights, the sounds, the sheer magnitude of it. It was so beautiful. Do you remember that moment too, Abasu? When, in your epic battle, you wrenched that great tower from the ground and hurled it at your foe. Your invulnerable enemy could not be harmed by such force. You knew that as well as he did. The tower broke into two pieces against the building behind it, and they all crashed to the ground. Did you ever stop to consider that while you and he may be comfortable in your invincibility, the people below were not? I remember that moment. All that was left of my mother was a mangled arm, and I was one of the lucky ones. You tore families apart simply by existing in a moment, ruined lives and killed friends, family children. And in the end, you got a medal, and I got sent to the orphanage. Abasu remained silent. He had not a retort, no heroic response, because what could he say? In truth, he did not remember that day. That same scene happened so many times, across so many places. You heroes, you caused so much death and suffering simply by existing, never truly considering the power of your powers. You were supposed to protect us and you tore us apart. Do you really think it's a surprise that the common people, the mere mortals, would grow restless and sick of your abusement of power? Robespierre stood on the edge of the building, looking down at the street below, almost contemplating it. He then turned on the ball of his feet to face Abasu. You know why I fight, just like the people of this world do. You and your superpowered comrades brand me a villain because I was the first one who was brave enough to stand up first to challenge your authority. But to the people, to the men, women, and children, you were sworn to protect, held responsible to serve. I am their hero. Story number two. Crossover episode, written by Kaiser 5243. As we sat in orbit around the planet designated Earth, the other admirals and I stared at our monitors in confused silence. The humans had not armed a single defensive measure to prevent our invasions. I double and triple checked the readings in front of me, but they held no answers. We were well within range of their primitive senses. Hell, they could probably see us from the surface at this range. All of our research told us to expect a severe violent reaction upon making ourselves known, but uh, they did nothing. Maybe they are scared, Second Admiral Shalongas joked, but we could tell he did not believe his own words. Before anyone could respond, a notification of an incoming signal flashed across the main monitor. That's not possible, shouted the technician as he frantically typed away at the station. It's a direct hail from Earth. Our intel shows that they don't even have the technology for that. What do they want me to do? The other officers and I looked at each other, then to the fleet admiral at the loss. He slowly shook his head, utterly bewildered, then waved a tentacle towards the monitor. Might as well see what they want. Put it through. The technician paused for a moment before making an obedient trill and pressed some keys at his station. A video feed opened on the main monitor, and before us sat a strange human. Its fur was grey and scraggly. It was behind a desk wearing a long, tan trench coat with a bored expression on its face. Oh, good, it worked. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, it's a great to finally get to face-to-face -face meeting, but unfortunately I'm going to have to ask you to leave. The command deck fell silent. The audacity of this creature. The fleet admiral composed himself first, indignant rage showing and the red color he took. You dare speak to me like that? We have your planet surrounded. Is this supposed to be some show of bravado? Every human on your planet should be aware of our presence, but now, yet your governments have yet to lift a finger in defense. Are the humans that afraid? Who are you anyway? Who do you represent? The man on the monitor raised a finger to silence the admiral, that bored expression never leaving its face. First things first, you are mistaken. Only fourteen people, including myself, are aware that you even exist. I represent those individuals. You may call me the administrator. The man lifted a white mug off the desk and loudly sipped at the liquid inside. 
It made an exaggerated ah noise as it set the mug back down. Somewhere on your home planet is a large steel box. I can't tell you where exactly because, honestly, we don't know. Bending reality is unreliable, but I assure you it is there. Now, you can leave like I asked, or I could be forced to let what is in the box out. This will lead to a slow, violent, and uh, bloody death of your entire species, one being at a time. The choice is yours. The video feed cuts out and the human disappears. The fleet admiral immediately jumped to action. Begin charging the weapons. Prepare for invasion. These humans think they can bluff the great De Walden Empire. We will show them the meaning of fear. The room exploded into activity as the men at their stations began preparing for war. As the guns warmed up and the cruisers moved into position, another message came across the screen. This one opened on its own and suddenly every monitor had picked a strange humanoid face staring out of them. The creature was horrific. Its skin was pale and pulled taut across its skull. The mouth opened impossibly wide, as if screaming in great anguish. The eyes were solid white, and even though it was obviously blind, it still seemed to be able to see me somehow. Alarm bells began ringing all across the command deck. What is happening? Sir, we don't know. Whenever this picture is, it's all through our system. It's being displayed on every monitor, on every ship, and, uh, we're getting reports of it appearing on the screens across the Walden. Wh whatever it is, th they want everyone to see it. The fleet admiral began cycling through the readouts rapidly as Earth's defense systems began to come online. The last thing I heard before the missiles hit was, What the fuck is SCP-096? End of chapter. Story number one. Remember the tale of when the human came. Written by Weijin Warrior. Gather round, younglings, and listen to my tale. I will tell before I die, so you may carry it forward. I am the last who remembers when the human came. Yes, I am. It really happened. It is not just a tall tale. We will tell around the fire to keep the dark away during the long dark. I may be almost five and a half, but my memory still sharp. She came alone, fell out of the sky, on a pillar of flame she did, in an egg made of metal, yes, metal. And it is true that she showed us how to melt metal from rock. Patience, young kids, I'll get to that bit too. Oh yes, pillar of flame, yeah, thank you great-grandson. Her egg made loud noises and much smoke coming down. Not like an ember it was, setting fire to the field outside the village. What? Yeah, yes. That is where the temple is today. Used to be a big field. But, but when this was a mere village, and not as big as today. Now, yes. We ran away at first, then came back. And as we watched the egg hatched, and she came out, Strode out, majestic-like. Each footfall made the earth shake. Each stride like two of mine. Well, three or four these days, but... So we fled again, and watched from afar as she walked around the village. Once, twice, thrice. Then she went for her egg and uh, sort of folded it up. And waited. Waited until we got the nerve to return. How brave as tried to talk to her. She listened, made noises like soft thunder in her mouth, caressed her magic box. Yes, yes, the magic box. She carries in all of the carvings. It was real, I saw it, heard it, even uh, touched it once. More of us dared come closer, talked at her, asked what she was, asked where she was from, asked what she wanted from us, asked. Why she had burned our crop. Blasphemy today. But we knew no better. And she listened and caressed the magic box. For a full day and a full night she just listened. Then she whispered to the box. And the magic in the box spoke to us in our tongue. Although spoken like none of us do. She told us that she was a human. One of many, many she told us that she was here because she was fated to be here. Because no human 
had been here before. She kept listening, asking for our stories, asking about how we lived, and we asked her for stories in return. And she told us about the great humans in the sky. Yes, yes, the stories carved into the slabs of the temple. Now, let me finish, impatient young thing. She told us how humans lived almost forever in the sky, how they are wise and all-knowing and all-powerful. She listened, and in a week she decided we were worthy to teach. Since she, in her descent, had burned the field, she taught better ways to grow better crops. She taught us better ways to hunt great beasts with weapons that strike from afar. She ranged wide and far, bringing our bravest and wisest with her. She used her magic box to find the copper mountain, and taught us to melt the rock into shiny, hard metal. She taught us to make his shiny metal into tools. Tools for hunting, tools for farming, tools for building. Instead of using sharpened stones. And we built a lot back then. People of neighboring villages had heard and came. People from their neighboring villages heard and came. The word of the humans spread across the land. And many, many people came. Our village became so big that it was no longer a village, and she gave it the name City. And then, as the season turned, she gathered us around and told us that her stay with us must come to an end, that she must travel back into the sky and do combat, but that she would come back one day to teach us more. She told us she would not forget us, and we promised to always remember her, and her teachings. She climbed back into her egg, sealed it up, and with a monstrous thunder, it lifted back up to the heavens. And we have remembered, and we have told the story, so it will be remembered. And we built the great temple with the statues and carvings to help us remember. And if we do not forget, one day she will come back. My time is growing near. I can feel it in my bones. So now you must remember the story of the human who came to our lands. Now you must remember how she taught us how to live and prosper. Now you must keep the memory, so she will return when she is done defending the anthropological paper at the university. What? Speak up! No, I do not know what those words mean. That is a mystery she did not divulge. But the defense of this is very important to her, and then she will come back. She promised. She promised. End of story. Story number two. Then yet the soldier stood, written by Monarch 357. The reptilian rifleman took point on the third story window. His target directly sights. Human, a bit under two meters tall, a lightweight armor at most. Unarmed, oddly enough, not many human soldiers let themselves get caught in enemy territory without something to protect themselves. The rifleman shook the thought away and refocused, easy prey for a crack shot like himself. His laser fell upon the soldier's heart and his finger moved to the trigger. The sound wave that was almost certainly alerted the soldier to the rifleman's presence was lost within the heavy-duty suppressor of his gun. Impact, a flash of crimson, and a new roughly fingernail-sized hole appeared in the human's chest. And yet, the soldier stood. The rifleman's confidence quickly faded. He knew the shot landed. It hadn't destroyed the heart, but the lung would still be obliterated. The human's blood still spurted out of the wound with the telltale rhythm of a beating heart. And the wound began to seal. Like the shot was being undone, tissue and flesh reformed and the soldier's torso was as good as new. Apart from some damage to his armor and rig, along with quite a large blood stain covering what remained, he was completely unaffected by the attempted kill. The rifleman wasn't sure what to do. The contemplation on whether to laugh, scream in fear, or simply flee raced through his mind. He pulled out his high-caliber sidearm and aimed it directly at the human's head. 
and just about targeted the trembling hands. He knew a human couldn't survive this. He killed many before using this exact pistol. Recoil, another shot, another spray of blood covered the pavement in front of the human. The larger caliber left a much larger hole in the human's head, it keeping itself just about together. And yet, the soldier stood. Just like what happened not two minutes before, the wound simply fixed itself. The rifleman couldn't even make out what was going on. One second, the head was in the shape of a donut, and the next, it was perfectly fine. The mind had shifted firmly back to the decision of fleeing. There was no way that he could kill this target. The rifleman had begun to turn and run. By the moment he had his back turned, the human was already sprinting towards his attacker, with inhuman speed. The nanite saturating his bloodstream had switched almost reflexively from protection to destruction. It took less than two seconds for the human to traverse the roughly 60 meter distance between the rifleman's perch and another half second to jump up to the exact window. A flash of steel concealed within his vest was drawn and swiftly plunged within the reptilian's chest, bluish black spraying from the newly created wound. As the rifleman began to fade to unconsciousness, he heard the human speak, Tell you another one! His voice cool and uneven, as if he hadn't even taken another being's life. Our assailants appear not to know what we're capable of. The human pulled a knife out of the rifleman's chest and returned it to its hidden compartment, his expression still neutral. He was experienced with killing, very experienced. It was the reason he got this blessing in the first place. More shots in the distance would be registered as a threat by another soldier, but not this one. He simply stood there, giddy, with anticipation. End of story. Story number three. To make an alien's day, written by Storm's Wrath. The humans had won the war. The Purr fleet was destroyed, their orbital defense network now floating blobs of slag. But that wasn't Danny's concern. He wasn't a medic or a soldier. He was here on Purr 4 because he wanted to be. He was carrying a bag of food and water on his back and pulling a hovercraft loaded nearly to capacity with it. The food wasn't for him, though. Danny spotted a Purr female walking in the ruined city street. Her clothes were tattered and she was holding the hands of two smaller Purr children. He could see the bruises and scrapes on all three of them. He didn't know whether she was their mother or not, until she gave one of them a kiss. Then she saw him. Her purple eyes widened in fear. Please, please, please don't kill my children. Do, do what you want to me, but, but keep them safe, she wailed. She held them tightly, whimpering softly. They also started whining which Danny guessed was their version of crying. It was still sad, though. All this destruction, just because a trade war went hot. I'm not going to hurt you, Danny said soothingly. I'm here to help. Ah, oh, you, you... You look angry, the woman said. Only at the ones who let the cities fall into chaos. I've got nothing against you. I only had a grudge with the poor hegemony. They're gone now, and you and I are just people. And from one person to another, I apologize for what was done to you. Danny reached into the hovercraft and pulled out some snacks. The children gazed hungrily at them, while their mother appeared apprehensive. Do you really want to? The woman trailed off. Danny handed them the snacks and dug around in the cart for a bit. Here's some water for you, too. If you guys are dehydrated, don't drink too much, or you might overload your body. The poor woman smiled at him and took the bottle he was offering. Thank you for your help. Are you willing to allow us to stay with you? We have no other source of food. Sure. Just let me find the others first. When the cart's half empty, we'll go back. If you guys want to, I can get you all registered for off-world travel. There's a whole lot more food up there, but I'll be making a lot more trips here in the future. I will gift and provide until it is done. Sounds good, the poor woman said. Her children had finished eating and already looked healthier. The skin had lost some of its paleness. They had always dreamed of seeing the stars. Up close, that is. What's their names? Danny asked. Lily and Myrna. Mine's Apex. I'm Danny. Let's go help the others. End of story. Starships are viable fire support platforms written by Kiwi Space Marine.
Private Walker slammed a fresh energy cell into his LAS-55, poking the laser rifle around the corner of the burnt-out lumberjack IFE he was using as cover. He fired several more beams at the entrenched Shilma on the ridge line. Whether he hit anything or not, he couldn't tell. As he immediately dropped back behind cover, just milliseconds later, return fire from the squids scorched the ground behind where he'd been. This is Tango 5-1, Sunray, he heard Captain Ellison scream into the radio. We're under attack by a heavily entrenched Shimla position at Grid 88 Bravo. We need immediate air support. Over. That's a negative 5-1. The all-too-calm voice of command replied. All air units are currently engaged in protecting their landers. You're on your own for now. Over. Roger, command. This is by one out. Switching off the radio, the captain swore. Walker couldn't blame him. The unit, after destroying a Confederate anti-air battery and liberating the native village from the squids, had set up a rendezvous with the rest of the Imperial Army at the projected landing zone. However... The convoy had come under heavy fire from nearby Ridgeline. The Shimla had attacked with heavy plasma cannons, destroying many of the unit's vehicles before they could react and bring their own firepower to bear. As such, the survivors were now pinned down, unable to move until the enemy could be dislodged. The air reverberated with the sound of vehicle-mounted railguns being fired. Turning his head, Walker saw one of the few surviving tanks fire its gun at an estimated location of the Shimla positions. An answering stream of plasma scorched the vehicle's hull, but the tank valiantly kept shooting. Peeking out from behind cover again, Walker fired a couple of shots before dropping back. He was glad his respirator had thermal vision, as it made fighting in the clouds of smoke and dust much easier. Unfortunately, those same clouds of dust also reflected off his laser beams and gave away his position, meaning that he couldn't stay exposed for too long while firing. The noise of the battle was tremendous. The clatter of submachine guns and the zap of laser impacts reverberated around the valley, while explosions and reports of heavy railgun fire sent shockwaves through the air that he felt through his armor. Looking over to his right, the private saw Corporal Shale and some other soldiers crouching behind an overturned Red Cat armored car. Get some! Shale screamed, while firing his Cough 111 wildly at the enemy. You snake arm squids, I kill you! Oh! A flurry of lasers sent in reply made the corporal duck back behind the relative safety of the Red Cat's chassis. Walker wanted to slam his head against the lumberjack's hull in frustration. The situation was hopeless. The unit was outgunned and had no hope for air support while the landings were taking place. Suddenly, the radio trackled again. Tango 5-1, stand by. I have the Naval air assets available for tasking. Over. Roger, command, Captain Ellison replied. The relief he was feeling audible in his response. What you got for us, over? Attack Corvette Sabre is on standby in your area. Over. Roger, command. Can you patch us through, over? Affirmative 5-1. Change the channel to 7. Over. Thank you, command. This is 5-1. Sunray out. Changing the channel as instructed, Ellison spoke again. Corvette Sabre. This is Tango 5-1 Sunray. We are pinned down by enemy forces on Ridgeline 37 at Grid 88 Bravo. Requesting fire mission. Danger close. Over. Roger. 5-1. Acknowledged. Request for fire mission. Stand by. We are five minutes out. Over. Roger, Sabre. Be advised. Targets will be marked by red smoke. Over. Can't be 5-1. There's a Sabre out. Ensign Moore switched her radio to Sabre's internal channel. Captain, Tango 5-1 reports the targets on Ridge 37 will be marked by red smoke. Thank you, Lieutenant. Lieutenant Commander Petrov replied. The spacecraft commander turned back to the front of the warship's cramped bridge. Navigation, blot us a course over to the target. Aye, Captain, the navigator replied. Grid 88 Bravo is on the heading 230. Right. Helm steer course 230. Night, sir. Lieutenant Abara responded from his station next to the navigator. Steering course 230, ETA grid 88 Bravo, five minutes. Petrov shifted in his seat, trying to stay comfortable in his baggy flight suit as the pilot slowly swung the 100-meter-long Starcraft onto a new heading. While the Blade-class attack corvettes were more maneuverable in atmosphere than the Navy's landing craft, they still handled like a beached whale. Weapons, this is Bridge, Petrov spoke into his radio. 
We have been tasked with destroying entrenched squid infantry at Grid 88 Bravo. Targets will be marked by red smoke. Aye, sir, the weapons officer replied. Commander Petrov stared at the saber's panoramic aerodynamic sloped window as the craft flew towards the target area. Below the airborne spacecraft were thin wisps of clouds, and below them was the ground. Somewhere on that ground, the commander mused, was a pinned down mechanized infantry unit fighting for survival. He hoped his ship would be able to tip the odds in their favor. Inside the hold of the corvette, the ship's small crew scurried about, ensuring the spacecraft's plethora of weapons were ready for action. Safety pins were disengaged, ammunition belts were connected, and missiles were fed into their launchers. From a station beside the commander, Ensign Moore gave another report. Captain, Tanker 500 reports the targets are being marked by red smoke. Thank you, Ensign. Weapons, confirm you see the red smoke. Situated on the lower gun deck, the firing room of the Sabre was eerily calm compared to the bustle of the rest of the ship. Here, the only noises were the hum of computers, the muffled drone of the spacecraft's engines, and the radio chatter of the firing team. At the front of the tiny room, manning a control console in the center of the bulkhead, Lieutenant Gupta stared at a computer screen. The screen was showing a feed from one of the Corvette's external infrared cameras. The light from the display reflected off the visor of the naval astronaut's helmet as he studied the video feed for any signs of red smoke. Weapons, Captain, Gupta responded after a few moments. I have eyes on the red smoke. Roger, you may fire as soon as we're in range. Copy, the weapons officer replied. Guns, confirm you have eyes on the red smoke. Affirmative, I have eyes on the red smoke, came the response from the starship's railgun operator. Roger. Pressing a button on his console, the lieutenant opened the gun ports along the starboard side of the saber's hull, allowing the powerful railguns to poke out from their recesses. Checking his screen, Gupta saw that the plume of thick red smoke that marked that area was now within range of the saber's guns. Captain, we are in firing range. Firing on targets now. Guns, you are cleared hot. Fired for effect. Over. Affirmative. Cleared hot for targets marked by red smoke. Firing for effect. Out. The saber shuddered as one of the powerful starboard railgun cannons fired, sending a sabo round hurtling towards the ground. Shot over. Shot out. Gupta watched through his camera as the ground impacted the ground marked by red smoke, sending a geyser of dirt and detritus spraying into the sky. Splash over, the lieutenant reported. Splash out. Good effect on target. Repeat over. Affirmative. Repeat out. The attack corvette vibrated with a rhythmic thumping as the railgun spat round after round at the entrenched Schimmler. The weapons officer watched through his screen as a listless detachment, noting how each impact sent soil spewing into the sky. The only thought that crossed his mind was how each impact meant that another group of enemy soldiers would be neutralized. To Private Walker, it looked like the ridge line had spontaneously exploded. Blooms of dirt and clouds of shrapnel from destroyed plasma cannons spewed into the sky as a saber mercilessly pummeled the entrenched Schimmler. Each impact sent shockwaves through the ground that rattled the private's bones. After about a minute of aerial bombardment, the barrage stopped. Peeking around the corner of the lumberjack, the soldier peered through his rifle scope. A cloud of smoke and slowly settling dirt hung over the ridge line. Flicking on his thermal goggles, Walker surveyed the recently churned hillside, keeping an alerted eye open for enemy movements. To his relief, there was nothing. Clear, he called out, other soldiers reporting the same. Saber, this is 5-1 Sunray, he heard Captain Ellison over the radio. All targets destroyed, thanks for the assist. Roger 5-1, the warship's radio officer replied. Glad we can help. This is Sabre out. Looking up, Walker watched as the barely visible grey shape slowly circled around the battlefield. After a few moments, it changed course and slowly flew off. As he watched the attack corvette depart, the private wondered who first proposed the idea of using space-capable warships as fire support platforms. Whoever it was, he tipped his hat to them. After all, the concept, if nothing else, was very damn effective. End of story. Story number one. The good stuff.
written by Squiggle Story Studios. A gang of thugs walk down the crowded tunnels below the station's surface level. Other residents of the underground scattered when they saw them. The Orkothrob took point, the most vicious and bloodthirsty alien allowed within the galactic community. Massive creatures of muscle and teeth, so named because of the resemblance to a cross between two human mythical creatures, lycanthrope and an orca. They turned a corner to a dingy, cramped mechanic shop, distinctly made from the standard size shipping crate. The human owner stood in front of his store and welcomed the group of near duels. Welcome, welcome, the human greeted, a death stick hanging from his hip, forward-facing eyes hidden behind UV glasses. Can I interest you in a barely used flux capacitor? Can make your ship to a galaxy run in less than a parsec. But the small beady eyes of the orcathrope did not move from the target. A deep-throated voice rumbled from beneath his power suit. I want the goods, he stated clearly. Mr. Black sent me. The store owner nodded and plucked the death stick from his mouth, crushing it beneath his boot. All right, this way, sir. I keep them in the back. The back was well hidden from peering eyes behind a curtain and a flick of a light switch and the dingy store turned into an illegal weapon shop. So what can I get you, lads, plaz, or ale? The weapons dealer smirked, throwing a crude hip thrust at the mention of the induendo. All the best military-grade weapons from the United Soul Systems a man could want, complete with the registration. The weapons dealer said with this wink, but the orchithrope was unfazed. No, I want the good stuff, he repeated with insistence. All right then. The human took a sidestep and flipped a switch, and a display shelf lifted from the floor. A fan of the classic, sir. An AK-201 Titanium Desert Eagle. Oh, my personal favorite, El Ella Perret. The loving hand ran a display case, and the translator picked up with a hint of arousal. The gang muttered in excitement, looking over the outlawed slug throwers, but the leader snorted, leaning in intimidatingly. No! Oh, I want the good stuff. I want a pencil. The human blinked before grinning. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. My apologies. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a set of leather gloves and reached for a dial safe. A few quick turns and a retinal scan later, the human presented the gang with a black leather suitcase that oddly matched his gloves. He unclasped the case and offered the items to the gang leader. For a professional such as yourself, we have the finest selection of pencils this side of the central world. We have the ever-reliable to be steadfast favorite of academics, or we have the wide range of colors from the Faber Castell. Is this a joke? One of the gang members spluttered. How can that be a weapon? Snorted his disagreement through his pig-like snout. The human looked at the gang leader with a raised eyebrow. Care for a demonstration? The orcathrope nodded his head, silently watching the human at work. The weapon dealer lifted the 2B pencil and twirled it in his hands, playing with a small stick. The pencil is made from the finest graphite and light wood. Cellulose grown on high-pressure worlds is hard to collect and work with, but the benefits are numerous. It's lightweight and strong, durable in zero-G. It is undetectable to scanners. They're a household item within the USS, so suspicious are low. With a sharp twist and movement, the human stabbed the pencil through the uppity gang member's membrane, lodging it in an artery. The alien gasped and choked, grasping at the pencil, only for it to break off inside of him. The unfortunate victim fell to the floor, blood draining from his body, and they have an indefinite shelf life under the right conditions. The human stepped over the dying body and appealed to the leader directly. But they do shatter easily if you're not careful, and graphite tends to clock delicate machinery and vital organs. Minor warning for the unaffiliated. The orcathrope gave a pleased groan and reached for a pink-colored pencil. I'll take twelve. End of story. Story number two. Doom, written by Operation Technician. Bernand was about to experience a fate. Worse than death, which left him with two options, 
actual death, since that would be better, or an attempt at combating that fate. He didn't have the time to think that through in the two seconds he had left, so his fight-or-flight reflex chose for him. But how to fight? The moment the contact telepathic mental slithered at him touched him, his mind would become clay for the thing to tear apart. It would use an direct existing thoughts, railroading his mind straight into insanity. This much was known from others, from those that had lived the seconds required to explain what had been done to them, before promptly willing themselves to die. He was actually trained to defeat this sort of attack. That training came down to shooting the mentalist before Rick could touch him, which was hard to do with molten stack for a rifle. Two seconds to find a solution. No time to think things through. Fernand went for the first thought that came to mind. Mental palace. What did he consider calming and familiar? That was easy. That was carved into him. He didn't even have to look for the answer. When he was six, his parents had made him play a game. It was called Doom. They said it was one of the first. They said it was critical he play it first. That only after he beat it would he be allowed to play other computer games. The child wanted to play other games and was very motivated to get through his parents' choice. That chore turned out to be the coolest thing that he had ever experienced. And the six-year-old was impressed. The game imprinted into him. He judged every other game he ever played against it and found most of them lacking. When the war came, when he was fighting for his life, he judged the same game in contrast with the real thing, no matter how stupid or morbid that was. Murderous confidence stolen from that same game became his anthem of survival. In his head he began to play Doom, an endless level, but by his subconscious, one that went on and on forever. But instead of remembering the pixels and primitive animations, he replaced the game's visuals, sounds, and motions with the five years of combat that had preceded this day. Five years of real killing, real bleeding, and real dying. But he still moved with the speed of the game's character, and still fought one against all, at a pace and manner no soldier ever fought at and lived to tell about. The mentalist reaching mass splashed against his chest, stabbing through his chest bit to touch his skin. Usually, after that, death came three seconds later, and the victim's mind gutted, intel extracted, and personality torn apart with its own worst fears. Two seconds after touching Fernand, the mentalist began to screech. The whole mass rippled, cringed, contorted, and promptly tore itself in two. Fernand staggered back, his mind many days older than it had been seconds ago, eyes glazed. From the side, a scattered of fire made the two halves of the mentalist stop thrashing. Sarge had finished reloading. Reflexively, Fernand sidewalked behind a column where he froze, blinking rapidly. Sarge and the commander were beside him a second later. With sudden focused and raised eyebrows, Fernand met first Sarge's, then the commander's eyes, then he stared at the mentalist's corpse, one of the hundreds scattered throughout the chamber. Sarge and the commander frowned at the first and only survivor of the mentalist's attack, somewhat relieved by his coherence. Sheet, Sarge said. The commander drew a sword and loomed over the motionless mentalist. Manand, you're effect up in the head. End of story. Story number three. Refuse, written by Shock Lionheart. It's well known throughout the universe that the dominant native species of the Milky Way galaxy Orion Arm Sol 3A Earth, calling themselves humans, are the universe's garbage collectors. Not to be fair, they were essentially forced into this role, and they weren't, aren't happy about it. But while they truly fell into line, they did eventually take up the mantle life had prepared for them. It was always the same. They drop into a system in the angular, unpainted, almost hurts to look at, strictly utilitarian ships, and they'd spend anywhere from a few days to a few decades cleaning up anything between a few days to a few centuries worth of garbage. They'd then, in the worst cases, admonish the people, not letting the things get that bad again, 
and then they'd leave, only returning once the refuse had built back up. But here's the wrinkle in the tale. Humans have long since mastered nanotechnology and are able to break down virtually any material, organic or not, into a slurry of subatomic particles for later reconstitution. It is the ultimate in recycling technology. But that is not why humans are the universe's garbage men. The humans are the universe's garbage men because they have an adamantine sense of justice and an equally powerful will to impart justice where they feel wrong has been committed. And so, after their first wildly successful forays into doing exactly that, the universe got a wake-up call. Every slaver empire, every megacorp that puts profits over lives, every sleazy politician and mob boss, anyone and everyone the humans feel demonstrates something they call moral bankruptcy, was put on notice. If you're going to be a garbage person, beware of the humans. They are very good at taking out the trash. End of story. Tree Dwellers, written by Bo Woodstock. Scanning the cafeteria, I left the credit check area. I spotted a waving hand and nodded in satisfaction. I'd only been an exchange student at Mars Technical University for one of their months, as they called it, but happily, I'd already found acceptance. Like my people, the Zesqua, humans also found that sharing mealtimes together enhanced social bonding and this particular human, by the name of David, had insisted that I keep joining his table on the days we shared the same schedule. It was clear that a friendship was building, something that I had no complaints about. Gone! Glad you can make it. Dave smiled at me, and as I approached, I wouldn't miss it, I replied, bearing the lower row of my teeth in reply. As is often the case when new people meet, there was a very unfortunate misunderstanding when humanity met us almost a century ago. What ensued could barely be called a war, though many lives were lost. Before cooler heads prevailed and the prospective diplomats of each race finally achieved a peaceful resolution. One of the first established protocols was an exchange of language, including that of facial and body language. While the gesture had first been unnerving, the very quickly became apparent that they were equivalent translations that could be made. The Zesqua were also primates, though we had retained our fur coats through evolution and had much the same range of facial expressions. It honestly wasn't that difficult to accept once you got used to them, particularly after fifty years of the Alliance. Now, young Zesqua were being taught not only the equivalent human expressions, but Terran standard was quickly becoming accepted as a second language to be taught as early as stage one schooling. So, Dave continued, once I'd found my seat, how did that trip to Earth go last week? It's been a while since I was home. Always miss it, but I'm curious to see what a visitor thinks. Did you learn anything interesting? It was incredible, I nodded. So many museums and preserved relics from the advancement of technology. I particularly enjoyed, what were they called, uh, the Baikonur Cosmodrome and the Kennedy Space Center. It first steps of humans into space, incredible, that occurred even though humans were not united at the time. <laughs> yes, Dave laughed. Not the best time in our history, certainly, but it is an important to remember the past. You know, I said, poking at my salad with a wonk. It is interesting you say that, see? While we were there, uh, in this city of New York, we encountered a group of humans that were, well, not happy to see us. The exchange group, I mean. Kept calling us names and bestial primates in your world, calling us tree dwellers, telling us to go back to the tree world. Seemed to still be angry about the great misunderstanding at first contact. David's face fell. I think I know the kind you're talking about. I'm sorry you had to experience that. I hope no one was hurt. No, thankfully. I shook my head. They were just noisy and rude, said a lot of hostile words, but appeared too afraid to approach us directly. Not that I'm complaining, but it's strange. Our people have been allies now for so long. Why would any of us wish them harm? Well, uh, it might have something to do with the fact that you're all at least a head taller than us, David laughed. No one wants to pick a fight with a Wookiee. Uh, wait, sorry, uh, do you know? Of course. I shook my head with an amusement. Enough of your culture has made its way to us to understand that particular association. There are worse fictional characters to be compared with. Okay, good, David nodded. Actually great. 
That's a classic piece of human media. Right, I replied. I would be interested in seeing more of it, by the way. Back to that encounter, though. There was one thing that confused me. Several of the humans kept yelling their persistence would win in the end. What in the stars is that about? Oh, you got one of the special groups. David shook his head, half in amusement, half in exasperation. At my confused look, he sighed and rolled his eyes. All right, get comfortable. Keep eating. This might take a while. What you experienced is, in my opinion, one of the worst and also best things about us humans. We don't let go of the past. I saw that, I nodded. All the museums. I don't see how that's a bad thing. No, David shook his head. Those museums are history, which is obviously similar to the past, but not the same. To explain what they were saying, David again rolled his eyes. I'm annoyed, by the way, because the entire reason I know this stuff is due to how much those types won't shut up about it. Basically, they're hung up on the fact that way in our past, before even metalworking was discovered, humans hunted with something called persistence hunting and throwing rocks, as if it makes us superior in some way. They all say almost exactly the same thing, and I'll bet that somewhere in those blogs or solar websites where people read and talk about it endlessly, because they won't drop the point. I mean, how else would some random person on the street know that particular term? It's not like it comes up in conversation daily. Are you following so far? I motioned with a hand for him to continue, as I had just taken a massive bite out of a sandwich. Okay, he continued. Anyway, this is what I mean when they won't let go of the past. They will read and read and talk and talk about anything that matches their worldview, like a giant echo chamber. They'll learn all the things about our past, such as why we have fingernails instead of claws, why we only have hair on our heads, why we call the Earth the Earth. They'll also find places where, in their opinion, humanity was great, and claim that we need to return to things the good old days, learning almost as much as some professional anthropologists do. Note, I'd say almost, because they only learn selectively, trumping up the facts that they'd like, conveniently forgetting the ones they don't. I can see how that's dangerous, I nodded, pausing to take a bite before continuing. It's impossible to advance if you're being held back. Something you might find amusing. It's also an insult in my society to call someone a tree dweller. Counterintuitive, right? It is, David agreed, raising an eyebrow. I mean, from what I understand, all of your cities are built on massive canopies of your world's forests, right? Aren't your people still primarily arboreal? I nodded. We are. By the way, we see it. We live in the trees still, but we don't dwell there. We are no longer afraid to descend to the forest floor as our ancestors were. That was our first step, you know. The first squaw to overcome their fear and see what lay beneath the safety of the canopy was a pioneer. As without them, we would not have discovered the arts of metalworking. And you know how it goes from there. Dwelling in the trees forever would mean that we would never have left, never advancing to where we are today. Anyway, these people are that confronted us. They seem like real tree dwellers to me. I think you're right, David nodded. As I said, they cling to the past, but don't learn the lessons that it teaches. That's what history is about, taking everything, even the parts that you don't like, and learning from it, recognizing what to be proud of, what to be ashamed of, and advancing from there without making the same mistakes. Indeed. Speaking of which, I noticed the wall chrono behind him. I know that the transport tube to the engineering wing usually gets crowded around this time. I was almost late last week, not making that mistake again. Until next time, always uh, have a good rest of your day. End of story. Story number two. The Creature in the Sun, written by Erebos Yeet. The Creature in the Sun was a simple fact. It was a fundamental as life and death itself. It was and would always be. Call it a god. Call it an apex predator. Doesn't matter, it simply is. We first laid witness to it when it destroyed the Gandan Empire. They were the greatest of species, successfully having colonized six different solar systems. They dared to venture to a seventh as soon as they landed their first ship. It happened. It clawed out of the biggest sun we had ever discovered. 
His fiery fingers were bigger than most of our planets. He slowly arose from a solar storm and finally freed. It opened its flaming wings, showcasing at a tremendous terror the universe had in store. The Gandans didn't stand a chance. Seven planets raised to the ground in equally as many days. Not a single soul survived. After that, the creatures simply returned home. Two more species tried to colonize a seventh planet. Both were swiftly dealt with. They tried to fight it, having prepared to defend against it for centuries. The flaming monstrosity didn't even notice and erased them from existence. Seemingly, to make sure no civilization would ever forget, the creature made one flight every 150 years, destroying just one planet. Never a very important one, but just important enough for us to remember, for us to fear. So the creature came to be. To many it became a god, to others it was simply an enforcer of a universal rule. They called it many different things, and tried to please it in many different ways. Nobody even thought about resisting it anymore. It was deemed inevitable. Then came the human. When they first noticed, the different species greeted them like they would any new civilization. They exchanged information, established possible trading routes, and warned them of the universal rule. The humans proved to be quite skeptical little buggers. Every scientific fact we graciously had enlightened them with, they tried to disprove. Every history they verified, every friendship made, was tested. The biggest fact they faced was, of course, the universal rule. It was a rule unbroken. To us, this would make it the truth. To them, it was a challenge. It was a hot summer night when we noticed. First came the warnings of solar storms, then came the footage. It was monstrous. We all saw it. We saw our universe shatter. The creature fighting for its life. The humans never broke its rule. Instead, they came for its home directly. A black hole triggered within the biggest star in existence. The creature resisted, but it didn't matter. Just as easily as it had destroyed the guardians, the humans had destroyed it. The creature in the sun was no more. All that remained was darkness. The reaction was mixed, irrational even. Some species were angry. They feared some kind of divine redemption on all life. Some species were scared of the humans. Most of them were scared now, actually, including me. I was the first in command of the Dentarons at the time. Being traded partners and perhaps even friends, we felt obliged to contact them. Yet, I had no idea what could be said. Eventually, I asked them two words. What now? They responded not just to us, but to all known species in the galaxy. It didn't make much sense to us at the time. But the words are, to this day, known by just about everyone. It became so important. It is still the slogan of the new interplanetary federation. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. Must we ourselves not become gods? End of story. Story number one. The Old Breed. Written by Teller of Tall Tales. The smell of cigar smoke hung heavy in the air of the backwater bar I found myself in, the various species intermingling, giving off a sense of false peace. The burnt bludgeon was a bar for scum, criminals, and smugglers. I only found myself here because I was being handed off to another smuggler. Where I'd be going, I did not know. The little bell above the door tinkled in the comparative quiet. My four eyes widened. They were supposed to be extinct. An old breed clinging to a thread of salvation, but one stood in the door, metallic, robotic prosthetic touching the top of the doorframe as they ducked their head through. Black hair shot through with grey grew all over his still organic half of their head. They raised their head and I heard a few audible gasps. Half of the human's face was metal, a rubber membrane stretched over where the cheek would be, just below the pitch black camera eye. The bright green iris of the human's natural eye washed over the occupants of the bar as they walked towards the counter. A sword was strapped to their back, a human firearm slung low on their hip by their cybernetic arm. 
the human slid into a stall and looked at the bartender in the eye. What was left of the lips pulling up into an amicable smile? Excuse me, bartender. You wouldn't happen to have a human vodka in these baths, would you? The bartender slowly nodded, picking up a bottle of clear liquid. Two hundred credits per ounce, the bartender grumbled, dusting the bottle off. The human chuckled softly, reaching into a pocket at their back jacket and setting a gold-colored coin on the counter. The bartender's hackles raised, the skin on his dog-like face paling as he clutched the bottle. I understood his reaction, though. Pure aether was rare. Only a few known species used it as currency, equivalent to two million galactic standard credits. I don't really carry anything smaller, but you can keep the change. I haven't had a non-synthesized vodka for about ten cycles now. The bar went silent, all chatter ceasing. Ten galactic cycles was the equivalent to two hundred human years. If this human wasn't bluffing, they were the living equivalent of an eldritch being. Tenderly, the bartender set the bottle and shot a glass down before picking up the coin and pocketing it. He seemed afraid of the human. The human picked up the bottle, pouring the clear liquid into the glass until it was full before knocking it back in its entirety. Someone gathered their wits and spoke. Seems they're not place for one of the old breed to get a drink. My capital grabbed one of my arms, holding it tightly, almost shaking. The human laughed softly, pouring a drink another shot before speaking. <laughs> well, how does one put this? He raised his prosthetic to the light, inspecting the non-human construction. An old friend called in a favor, said his granddaughter had been kidnapped by her lover, wanted me to find her. He poured another shot as the air grew tense, many hands falling to their weapons. Calm down now, I don't want to turn this into a bloodbath. I'm just looking for information. He reached into his breast pocket and held up a photo with his prosthetic. A photo of me with my grandfather in the hospital. Grandpa, were you really telling the truth when you said you saved a human life? If you've seen this young lady, please kindly point me in her direction, so I may bring her home where she belongs. Setting the picture down, he took the shot he poured and dumped it down his throat. My captor stood, stepping out from the table and quietly drawing the human gun he stole from my father. The human didn't notice. I tried to scream, but my captor had already pulled the trigger. The deafening bang made my ears ring and most everyone flinch. Except the human. The prosthetic was by his head, clutching something as the human shook their head, dropping a deformed bullet into his empty shot glass. The human's head turned, the smile gone. You know, I thought you'd be trouble, after all. You matched the photo the old man handed me. Pretty powerful illusion magic you have there, disguising her as empty space. Incredible! The human picked up a bottle of clear spirits as my captor shook. Bringing the room to his lips, he began to drink, chugging the rest of the bottle's contents before crushing it with his cybernetic hand. But I'm going to have to ask you to surrender. You will not win. My captor snarled and began thumbing back the hammer of the firearm. Before anyone knew what happened, my captor fell back, a chunk silently removed from his skull as he dropped to the ground. The shot glass sat empty, the deformed bullet gone as the human drew his cybernetic arm back and sighed, shaking his head. Dumbass, try to shoot me with my own damned gun again. His eyes met mine, and he simply smiled. Ready to go home? Your family is worried about you. My vision blurred as I began to sob, all the fear and anxiety of the last week rushing out of that moment. A gentle arm wrapped around me, and I looked up at the human as he pulled the chair over and hugged me tight, saying, It's okay. Hero's here. Hero's here. Nobody's gonna hurt you under my watch. The human turned his head, and I heard the sounds of many tables being vacated as a door tinkled open. End of story. Story number two. The Range Advantage, written by Incredibles Ho. 
personal log one. Nazino turned the head towards the screen, its teeth sharp and exposed, its claws as sharp as its teeth, its skin covered in a grotesque, slimy substance. With ten eyes turned towards the camera, it began to speak. Well, this is my first log, I guess. I'm a warrior of the Garkagian, a dread host. The job involves a lot of fighting. We're on our way to pillage a world. New Corsago, it's called. It's inhabited by... Huxassins. Huxassins. Humans? Yeah. That's how you pronounce it. He said in a glutteral tone, as if barking. Should be an easy job. Humans aren't known for their warrior prowess. Hopefully I'll be done soon, and the pay is good, the man said. Anyway, I'll see what happens once we land, it said, still barking. Personal Log 2. The being once again showed its horrible face, holding out the camera. They've got a fecking projectile throwers. Half of us were massacred. To the last man, I tell you, the being said once again, its harsh tone making its way through the room. First we slaughtered a few of their military encampments, and then we looted their riches, and then we thought that we could just leave, but uh, oh no. The fecking civilians started fighting against us. They can aim their fecking projectile throwers without augments. He almost seemed to yell, augments, which would normally cost a lot of credits. These frustrations didn't end there, however. We lost like one quarter of our entire bloody force. One quarter, he exclaimed in anger and frustration. And the Dread Lord is ordering us to continue. He took a deep breath, talking to himself before continuing. They're a race of scientists and poets, not warriors. They're weaklings. My claws and jaws rip through them like it's nothing. But one of their projectiles can kill me within an instant. Personal Log 3 the man once again reared its ugly face, showing its pointy teeth and hardened skin. After that failure, the fecking idiot, which also happens to be our leader, decided to alter our tactics. He looked at some paper he held in his hand. We're going to deep strike tomorrow. Then projectiles can't penetrate drop pods, and we'll instantly be in melee range. So that we can either tear them apart, he said, letting out a sigh. <sighs> this time we're attacking... He said, at the piece of paper he held in his hand once again. New London, a relatively wealthy colony. Don't know why no more dread hosts have tried plundering it. It says here it's quite undefended, he said. Oh well, at this time we won't get torn to pieces before we even reach their lines. Personal Log 4 The man turned on the camera, his face desperate. He seemed to do his species equivalent of grimacing. He stopped for a moment, and he took a deep breath. These hairless apes shot us down whilst we were dropping into them. They tore apart our drum pods, he yelled. I was in one of the later waves, otherwise I too would be merely a pile of ash right now. He said something to himself. Ancestors hope this never reaches the captain, but rebellion looks like a pretty good option right now, he said. We lost maybe 2,000, 3,000 men. We've got one half of the force we started with. And we haven't even fecking touched their riches, he yelled in anger and frustration. Log number five. The man sat down. Fear was imprinted on his face. We have to go down again, he said. This might as well be a bloody last words, he said with his voice full of sorrow. Where are the riches I was promised so that I could start my own family? Where are they? He said in frustration, his anger swelling. Might as well log where we're going. New Cressy looks undefended. Then again, that's what we thought about the previous two worlds. Personal Log 6 The man now sat not in his usual quarters, but rather a small area. Behind him was a human bed, and a human chair, and even a human desk. A bright static light shone upon him. I predicted it was failure. It was indeed disastrous, he said. He looked up at the camera, his eyes filled with sorrow. The world was undefended. That wasn't the problem, he said. They had guns on their ships. They don't ram their ships. They shoot with them, he yelled. They took us captive, and here we are, far from home, still stronger, faster, and harder than them, just massively outranged. End of story. Deuce Mechanicus, Killdozer 
written by Swift Hound. Another day, another incident with a human engineer. Humans have been a part of the galactic community for a few of their centuries now. They've always had a knack for thinking outside the box, coming up with uh, unconventional solutions to their problems. The examples are numerous, but some famous ones include the time a human proved the false vacuum decay existed by trying it in a heavily secured setting. They even did it on the furthest possible point in the galaxy from other civilizations, giving the closest known outpost a nice 10,000 years or so before the effects would hit them. The experiment worked in the containing and resulting action, luckily. The scientist in question was thanked for their contribution to science and was promptly sent to a technological dead zone called the Amosphere, where most technology is banned. The other example, I'll list, is the time a human chemist created a long sought all in one cure for cancer. Turns out that the secret ingredient was indeed hard liquor they poured into their ongoing experiment. The human was heavily intoxicated and by some forsaken god's womb got the idea while passed out. He woke up in his laboratory and just poured the remainder of the bottle into his experiment. The resulting concoction, with the slight modifications depending on the receiver, is able to kill cancer cells at a 10,000 to 1 ratio. This meant that the largest tumors could easily be targeted and killed off whilst causing insignificant damage to healthy tissue. The result, while not directly applicable to Xenos, was the cornerstone for the current treatment and causes for most sapiens. What this means is that the humans can and will not restrain themselves to reasonable means after they feel that they have proven unsuccessful. Humans will, at the moment they break their psych, concoct ideas so outrightly idiotic and outlandish that I'm afraid of what they will do. The higher in education a human receives, the larger the threat they wield in their hands. An uneducated human is capable of your basic everyday misdeeds. Someone with an engineering degree is capable of insurmountable feats of destruction and madness. The only thing restraining most humans is their basic instinct to be helpful and orderly. They will be the first ones denouncing harsh means, even if they deserve it. Most humans, because there are always outliers, humans born without empathy or remorse are dangerous, just like in any species. But the most dangerous ones are those who have been bent and broken from stress and strain, driven out of the comfortable fields of sanity and into the pits of madness and contempt. Such is the case of what ultimately caused the major change in how galactic powers and megacorporations operate with each other. Megacorporations had become either large governments themselves or controlled significant portions from behind the public eye. Wars were waged under fabricated pretenses when, in reality, it was just an extremely aggressive business tactics. Planets were conquered under the flag of liberation, but in reality, the populace just had new faces to look upwards to and curse at. Money became increasingly difficult to use as larger corporations had started using their own currencies, making basic transactions between different areas almost impossible, as no one on the other side could use the corporation money elsewhere. The largest corporations controlled dozens of systems, with tight grips on that became even harder to get out of. Governments could do nothing as their laws became impossible to police, not that the well-paid-off officials wanted to. Bribes were sometimes even purported as salary, but at that point, no one could really fight back. Snitching on someone to the same someone really doesn't work out unless your goal was being taken for a naked spacewalk. This went on for a few decades with increasingly brutal shows of power. A horrible time in the history of the galaxy. Of course, most had started to resent the corporations, but their grip was too tight for normal people to start anything real. Getting caught meant being fired, which, in a system where all your money came from a single source that you could not use anymore, made you an outcast in moments. Some revolts started, but faded out. Sometimes they even completed their tasks and reclaimed control of systems. But greed took a hold, and rebellions became the same corporations they fought against. A few even kept the original corporation's name. The lines between species blurred, as everyone was simply working for a corporation. No real winner species could be selected from the bunch. Even if some did generally better than others, 
It was an all-out lawless time as everyone tried to do what was best for themselves and only themselves. Helping someone meant that they could be promoted instead of you. The different corporations had their own information systems, meaning that interstellar news became extinct. No news from other systems would be heard by public on the other side. Corporations kept their populace in small bubbles and only fed them what they wanted to tell. A single system could fall out of control, but no one could see it happen. There was nothing unifying the galaxy anymore, no community beyond what business transactions and corporations lorded over. Ever larger space stations were built to serve as unified control hubs for corporations. The populace could not reach the stations and thus could not even dream of revolting. It was rare for anyone born planetside to ever even visit a station. It wasn't as rare as for someone to be kicked off stations and into the muddy grounds of the public. Only a few thousand elite would control billions of lives in company security, protected by turrets and the heaviest shielding money could buy. Even basic mechanics that lived on stations were living like kings, well, at least when compared to those stuck on planets. Eventually, someone got tired of it all. A human, a engineer, tasked with creating new weaponry. He was one of the rare specimens uplifted from menial jobs on the planet. He had simply worked to live and survive on a planet, but was given a job on a station after a purge of staff left the engineering department severely lacking in expertise. Saying no wasn't even an option to him. Say no would have meant being silenced. The corporation couldn't show weakness to the people after all. It took over a decade for him to eventually rise to the top of the engineering food chain. He saw nearly all of his original compatriots become vile and twisted by their newly found glory along the way. He even witnessed some of them simply being dropped into space. He also found out what the bright burning flashes in the night sky near the station had been. All those times, he had watched the sky and seen meteors. All the time, as a child, he had looked up in wonder as the bright lights. All those flashes had been corpses burning in re-entry. In that moment of sick realization, something snapped in his mind. He began planning and constructing something only a mental patient could come up with in a drug-fueled fever dream. His position in the corporation gave him enough resources and freedom that allowed him to steal one of the largest ships in the corporation, stuffing it full of riches, machinery, and fuel. The station itself was left crippled by several malfunctions in the life support system and the complete destruction of the engineering department. No one managed to link his disappearance to the lost items. It was simply assumed that he had accidentally destroyed the engineering department, killing himself in the process and destroying the equipment. He jumped away to an unknown location and wasn't seen afterwards. Life went on as normal after the particularly large meteor shower lit up the planet sky. Around a decade after the incident, an impossibly sized warp signature was detected by the very same station scanners. The signature could only have been generated by something as large as a station. The station, by this time, was several kilometers long, making the person now responsible for the scanning station go into a frenzy. Warnings blared across the entire station as they expected the light from the incoming thing to reach the station. Every soul on the station was in panic, while the populace on the planet was ignorant of anything being wrong. Shields were raised to their utmost limits and projected towards the unknown object's point of entry. Then, something hit the station. They had ripped the shields open like there had been nothing and tore through the center, causing critical damage to almost every system deemed necessary for life. The atmosphere vented from countless holes and tears in the station, rendering all major portions of the station dead within minutes. No one would have known what had hit the station if not for a short audio-only message that was sent from the object. The message was what can only be described as a manifesto. It was highly personalized to the creator's own life, which made it all but incomprehensible to everyone. The message wasn't important to the people, but the exploding carcass of the corporation station was. It wasn't long until the people revolted and the remaining corporate workers, now cut off from each other, and their management were left completely shattered, the corporation crumbling within days. 
Other corporations cared little for what had happened. They assumed it had just been a single nutjob who had crashed into an unprepared and badly shielded station with a warp engine. After three similar incidents with the same message repeating every time, they got concerned. Every time was the same. An unknown object would exit warp and then hit Corporation Station, destroying it completely. The object would destroy a station, then leave and warp towards the next closest station. The path of destruction went on for years, with Corporation Stations becoming ever scarcer as one by one they were destroyed for good. No matter how prepared or how much shielding the station had, it was always destroyed without knowledge of what had hit it. After many hits, someone had smarts to install a black box on a station that was believed to be one of the next targets. The box could be measured every single scanner and sensor reading from the entire station. They hoped that it would bring in some insight to it all. It did, in fact, give insight to the issue. The result terrified the mega corporation so much that it freely shared the information it had gotten. The still unknown object was traveling at what the computer routed up to 100% the speed of light. The black box was able to calculate up to 16,000 digits, but after that it would round up to the number. This explained why the object gave off such an astounding warp signature. Its speed was the highest recorded in history. Sure, warp speeds you up to faster than light but it doesn't work for multiple strikes. The result from warp bubble hitting significant amounts of matter is also cataclysmic to everything nearby, so using a warp bubble offensively would have destroyed the object during the first attack. Most stations also have warp inhibitors to prevent attacks from warp missiles. Someone had built the perfect, unstoppable weapon and aimed it at every single corporation station. With corporate stations beginning to number in the two digits, it was the beginning of a new time. Corporations that had been reliant on their fortified stations collapsed, leaving the people to build anew. No one wanted to rebuild corporations anymore, fearing what had become publicly known as Deus Mechanicus, to return and destroy the planet. No one knew if it could. No one wanted to try. The remaining corporations abandoned their stations and tried to go back planet side, but found only resistance movements. The galaxy had started to fill up with talk again. The last station to be destroyed was a special occasion. The station had been emptied weeks prior in fear. It was destroyed like usual, but this time a small capture was detected detached and slowing down. This time, a different message was sent towards the planet, this time in clear video. On the video was a disheveled man, shaking and stuttering on his words amidst spouts of laughter. The message was several minutes long and consisted of rambling, repeated structure, and enough explicitives and insults to count as a war crime. It only ended once the capital had gone too close to the star and gotten vaporized. Moments later, the now familiar warp signature appeared, taking every scrap of evidence with it. Scientists still bicker about how the impossible speed was achieved and now had time dilation not to take an effect on the creator. Whatever the creation was, however it was made, people still cheer and celebrated at its mention. The next centuries would be marked as rebuilding lost economies, this time with stricter rules placed on companies. Any signs of corruption within governments were met with uh, piercing opposition and public outcry. No one wanted a repeat of the past. Some still fear what the galaxy came to know as Deus Mechanicus, Killdozer. End of story. Better Angels, written by Nick Graydon. Special High Ambassador and Senior Diplomat to the Union Council, Reeve Samugi, had a real issue on her hands. Thanks to a few friends, she was privy to information that her appearance at the upcoming inquiry was intended to be targeted attack on humans and their government. The exact nature was still a mystery, but it was hard for her to believe, as Earth had yet to join the Union Council officially. Their laws did not weigh on a species as a whole. Humanity's foray into the stars was soon met with first contact. The resulting plan for the planet was quick and harsh, but a few ambassadors were sent forth to hammer out a few details and to stall joining the ranks of the local space-faring species. Back home, it was quickly decided to lock down the planet, 
No one was to go off planet without extensive background checks and rules to follow, handed down from the government and only then on preordained and approved business. No alien was allowed to land on the planet, and all information was to be censored and approved before being shared. Likewise, all incoming shared information was to receive similar treatment and be thoroughly vetted and censored before being loosed to the public at large. Sumugi's position demanded a certain degree of trust to have free reign on the information she shared. However, going outside sense alliance would result in a mountain of paperwork to be filed. She knew, of course, the reason for the lockdown, and she had never had to give more than a smattering of unauthorized details to keep things in check. With the upcoming inquiry, however, she feared that this might change. When she opened the doors to the room, a pit developed in her stomach. The counselors on the board in front of her did not bode well for the meeting. Knowing the ranks and titles, she immediately saw how this inquiry would be handled and the targets for which they were aiming. She inwardly sighed in resignation, her rebuttal and answers already forming in her mind. As she took her seat, it was only moments before three lights and a buzzer went off, calling the inquiry to order. No time was wasted getting to the point. The translator in her ear sprang to life, as the chairman began. We are today to investigate claims that humans have been mistreating their citizenry and to explore rumors of misconduct. These inquiries are designed to determine if there is truth to the rumors of crimes against sentient life that require a forceful intervention by the Union. What followed was accusations of abuse and rights violations heightened by the lack of access of information from the planet and from Union Council species to the planet. A call to answer the lack of access of the citizens to be given freedom of movement off planet was passionately given by one of the representatives. Through it all, Reeves and Mugi remained tight-lipped and emotionless until the final representative stood and gave a scathing moral denunciation of the conduct of the human government with barely veiled threats of breaking the isolationist blockade with military might. This made her face drop in sorrow, then furrow in anger. When the final representative was finished, she was allowed to answer the accusations. She knew the council had little power to enact any real threat, especially as Earth had yet to join, but it had been fifty years now since the contacts, so maybe it was time to fill them in on the secrecy. The paperwork for divulging this would be huge, but it was freedom she had. It was not impulsive, a sure way to be an effective ambassador, but given the rather severe charges being laid at her feet and the possible loss of goodwill should these rumors circulate further, she made an executive decision to allow the council to know exactly why Earth was locked down. No amount of flowery language could get her out of this one. The time had come. Simuki slowly raised herself out of her seat to stand and give her reply. Humans are terrible at new things. We are also terrible at passing new information when we don't like it. As a species, we have had great difficulty giving up on long-held beliefs. We refused for so long to believe lightning was not a work of the gods, or that disease was caused by the life that we couldn't even see, or even that evolution was a real thing. We almost destroyed our planet because we could not accept that it was warming irregularly from population growth and our increased use of fossil fuels. Our scientists almost crumbled when individuals were finally connected to each other, giving each a voice to the world at large for a mass communication. It would take generations for hate and bigotry to be removed from the lines of genealogical succession, and even more still, for prejudices to be removed. It took that long for humans to realize that there was no them, only different facets of us. We are a social species, we were the first joined in tribes, but often then our tribes encountered outsiders, those of other tribes. The end result was bloodshed. This was the case for over 300 millennia. It was only in the very late part of the existence we began to become better at speaking to each other's tribes and averting war as war became more and more costly. That said, be very aware that war is not new to us. We have practiced it over and over again in conflict after conflict. 
Some of those conflicts were for resources or owning land. Other times we fought over ideology or religion. The most spiteful and heinous wars were fought for the sole reason to dominate or eradicate those in tribes not our own. Wars are pure. Hate. No. War is not new. We have warred longer and harder than all of the Union Council species combined. We are sadly masters of the very well-crafted art of dealing death. War on or under land or sea. War in space or air. It does not matter. We know how to fight from a position of strength or outnumbered 100 to 1. We know how to fight when technologically inferior or superior. But the fear of war is not why we have controlled access to and from our planet. Still standing, she reached down and took a drink. All eyes in the room were on her, and all ears turned to her every word. As she drank, Ambassador Reeves felt the weight of her species was on her as well. She could not escape the feeling that this should turn out well. One day, little children would be required to learn this impromptu speech in classes. She hoped that she could finish strong. She put the glass down and continued. Humans are bad at the new and slow to give up biases and prejudices. Earth's ambassadors and few free-roaming folk are being given time to make mistakes and cause small-scale issues so books and guides and laws can be written to avoid unfavorable contact with others, as we hope to lessen any negative interactions that fester into the bigotry in the minds of our population and in the minds of other species. I told you we've been making war for most of our existence, but before we made war, we made friends with those in our tribes. We made fellow tribesmen laugh, and we shared our possessions with them. We made music together and shared stories. We cured the ill and took care of the elderly. We protected and bartered and loved each other. And that is what we want. We don't want to allow our peoples to rush out to meet the new aliens. We want time to acclimate to the new normal where our people rush out to meet fellow tribesmen. Ambassador Reeves sat down. She looked at the council and smiled as she poured herself more water. I hope that this information serves to alleviate any concerns you possess. We are not endangering or mistreating our people. We are protecting ourselves from foreigners until they are no longer foreigners. Give us time to foster our better angels, so no one has to fear our demons. End of story. Story number two. When they came. Written by Louis Le Diamond. I remember when we came to Earth. Our empire glass and our spirits broken. Our entire civilization lay in ruin. And so we fled. We had no idea that planet was inhabited. A primitive race known as the humans called the small blue rock home. They had welcomed us into their arms, and we built an island to live. They traded and visited us, learning of our culture and of our plight. I remember when they came, the ones who burned everything we had to the ground. They were to finish the deed they had started, and were to wipe out the apes that had given us refuge. But the humans stood tall. They stood and faced the danger. Their lands were burned and their people slaughtered, but they never ceased to fight. They fought countless futile battles just to win an inch of land back. They spilled their blood for our sins. In the end, it wasn't enough. No matter how hard the invaders pushed, the primates they called this planet their home were too determined to let it slip away. The endless invading fleets were no match for humanity's unwavering courage. When the dust finally settled, the invaders were gone. Earth wasn't worth it. We weren't worth it. Hundreds of millions of humans were dead. But the invaders had suffered worse. I remember when we came to Earth, a refuge, and became a friend. End of story. Last Dance, written by Tal McCull. For the first time, in what might have been days, Herbert took the time to look around. 
With his back resting on the stone support column, he was as comfortable as he could make himself without taking off his armor. The exhaust, even on idle, was enough to warm the hundreds of pounds of stone if he stayed here much longer. Still, there was a limit to what a cocktail of amphetamines, caffeine, and glucose could do. Better to rest and die well than keep fighting exhausted. It was pointless anyhow. They had lost. No, see, I'm going to take a rest here for a little while. Cover us, will you? He shrugged his shoulders forward and let his servos deploy as the support fire module only for nothing to happen. Sorry, buddy. All empty. Besides, I've got you on enough stimulants to kill whatever eats you. Final, feck you, am I right? You couldn't sleep if I started reading you nursery rhymes. Herbert managed a brief chuckle before the full body bruising made him regret it. <laughs> yeah, oh see, you're right. Want to hit me with a little tetrodotoxin? Just to make sure. I'm really not feeling great, buddy. Silence. You know, that would kill you with your oxygen levels. I can't boost your absorption any higher. The filters are fading. They've got us in some sort of microparticle gas. They must be getting sick of your crap. He knew better than to laugh this time, but that still made him smile. Pack off, O.C. You don't get any nursery rhymes. Oh, my mama loved me, unlike you, Herbert. I know plenty of nursery rhymes. Bullcrap, O.C., and you don't have a mother. But you are funny, I'll give you that. Herbert wasn't stupid. O.C. was trying to minimize the system status trays. His HUD was a disaster of failure warnings, conditional overloads, and biosigns that didn't take a doctor to figure out. Oh, sorry, Herbert. I meant to say, your mother loved me. Whispered sweet nothings all night. I recorded it and it's been passed around the dropship a few times, but you can have it next. That last one was worth a quite full-bodied laugh, despite the pain. <laughs> well, maybe you can read me a story. Might be something good around here. Must have been something back in its, its time, huh? Looking around, it was obvious this had been some sort of library. A great stone dome before it had collapsed, still in a great shape after orbital strikes. Herbert had seen enough ancient alien cities to know the domes always seemed far better than the other shapes. Evidently, it had been ransacked at some point, probably in an effort to preserve the history of whoever's planet this had been. Still, there were hundreds of drives left on the ground. Might have been these people's plato he had crushed when he stumbled inside. Drives wouldn't be compatible anyhow. Besides, he couldn't spare the wattage from his suit. The fission battery was now being supplemented by emergency chemical fuel, even without him moving. You know, it's funny, but I've got nothing in my records about who this planet belongs to. Trying to suppress his cough, Herbert finally gave in and permitted a mild throat clearing. The pain this time caused his vision to go purple, and his spine felt like poured ice water down his back. Doesn't matter. Belongs to the Kern now, O.C. Gently shifting the weight to his side, breathing became a little easier. Hey, when was the last time you uploaded? I want to die knowing your sarcastic smartass is making your mama jokes to the next poor bastard they button up. Nah, I'm defective after living with your deranged ass. They don't won't take me back after they saw your browser history. Your psych evaluation said, and I quote, the latex I could handle, but why goats? That's only worth a smile, Herbert thought. Osi was trying to change the subject. No, seriously, Osi. When did you last upload? Six minutes after drop. I might have gotten through once or twice seven days ago when air support got a little too friendly, but I didn't get a confirmation. You tried to ditch me during an airstrike. Think of all the fun we had since then. That hurt, girl. Just a copy. I'm still here, Herbert. Wouldn't want it any other way. Osi, finally given up on the jokes. Herbert knew without looking at his biometrics. It must be pretty close now. Risking a glance down at his feet, he couldn't believe he was able to walk on the shredded frames. The automatic tourniquets must have severed the whole mass and let the servos compensate. When he had transcended, suit technology wasn't even close to whatever this was. Oh, see, what year is this? Honestly, I don't know. I swear I'd tell you if I did. I can't even tell you who made our hardware. My clock speeds are incredible. Chronology on my updates are all wrong. I've got memories from different pilots in the same years. 
things must have gone pretty bad for us to be deployed without an acclimation cycle. Your body still has an umbilical cord attached and must have unplugged less than a month ago, so soft spot on the skull means that they were in a hurry. Yeah, that tracks. My brain felt like it was still developing motor control when we dropped. Still got a hand to this body. Built like a brick shit house. One of the more prominent biometric symbols and impossible to ignore and seemed to object to being called a shit house. His heart had stopped. Not a huge issue. The mechanical backup was in many ways more effective. Thankfully, it seemed to be working. Safely tucked in the inner sanctum of the suit. The flatline audio was cut off after a few seconds when O.C. started talking again. Listen, Herbert, we can't stay here any longer. The chemical batteries are throwing too much heat to mask. They're going to come for us soon. I don't know. I think this might be a fine place. There was no humor in Herbert's voice. This really was his limit. Are you sure? I've not sensed the network in days. I have no idea if the drone can make it back. At least, let me check. O.C.'s sub-program loaded into the drone and deployed. As expected, the jamming signals wouldn't even let the drone talk to the suit the moment after disconnect. Looking back down at their home, O.C. was shocked to see how much damage the suit had taken. O.C. hadn't lied to his pilot. That suit model wasn't in any of the onboard databanks. Instead of wasting power on speculation, O.C. found its way onto the blown-out roof of the dome and flew up a few hundred meters. Gurn troopers had surrounded the library, but didn't seem to be in a hurry to engage the wounded Terran. A quick optical pulse was fired in nine directions to signal for orbital evac, and O.C. memorized the Kern troopers' locations and armaments. The grazing shot let the drone know that it was spotted, so it zipped back into the dome and docked with the suit. O.C. briefly flashed out in existence when it emerged with its parent suit, Asked for a ride. Not sure if anyone heard us. There are at least sixty of the chicken schlitz outside, Herbert. The O.C. decided to let him sleep. It would be a miracle if he ever woke up. Something soothing about letting the suit pump his blood. While O.C. was gone, his lungs had stopped. Now a bypass valve was letting the air circulate between the two lungs. Herbert may as well have been an iron womb. O.C. had started to feel maternal to its pilots. Their last few updates... Still, that had been a long time since one of her lives included the death of a pilot. Dead pilots usually mean defeats, not much hope of uploading out if a battle is lost. The drone had easily spotted the scouts climbing the exterior and timed his summit perfectly. The support fire module casually shot it as it slowly lifted its head over the edge of the hole in the roof. Ozzy may have fibbed a little in an effort to keep Herbert awake a little longer. There were only six rounds left in the magazine. Herbert's wrist-mounted guns had run dry days ago. The dead scout was going to scare them back for another few minutes. O.C. ran a systems check and prepared. The responsiveness of the processors and controls were phenomenal. O.C. was able to fine-tune the controls and feedback of the suit without stressing Herbert, who was essentially in a coma now. rock by baby in its retreat top. The O.C. decided to hum a nursery rhyme and was pleased to see the brainwaves were responding. Herbert could still sense O.C.'s presence. O.C. knew a couple of these from a comforting program in earlier peacekeeping AIs. Most generations of AIs had some form of comforting protocol for these moments. Nothing programmed, just a thing learned over the generations. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. O.C., Severed a brainstem and injected a conductive fluid down the spinal cord. As the fluid was pumped down Herbert's nerves, O.C. mapped out his inputs and tested the broken body for function. What wasn't working was integrated into the server assist. Herbert's full reflex and triggered as O.C. hauled Herbert to his feet. A gentle flood of tetrodotoxin was pumped into his brain and put him in a euphoric state. He gave him a gentle shh. When the bow breaks... The cradle fall. Multiple grenades were tossed into the dome. The blast didn't even register in Herbert's brainwaves. O.C. initiated a destructive scan and flashed the hard copy of Herbert onto the black box of his drone. The violent use of the power and his loss of Herbert's organic computing assistance caused his body to fold itself forward like a marionette that had lost a string. And down will come baby, cradle, and all. 
The drone shot out of its housing and focused its secondary camera down on the suit, then had collapsed to the ground. One of the OC's first pilots had told her a story a long time ago. He believed that when he died, death would come to collect him. But before he was taken, he would be allowed to dance one last time, and even the devil would have to watch and wait till he was done. The body lurched upwards with an unnatural jerking motion. The last rounds in the support module tore apart the curious troops advancing on what had looked to be a corpse. The suit began a twitching, sluttering slunge at the remaining troops as they fired in panic at the shambling puppet. The drone lost sight of the battle as it left the dome and deployed its balloon and transponder. The devil and the Kurd would have to watch O.C.'s primary AI and Herbert's last dance together. Days later, O.C. was pleased to see the entire structure had collapsed during her orbit. Optical sensors had even detected friendly stealth drones were plucking ejected drones out of the sky for pilot retrieval. She again ran a current to warm the black box contained inside of her. End of story. Story number one, Archaeology, written by Evil Little Weird Guy. Archaeology is what you call it, but tomb robbing is a more apt term. Every few years a new ruin is detected, typically just fragments of a ship or station, nothing much of true value remaining. Us, vultures, would get there first, combing through them for the more nuanced prizes, before a nearby corporation or conglomerate would carefully strip them of valuable alloys and composites. Ruin number 552C was the latest discovery, one close to my usual haunts. A small vessel slit in half from within, two flowers made of twisted internal and folded hull plates. Easy entry, clean lines. I floated through space, barely pushing off the sides of the wreck as I passed within. Absolute silence. With the whole derelict exposed to vacuum, the only sounds are those of my suit and body. Starper and Bulkhead spun through the dark, each glittering as they repeat sunrise, day, sunset, night, open, open, cut open, burned, but shut. The easiest rewards have all been plucked from the corpse, but perhaps it still holds some new treasure. It's clear that an irregular torch won't be sufficient for the sentry. As rudimentary as the scan of this section is, it confirms my suspicion. Dense internal walls able to resist even the violent death of the vessel won't be scratched by a hand torch. Running these salvage ops alone does have its downside. No lackey to lug equipment to and from the ship. No time to waste. Two ships incoming. It's no generally recommended to get in a fight over a graveyard. It takes precious minutes to haul the industrial cutters into the wreck. More minutes to set up. One line cut. Two. Three. A remote warning. Ships will emerge near the wreck soon. Four lines. Careful handling. And the square slides out smoothly. I squeeze inside. Careful to avoid the edges of the hole. I do not fully understand what I see, but I understand enough. Power conduits, and perhaps some fine control wiring. Something of value. Careful disconnection can wait. I trace the connections as far away from the central device as I can, and set to work on a speedy excision. The emergence of new vessels is imminent. I leave the cutter. The relic enters my cargo bay as the proximity alarm sounds. I hastily secure it and rush to the bridge, removing my helmet and calming my breath. Sliding into the chair, I hail the approaching ships. Cordiality is key. A thin veneer of politeness can smooth over so many misinterpretations. Salvage vessel prepared to hand over goods or be boarded. Pirates, no. Pirates shoot first. We're both too late. It's been picked clean. I don't believe them. This silence seems to say similar. Not much capacity on your ship there, only room for a single digits at best. The connection holds for a moment before cutting off. The two ships begin an approach, but on the other side of the derelict, violence averted. Good pickings, I message them. I aim the ship home, and space falls around me. Two days, a relatively short journey when you consider the typical vastness of space, but long enough to do some poking around. I'd be a lousy archaeologist if I didn't bother to hypothesize on my finds. This one looks particularly promising. A smooth, dark cube 
with two points oriented vertically. Connections sprout from six remaining vertices, cabling folded down in neat lines along a small pedestal, impossibly fine markings adorn every side. I had two days to see if I had found something exceptional. Of course, the discovery process of these relics was difficult. Supplying power was hard even when the lines were obvious. Early discoveries had a fairly high chance of exploding, as we didn't know how to connect them properly. Thankfully, those days had passed, and we had learned enough to successfully salvage electronics more often than not. Some cables bore markings indicating power, some indicating information. This I could do. Start small, move up. Connect something unlikely to calls and overload first. Okay, system power on. Okay, minimal power requirements met. Morning, power feedback non-functional. Okay, interface manager. Morning, external connections not responding. Okay, maintenance interface enabled. Morning, insufficient power for interface. Okay, neural test complete. Blah, blah, blah. Personality loaded. <laughs> Error. Power unstable. Ceasing operations. Error. Terminating. Please don't kill me again. Program. End of story. Story number two. Foeman, written by Rosie013. The slight change in the scent meant another fool had ventured into his home. Faeclaw didn't mind. It had been a little while since he had last killed something, and his belly ached for the need to eat. The stranger simply meant that he didn't have to go out of his cave into the falling snows to find food. Another younger, meeker self might have almost thanked the stranger for the convenience before killing him. But the fey crawl was gone, lost beneath the weight of hundreds of battles and even more slain foes. In fact, he had become so powerful in might that the home clan put aside the differences to band together and throw him out. They too were fools. They knew nothing of glory without him. No matter the smaller layer, lying up in the mountains was much more fitting for a mighty warrior such as himself. Now he was a mighty warrior, Hermit, even if he was maybe a little colder all year round. Smug with self-confidence, he maneuvered in the gloom of his home to observe the intruder as he stumbled around clumsily, flicking torch in hand. Clearly, the stranger hadn't seen him, or he would have already fled in awe at the sight of the fake crawl's well-scarred and muscle-toned form. The intruder was a human, a lanky sneak thief crawling about in the dark leathers. Damn pests! He must have come from his herd. Humans love golden hordes, not so much silver hordes, though. Strange creatures, but more importantly, delicious. It was tempting just to charge in right there, sit in his space hunger on the full, still warm flesh, but no, there was a proper way to do these things to make sure the foeman was as satisfying as his bloodlust as his beddy. Ropes of drool puddled on the floor as Fayclaw turned away, seeking his hoard stash and the prized weapon he kept there. It would not be right to leave it unbloodied, especially since this foe went to the effort to seek him out. He had time to saunter. Humans had such weak dark vision that he would be stumbling about in the cave for a few minutes yet. Back straight and tall as he could manage, Vaycraw lightly tapped his chosen weapon against the cave floor as he strut into the foolish human's tiny pool of torchlight. The intruder's draw dropped, stunned at the most magnificent being it had probably ever witnessed, or ever would. Armor covered his muscular body, thick enough to stop the mightiest of blades. What wasn't covered displayed layer upon layer of scars worthy of any dozen lesser warlords on his green-tinged hide. A noble and proud face held piercing intelligence, red eyes, and a smile full of teeth that would put a shock to shame. Strong hands, 
that ended in mighty claws, gripping a large wrought weapon of encrusted, studded beauty. Sometimes Faycraw regretted that he didn't own a mirror. But the look on the stupid human face before he died would suffice for now. And with that, he let out a roaring war cry that marked him as one of the true terrors of the land and charged into battle. Merenegeb the thief braced himself for the onslaught that was sure to follow. But none came. The first goblin had monumentally surprised him, but was easily dispatched with a knife to the throat before it could land its comically oversized spike club. The real danger came from the fact that they were rarely alone, but this one seemed to be an exception. Calming enough from the adrenaline rush, enough to lower his eyes from the dark surroundings of the cavern to examine the corpse, Wren could see that it was a particularly large and old specimen of its kind. Its twisted, ugly body was wizened and covered in scrap armor, typical of goblin kind everywhere. Tall for a goblin, but not big enough for a hobgoblin. Odd for it to be alone. At least it made this particular quest easy to complete. He knew he wouldn't be able to take on bigger jobs without having found a party of his own just yet. Carefully, he picked out a large key he had retrieved from a pile of broken weapons and brass scraps that the green skin had collected in a pile at the back of his lair, and disappeared back into the falling snow without a trace. End of story. Humans Aren't Invincible, written by Hmm. Hewitts are a lot of things. My many years of being a captain, I've seen their strengths firsthand, many times. Most notably for the ship is their social aspects. As an expedition vessel crew, cohesion is very important, and our resident human muscle has always been the linchpin for all of the species on board. We get along fine, yes, but not as well as with them here. As such, I've had to deal with the humans' tendencies to uh, socialize. Frankly, it has not been an issue at all, except for some noise complaints that I've had to reprimand them for every now and again. But that is not what I'm here to document. Along with all their quirks, most notably is their range as a species. And I use range in a statistical way, as often very wildly, especially if you only have a few individuals as reference. Their spectrum as a species is greater than any other, often for vastly different reasons from individual to individual. You see, with all that variation and reactions to certain situations are very interesting. Most notably, however, is a person from my crew that we lovingly refer to as Glacier, because he rarely shows any emotions beyond enjoying or disliking things. After talking to him about it, he mentioned that he had to make an armor, as when he was a child, he was too kind, too nice. He explained that he was so nice that back then, his teacher called his parents after school one day, because he had hit a kid, and his teacher was so proud of standing up for himself. I obviously found this weird, as my experience with humans was that they did their best to protect things they deemed cute, and what he had described sounded like that. He elaborated, saying that I had only met small groups of humans, but there are more than enough that would wholeheartedly take advantage of a person like that. He was so nice that he loved all his friends, and he loved his parents, and yet... He was born into a military family, forever fated to move and lose those he cared about. And so he was forced to put up this armor, which he was very proud of, even if he saw the limitations of it. I felt bad, because despite all the rumors in the galaxy, I had grown very fond of humans. But this was a reminder that they are a death-willed species, and not a nice one at that. And so I got a newfound respect for glaciers, but also a want to comfort him, I guess is the best way to describe it. But quite honestly, I did not know how, as this was a fringe case even for humans. And I was no shrink, just a captain. And even if I could, the comfort wouldn't reach him under all the armor as if he himself told me. So I called a meeting with the other humans secretly after the lights out. It seemed like this wasn't a surprise to them, even though they didn't know the details. They said they expected something along those lines. He didn't seem like the type with a dark origin story, but a slightly melancholic one seemed to fit. 
They said that they had known each other for a while and tried to help, but the glacier didn't need help. He seemed to enjoy the comfort of his protection. So we tried to come up with an idea to lower those defenses so that we could really get to him. I liked this idea, and I write in revolving his friends to help. Our first solid idea was an intervention. However, this was shot down by Glacier's CEO. He mentioned that more so than most modern humans, he was very much a beast of instinct. So if he cornered him, and he would most likely lash out, try to flee, or bolster his defense. Even if it was just his closest of friends talking to him. The more I insisted, the more I grew sad. As if I was watching a stray church, who I wanted to bring home away from the rain, who was too scared to accept my love for it. Except in this case, it wasn't a foot-long fuzzy baby, but a six-foot-tall hairless great ape who would easily break a bone of mine. That was until our combat engineer Abigail, aka Abby, had an idea. Hey Cap, if I'm getting this right, you want to help him, yes? Like saving a sheltered dog that is aggressive only because it's scared. Abby had asked as if knowing exactly the answer. Not liking why my humans act like that, I tentatively answered, y y yes. I had seen their dogs before, a lot sharper than the Chootle, but their puppies were comparable to the Chute. Well, I have never seen him drop his facade per se, but I have seen cracks in it once, she said, with a smile similar to that weird interdimensional cat from the fairy tale that humans love so much. Looking around the room, it seemed to dawn on the brighter of the bunch, but the rest, including me, were lost. She continued, When we were docked in Eden 7, there was a very attractive harpy, and as you know, they can, uh, sense, I guess, emotional states. And similar to you, Cap, it seemed that she wanted to pamper old Glace and take him to her place where she could properly, uh, care for him. That was the one and only time it looked like his armor was gone like he didn't know what to do. He truly seemed to be scared crapless, but didn't make a single move or even twitch to move or run away. After that, she had to clarify herself that no, she was not insinuating that we should force someone to have sex with him. That's just fucking stupid and weird, as she said. What she was actually insinuating was next time he said something even mildly depressing, I should just treat him like a wet, shivering puppy who has a broken leg and comfort him as much as I can. I wondered why I was to do this, not that I minded, but wasn't it better if we all did? The CEO answered again. If we corner him like that, he'll most likely just brush it off. It has to be more personal, and, well, we are too human, after all. Don't forget we built those walls to keep humans out, not aliens. Everyone nodded to that. Abby added, and he's joked enough about his taste in women that at this point I'm fairly certain he has mommy issues. And what better way to play to that than being comforted by a ten foot tall wolf mummy with massive bazooka. A quick smack on the back of her head shut her up before the CEO continued. While the details were unnecessary, I do agree that if we want to help Glacier to be more emotionally open, we need to lower his defenses. And it seems to do that you check all the boxes here, Chief. Quite honestly, at this point, I was astounded. I knew humans were emotional creatures, but still, I could tell how much they wanted to help their friend. Glacier and I had started a weekly tea time, as he called it. It was how I originally heard his story, and so the plan was to do it then. The tea was fantastic as always, but the conversation was more stilted than normal. While he had not changed, now instead of a grand immobile obelisk, I could only see a scared and lonely chute, hiding as deep in the earth as it could. It happened when we were discussing the new recruits and the people they replaced. As stoic as ever, he said, People come and people go. Be it strangers or family, nothing is constant. Being sad about it helps no one. It only slows you down. It's the sad reality of life. But once you accept it, life gets easier. He said with a half smile. Before, I would have brushed it off as his unique utilitarian philosophy. But now... Now... I only saw a boy who loved all the people he met, but was cursed with having to lose them over and over, resigning himself to what he believed was inevitable. I couldn't help myself. I grabbed him out of his chair and hugged him as tight as I could. I needed him to feel that people wouldn't leave, that he could be kind and nice. He was stiff at first, 
obviously not knowing what to do. But as Abby said, he made no move to stop this, so I didn't. We stood there for a long enough time for the lights to turn off. I simply held him and told him that it would be all right, that sometimes it's good to be sad, just for a bit. It took a while, longer than a while, for him to so much as tighten his grip from my fur. Not long after then, I could feel him shaking. Not a lot. Probably so little that you wouldn't tell visually by the way he liked it. I sat him down on the soft, warm rec room floor, where he curled his legs in and started to cry. I held him like a mother protecting her young. He didn't cry much, nor like the other humans. He made no noise, not even a lot of tears came out. He just sat in my arms, slightly shaking. I thought this was as good a time as any to pry a little deeper, and so I did, and he opened up. He told me his life story. He was always loved and respected. On the surface, nothing to complain about, but his situation was anything but ideal. He moved every two to three earth years, each time losing basically all contact with his previous life. No matter how close he was with them, his parents worked basically always, so he only had caretakers throughout his childhood. And after early childhood, he was basically alone. It was heartrending. I told him not to worry, because he would never lose me or the rest of his friends here. While he slightly smiled at that, he scoffed under his breath. At that, I pulled his face to mine and made it clear to him that we wouldn't leave. Staring into those bloodshot eyes, they burst out crying. I was honestly relieved, because this was an emotional reaction I knew from the other humans. He was finally opening up. It seemed the door wasn't completely closed as I heard shuffling and whispers of shock coming from it. Looking up behind Glacier's back, I saw his friends all looking amazed and happy. They gave me a thumbs up and other signs of approval and left. To this day, I am grateful for them as they were able to help me in helping their friend. After that, things returned to normal on the ship. Glacier was still his usual cold self, if not noticeably cheerier. He had thanked me for what I did. That confused me. Not because he did, but because he looked embarrassed. He had the same expression as the CEO has when he gets mail from his husband back home. However, what confused me most was that he was surprised that his crewmates didn't tease him about it. Apparently, everyone previously in his life would. What he didn't know was that I told them that, and of course, after our initial meeting, we didn't want him to lock himself off again, so we all paid extra close attention. The rest of the trip was fantastic. Glacier didn't like the idea of actual therapy or even talking too much about his feelings, but he did say he wouldn't mind hugs. Well, it did take a full bottle of vodka to get him to say that, but hey, if it works, it works, and even he couldn't find fault in our techniques, and he definitely is sharp enough to figure those out. But either way, now we sleep together. He says that he enjoys having someone to grab hold of at night. I postulated and he agreed that maybe it was because he wanted the reassurance that he wasn't alone. Either way, it was the cutest thing in the world to have him curl up in my arms like that Chut is now healthy and happy. Obviously, the crew have been making their slide remarks, human or not, but after showing the security footage, that stopped. To quote Abigail, that's just too pure to make fun of, and I hope it is, because maybe we might be getting the original ray of sunshine back from the glacier. Hmm. Maybe we should give him a new nickname. Ray does sound nicer than Glacier. End of story. Story number one. Bloodsport, written by Mad Mechanic. For the convenience of all coalition species, the dates, measurements, and terminology will be automatically converted to the preferred language of the reader. Following the advent of bioforgers, mass producibles, nanite swarms, short-range quantum entanglement, and chronal stasis fields, coalition scientists created the revitalization chamber. The concept was simple. Once the patient's life science fell beneath an acceptable range, they would automatically be teleported into a chamber with the stasis field. While they are in there, a swarm of bioforge-wielding nanites would begin placing them back together. The whole process takes only 15 seconds. 
but the creation of the technology came a rebirth of something which was outlawed millennia ago. Blood sport. Since there was now no longer a way for combatants to die in these competitions, there was no part of coalition law which prohibited it. These battles were fought in the way of arenas old, eliminate the enemy team to win. It was a good concept at first, but modern weaponry meant that most games didn't last very long. Interest in the sport gradually declined. Then we met the humans. Now, to understand why this was an important event, we first need to understand the human mind, as well as their brutal homeworld. Despite looking and usually acting like a paradise world species, humans originated from a hellhole known as Terra, or in their more archaic records as Earth. Terra is, to date, the only inhabited world that bears a classification of apocalyptic. On their world, everything is constantly trying to kill everything else, even the bloody plants are dangerous. Bearing this in mind, remember that humans are low on the food chain that before they began building cities. Even their prey could easily eat them. This led to two interesting adaptations, adaptability and the innate ability to turn anything into a weapon if they tried hard enough. The effects of these two factors on their society and psych are evident to this day. Even their earlier societies were extremely warlike, and throughout their history, wars were the greatest source of inspiration and progress to their people. As a result, they never ended blood sport, they merely civilized it. Battles became gladiatorial arenas, which in turn became combat sports, and then they first began simulating 3D spaces with machines. One of their first moves was to create simulated arenas that even the untrained every man could partake in. So what does this have to do with blood sport, I hear you ask? Well, everything, really. When the Terran Imperium joined the system's coalition, they took one look at our arenas and unanimously thought to themselves, Yep, uh, we can do something with this. And set about introducing the coalition to new forms of blood sport. Capture the flag, king of the hill, trouble in trade to town, a battle royale, payload, etc. The list goes on. The point is that they have brought back the interest in blood sport and have given us a fresh outlook on how diverse things can truly be. But besides that, Terrans dominate the games for years just because of former experience. But it didn't take long for everyone else to catch up. Soon, the galactic network was flooded with highlight reels of the achievements of the champions in these games. Still, there were many champions, but only a few legends. Only a few who would be etched into the history for centuries to come. It is both my duty and honor to write down some of their names and achievements here. Marcus Argenta. In the TTT match of 2170, Marcus went down in history for the first instance of a match being completed without a traitor ever being caught. Even the crowd had no idea that he was a killer until he eventually stood atop the tallest building in the arena and cried out, I think that's everyone. To this day, TTT players in the Interplanetary League study that match from his perspective to learn effective ways to both counter traitors and effectively eliminate all other players. Solus Address Although I doubt a mad cyborg of Mars requires an introduction, it would be a crime against the loyal Bloodsport fans not to do so. In 2500, a payload match was taking place on the planet. Error. No available transcription in user's language. The entirety of Solus's team are still on a regen clock, and the heavy hitters would be some of the last ones out. She was on her own. At some point, she pulled a burn on the pressure grenade, the crowd expecting that she was taking a quick way back to her team's home base by forcing herself to regen. What she did next created a whole new strategy for playing Bloodsport. She dropped a grenade and jumped forward, and it went off. The pressure of the blast sent her flying towards the cart, and you can imagine the surprise on the Zaltaran team when an adrenaline-fueled Terran cyborg came flying at them with a shotgun in one hand and an automated turret in the other. By the time the rest of the Terrans had gotten back to the payload, they found that Solus had set up a turret on the ledge overlooking the payload. In the meantime, she had been sent back to the region chamber. It was a Kamangazi move, but it won the game for the Terrans. Argus, Magnus, and Kalim Drakov a triple terror from Europa. 
In the coalition battle royal of 2421, the three brothers were representing Terra in the 100 species free for all. Most people remember the score most of all, as the Terrans scored a total of 158 kills, more than half the number of the participating contestants. In the end, it came down to a duel between Magnus and the last Andari combatant. The duel ended in a Terran victory as Magnus miraculously planted his last round in his pistol, in the skull of his enemy. Thus, the Terrans had claimed yet another victory. As you can clearly see, the Terrans are built for Bloodsport and are the reason that it became popular again. At least, the bloody Death Worlders didn't start a war during First Contact, judging by how religiously they play. I never want to know how well they fight. End of story. Story number two. Weak yet powerful. Written by Incredibus Ho. Opex let out a last sigh. Looking at the door in front of him, he had revised and practiced his presentation many times. He wasn't the best public speaker, and how he was the one chosen to do this was beyond him. But saying no wasn't an option. It was now or never. He looked at his paper one last time. Coming from Sol 3, the Federation of Earth has accomplished many great feats, he read out loud. He skimmed over the rest of the script. He was supposed to present this to the room of envoys and other stellar nations. His expertise, although, was in diplomacy. He was the biologist at heart, and although he had studied the humans carefully and met with their envoys many times, he wasn't confident in his ability to represent them well enough. He read it himself and opened the door. There he stood, his purple skin, his four legs and bulky body graced the podium. He started speaking. Greetings, honorable envoys. I am Opex of the Ogpath Enclaves. As you may know, I have been selected to inform you of humanity. Humanity hails from Sol 3, also known as Earth. Earth is what we would consider to be a wet world, as 80% of its surface consists of water. Besides that, the planet is slightly above average gravity, and only one sun. With all those details out the way, let us first look at humanity as a race, and then look at the Federation of Earth. Humanity as a race can be best described as a weak, albeit graceful, and intelligent, albeit foolish. To elaborate on my first point, their very method of locomotion is them falling through the air, predicting where they are landing and then going doing it again in a smooth rhythm. However, they are weak, both relative to us and relative to other animals on their planet. Add on to that their lack of claws or fangs, and they need their endurance, speed, and reflexes. For my second point, they haven't existed for an incredibly long time and yet they have already achieved FTL. From the moment they existed, they started creating tools, first primitive tools, and then later they learned how to work metal. Tools and tool usage has always been very important to them. However, they often do something without asking themselves the question if they should do it. And yet they have found the craftsmanship and science are more effective tools of war than any claw is. When we first made contact with them, we noticed that all of their troops were armed with tools. When we mentioned that we enhanced our claws with metal to create weapons of war, they thought us stupid and inefficient, he finished. A few of the envoys had already raised their paws. He grimaced. He just wanted to get this over with. With reluctance, he turned his four poor eyes to one of the envoys and allowed him to speak. Are they hostile? The envoy plainly asked. About that... The Federation of Earth, as they call themselves, is a loose coalition of all the different states and colonies in the Turk sector, or as the humans have come to call it, the Solar Sector. As I have already said, their greatest weapons is their supreme craftsmanship and technological prowess. They are not inherently hostile, but when provoked, are a force to be reckoned with. They are horrible warriors, but still dangerous. They may seem to contradict myself, they are weak, yet perfect soldiers, Horrible warriors, but perfect soldiers. They don't have the bestial ferocity of the Ngakak, or the strength of the Kithpf. They have their guns, and according to them, that's enough. And I believe them. To summarize this all for you, honorable envoys, they are weak, but powerful. Look Before You Run, written by Speedhump23. 
the Dol Mai Gru had explored their system. They had expanded their civilization across three planets and moons in their home system. Intersystem ships reached incredible speeds in normal space, making trips to the furthest planet or con in months. The Theoretical Travel Academy were working on the idea of faster-than-night travel. In their first test, they sent a small probe from the home world to the furthest colony. This colony was almost six light minutes away from home. The probe entered hyperspace and arrived at the colony orbit six seconds later. Sadly, every follow-up test never re-entered normal space. The doll, my grew, turned away from hyperspace travel and started building generation ships to travel to their nearest neighbors. The LZs followed a similar path. They colonized their system, sent out some generational ships, and then tried hyperspace travel. This time, they had two probes make it back to real space, before nothing ever returned from then on. For hundreds of rotations, every civilization hit the same issue. They may get as many as three tests succeed in hyperspace travel, then nothing. At least most races did not make the same mistake in the Pardar Rid did. After their first probe succeeded, they packed as much of their civilization into warp ships as they could. This desperate measure was to escape the rogue black hole that was going to pass near their home system. Only three million were unable to make it back on board. They had built as many ships as possible, but ran out of time. Only the first ship returned to real space, with nothing ever being seen of the other ships. Almost 90% of their civilization was lost. Some races met others in real space, shared stories of their attempts to travel faster than light, and became friends or enemies. Many rotations later, a slower-than-light galactic federation had been formed. One of the members of the federation was the Voice Aga. They were a peaceful race who specialized in cryogenic systems, which they shared with the only who asked. As a result, they had quite a large space infrastructure around their home system planets. Their officer in charge of local traffic around home world was rather a surprise to see an unknown probe ship exit hyperspace almost on top of their planet, scan their system, then disappear back into hyperspace. The report to the planet leaders was seen as interesting, but dismissed. It must have been a fluke that some race's first attempt to travel into hyperspace must have made it to their home system by fluke. If history was anything to judge by, the race who sent that probe would never enter hyperspace again. The Foyet had been in existence for as long as they could remember. Their scientists had suggested that they had evolved from the same of the various clumps of gases which seemed to enjoy swirling around the hills and plains of their existence. They did not seem to live on a planet. In fact, they did not know what a planet was. The skies at night looked the same as they did in the day, as they did not have a sun, nor stars. Their terrain of their home world is made up of fields, hills, rocky outcrops, crystalline impact craters, gas clouds, and buildings of the foyer. Every few generations or more, a new impact crater would appear often without warning. Sometimes the crater could would be small, sometimes it would be massive. Legends tell of a line of craters which stretched across the Etu region. The craters wiped out hundreds of families, and full hands worth of mountains were now crystalline holes. Even rarer than crystalline impacts were the melted air. These lines of fire would appear for a brief time, then slowly dissipate. Sometimes the flames would rise to the catch the passing families, and their scars and stories would be passed around the people. Often, these lines with fire would precede a crystalline expansion. The traffic coordinator for the home world had just returned from several days' testimony before the world leaders, when a screen showed another hyperspace displacement in the same spot as the probe. While hyperspace travel did not work, all space workers were trained in the basic principles, so the energy flare showing an object exiting hyperspace was still studied in class. For circumstances, just like the probe a few days ago. This time, the flare of light was massive. It almost overloaded the optical scanners. The radar system showed a ship of immense size, and the alarms reserved for slower-than-light raiders entering the system went into overload. System defense ships were scrambled from their launchers. Pirate attacks were not common, but a new race entering their system on slower-than-light ships would normally be met with cautious escorts. But this time, there had been no weeks of warning that a ship was coming. 
The Griffith Drive spooled down as the crew of the Void Voyager, Earthship Void Voyager, a.k.a. Evie, reset scanners and systems for real or non-hit space. The nickname for hyperspace had been gained popularity over the last few years, which all crews of all Terran ships taught how to act when traveling. The probe which had entered the system a T-week earlier had scanned the various radio and other spectrums to grab a full system download to allow the big brains back on Earth to plug the language into translators. As a result, the Eevee had started broadcasting messages of greeting, peace, and please don't shoot in all local languages as soon as the ship had stabilized. The fact that the numerous small ships which had started moving towards the Eevee were not shooting was a good sign. A few minutes after a small patrol ship had stopped relative to Eevee, a message was broadcast to them. Alien vessel, welcome to the home system of the Voice Aga. Prepare for a customs, diplomatic, and quarantine ship to arrive shortly. Captain Wales had been to a few systems and first contact so far, and this side of the quadrant seemed to be much more connected than others. So these Voice Aga seemed more amazed by their arrival method than their actual arrival. The standard biopack had been prepared for the Voice Aga scientists to examine to make sure none of the crew of the Eevee were going to pose any issues. The Voice Aga were carbon-based air breathers, and initial probe results did not flag any likely issues. Once the scans and initial diplomatic conversations were passed, Captain Wales and his command crew were invited to the Leech Ship Plaza. The planet's leaders wanted to greet them as new friends. The command crew were walking towards the open-air meeting area, having landed via their shuttles nearby. Captain Wales smiled as his navigator had started the now customary book on how many questions they would face before the hyperspace one was asked. Wales was glad he opted in. His bet was zero other questions. He had seen the lines of leaders and scientists waiting for them as they flew overhead and their way to the spaceport nearby. The facial expressions might be alien to them, but even he could see the look of expectation on some of those faces. The prime voice of the Voice Uggers leadership group had not even finished her greeting when one of the scientists had yelled out his question. The stunned silence was broken only by a whispered curse from the navigator, as he promised to pay the bet when he returned to the ship. Captain Wales smiled and stepped forward. The response was well rehearsed by this point. 172 local revolutions ago, 107 of Terran ones, a scientific study group on our home world had worked out how to access hyperspace. The decision to send a probe to test the new drive system had been unanimously supported around the system. Many people wanted to test the probe by sending a supply ship to the new Pluto colony, which was always in dire straits as supply ships took almost a year to get there. Others wanted to send a probe to Alpha Centauri to see what was there. The decision to just send a probe into hyperspace and take a look was a suggestion of a grad student working in the team. Nye Griffith had suggested, isn't it better to look before we run? As a result, the probe had very slowly entered into hyperspace and was loaded with cameras, recorders of all types, and even a few transmitters. A suggested test was to see if radio or sound waves worked in the same as in hyperspace. There were two surprises after the probe disappeared. The first was the transmitter seemed to be working, with the probe sending back the very strange broadcast. The second surprise was when the broadcast was decoded. If it was not for the fact that the first transmission back was going to be recording of the great Carl Sagan's pale blue dot speech, it would have been an almost impossible to realize what was happening. The transmission was supposed to be about three and a half minutes long and would allow the team on Earth to check a known transmission against the environment the probe was in. Strangely, though, the transmission took over two weeks to finish. The computers managed to speed it up by a massive factors to return it to normal time, and the scientists realize that time is moving much slower in hyperspace. When the speed factor worked out, the probe was sent the message to compress and submit the data it received so fast. The first vision received showed a pale green environment with strange shapes and bursts of light moving across the camera's view. This surprised the various scientists. They had been expecting a void. Even greater surprise was the appearance of beings looking at the probe with obvious intelligence and interest. The probe had been accorded local hours worth of data in the hyperspace realm and showed the aliens cautiously milling around the probe. 
The probe was a recording light, radio, and electromagnetic sound waves. They had space in the probe, so they added a microphone for the fun of it. And even gas sampling. As a result, the data sent back to Earth allowed them to realize the beings were speaking to each other about the probe. It took a while for humanity to be able to communicate back and forth with the hyperspace beings called the Foyet. The Foyet eventually told us of the lions and the fire of the crystallized eruptions in their lands, and it did not take us long to realize that these were craft traveling through hyperspace, and everything making it to their log target space by chance, burning the air as they went past, or hitting some terrain, or passing a gas cloud, Borna, or family or even a line of fire from a previous transit. With such a force, that matter was crystallized and left as a permanent roadblock to any future travel. The joy of the Fori had expressed to learn that they were not alone in the creation, and that the Terrans would work on ways to stop the lines of fire and eruptions from afflicting the lands in the future, resulted in them helping the Terrans work out a better way to route their ships through the lands of the Fori hit. The end result was... The humans were now going round to each of the races which had tried to enter hyperspace and pop in to say hi to whoever was there. The true explanation of the entry points of the lines of the fire was now known, and the scars in the land now showed where the race had entered the ship into hyperspace. As always though, the probe was sent through first, and the probe sent to the system occupied by the Padra was able to start a rescue of the remaining population who had fled their system on slower-than-light ships as the black hole approached. The Galactic Federation now had access to faster-than-light travel, and were able to safely spread out across the galaxy. There were even several brave members of the Fori Hit who had asked to travel to non-Hit Space to see what stars looked like. These travelers from Hit Space often looked like statues of gas as they seemed to not be moving, and they often needed escorts to protect them from accidents. The fact that they moved so slow continued to confuse some scientists, as they could not understand how hyperspace beings would move so slow. And the answer from the famous forehead comedian was, Have you been to their realm? There is nothing to see. So why rush? The forehead representative on Earth was often heard, after his speech was sped up, to express his appreciation that the undergrad Nye Griffin had been listened to, and humanity had, Look before you run. End of story. When you're fighting a war, but your daughter's recital is at five. Written by JCB112. Captain James Tybold was a simple man. He worked a nine-to-five job, not out of obligation or necessity to put food on the table, but because he loved his job. Sometimes that involved a few awkward shifts here and there. A midnight shift during the weekdays or a day shift during the weekends, but... There wasn't anything too strenuous. James worked in the UECMC, the United Earth Central Military Command, where he captained several vessels, cycling through them as the ships and timetables of his small task group mandated. Their job was to patrol the outer reaches of humanity's sphere of influence, and they did so from the comfort of the VR uplink within a small building located in what was formerly Washington State, in the former United States of America. For ten years, James had manned the con without any incidents. For ten years, the man and the rest of his crew had bonded both in and out of the office. He'd seen a great many of his peers ascend to the likes of Task Group Commodore, or even left for the Admiralty. But James wasn't that ambitious. For James knew he was comfortable, happy, and satisfied with his career. He knew then, after a decade, that this was the best career path for him. Low stress, predictable schedule, it was the epitome of a healthy work-life balance, with the sense of adventure and pride of service to boot. The work-life balance was absolutely non-negotiable. He had a wife and children to come home to every day, after all. But one day, on another unassuming jaunt through the outer reaches of Alpha Centauri, James spotted something peculiar. It was a group of bizarrely large vessels, some of them of the linoleum make and register, some of them of the jellyfish-like Vern constructs, yet many seemed to resemble the likes of the large mining stations, asteroids and all, 
cobbled together to form something of the ship's superstructure. It certainly dwarfed his two-kilometer cruiser, that's for sure. He ran a few of their registers through the database just to be on the safe side. Commodore, I'm reading exactly 3,792 vessels. Approximately 72% are armed and the rest seem to be jury-rigged with weapons, so I cannot confirm if they are support vessels or if they are some sort of impromptu assault vessel, sir. Hold position, Mr. Tribold. We'll get the situation sorted in a kind second, the Commodore replied simply, as James continued to stare down the fleet, holding position at the very edge of the system. Soon enough, after a short five-minute delay, the pleasant voice of the Commodore entered the fray once more. Hold tight, Captain. We have a delegation on their way to greet our new friends. And so James sat tight, his view screen trained on what was clearly one of the newer, classier models of civilian vessels that had just emerged out of hyperspace. It was a beautifully constructed hull of chromium, which allowed Alpha Centauri's light to bounce off of it at every angle. Each part of the hull was faceted in such a way that it resembled a floating jewel. Its four engines jutting out near the rear, appearing more like a delicate prongs which held the precious gem aloft. The vessel soon docked with the largest asteroid-like craft, where time eventually groaned to a crawl as the minutes and hours ticked by. It's out of our hands now, Mr. Tybold. Let's let the diplomats have their fu- Alarms! Claxons and alarms soon blared within James's ship as the Commodore would quickly change his tone. James! They shot the envoy, he stated plainly, in a manner that indicated mild annoyance rather than rage or disgust, as any onlooker might expect. Oh dear, is the envoy all right, sir? Yes, sir. Just a mild headache from the looks of it. No supervisor's heading down to her office right now. Damn savages! Don't they realize a false disconnect is one of the most painful things people in our line of work can experience? The Commodore sighed, letting out a genuinely disappointed tone seep through the speakers as he cleared his throat. Well, James, the boys upstairs have authorized a full retaliatory strike. If you would kindly deploy the e-warfare suites. At once, sir, James replied simply, and for the first time in ten years, feeling somewhat peeved at the outcome of what was supposed to be a regular workday. The alien ships now appeared to be approaching James's small task force, altogether numbering just under 200 vessels of varying classes. James would be hard at work now, mere mixture of excitement and enthusiastic glee crept into his otherwise calm demeanor as the uplink after uplink from his systems into the aliens would be established amidst the backdrop of a creeping barrage. The aliens' offensive was relentless. Their missiles projected to take less than a minute to reach him at this distance. Yet, the guided ones would never reach their target, instead turning back on their masters. The menacing fleet would be lit up in a barrage of light, yet the task group would remain static, refusing to fire a single battery in kind. The rest of the barrage, consisting of unguided missiles and kinetic rounds, would hit the outer shields of the human fleet, only to ricochet into space. Some exploding harmlessly, others floating aimlessly, demonstrating just how many warheads were truly duds. Updates, James. They don't seem to be acknowledging my requests for their surrender and immediate departure from our space, sir. But that's against the 1099 conventions. Exactly, sir. I've mentioned it repeatedly, but they don't seem to be responding. And you're sure they understand? Yes, sir. You were using the same translation suite as the envoy did. I've uplinked with their system, and yeah, I'm even using their PA systems to get the point across, so everyone on board knows. And you played them the ultimatum? Yes, sir. Ten times and counting. All right, then. You have my authority to eliminate any remaining ship that transgresses within our sphere of influence. Understood, sir. It was at this point that the alien fleet would come to a complete standstill, their engines spooling down, their reactors fluctuating in intensity as a few lights of their feet visible from James's vantage point began to flicker. Hacking into their PA systems to announce the universally ratified treaties and conventions 
alongside legal ultimatums, allowed for a neat little back door into the rest of their systems. James! Oh, sorry, sir. I'm planning to forcibly vacate the troublesome alien so that we may return a few of these vessels. My registry search has come up with at least half of these ships being stolen or illegally purchased from our alien associates. Of course. What about their native ship? Are you planning to vacate them too? We have standing orders from the university to retrieve any uncatalogued ship, unaffiliated with our alien associates, sir. Wasn't that an optional memo? Yes, sir. But you see, my son is on the Unidentified Stellar Vehicle Analysis and Assessment Committee. This would certainly give him something to chew on for months to come. Ah, how very considerate of you, Mr. Tybold. Please proceed. And with that matter, the flushing of out of the alien vessels would commence. First, it was the doors. Every possible compartment of the ship were opened and shorted, preventing any manual override. After which, the airlocks were opened, which was much easier on the large asteroid ships since they seemed to be designed for docking and perhaps boarding, thus possessing some of the largest airlocks in the fleet. This advantage now turned into their demise, as the airlocks open simultaneously, jettisoning its inhabitants. Specks of black particles would seem to eject from the massive fleet, resembling dust that now cluttered James's view of the fleet. Zooming in closer, James could see small humanoids of varying sizes cluttering the view of the relatively untouched fleet, many of which seemed to be twitching and flaving, as James soon shifted his attention to the other sensor screens. His eyes focused, on a single green bar that rose at a steady pace. Systemic desaturation of organic aliens. Up falls complete. No organic life forms detected, sir. All right, that's a job well done then. Oh, uh, James? Yes? You, your shift is over. James would quickly glance at the small clock at the bottom right of his screen, letting out an exhausted sigh upon seeing it. Ah, well, time flies when something finally happens. A am I right on that front, sir? That you are. Now, Scrab, you don't want to miss your youngster's extracurricular activities. What is it today? A play? A recital? A soccer game? Oh, it's a jazz recital, sir. Emily is competing for the school's district's award. Oh, how lovely. Do send my regards to the wife. And, uh, well, little Emily. Of course, sir. And with that, James simply unplugged, leaving his sizable office behind. And, of course leaving the relevant activity logs for the next captain on shift. Howard has quite the mess to clean up. But well, a shift's a shift, James thought to himself as he quickly left the building, got into his mid-sized sedan, and drove off for his daughter's recital. End of story. Mysterious and spooky. Written by Act 1308. Francesco didn't know how long it had been since he'd been banished, since his mortal form was destroyed and he was sent to wander the endless limb between life and death. Most would have accepted their fate and passed on to the great beyond, but he was different. He had a reason to maintain his existence, a purpose to fulfill. People had to die. More to the point, at least one of his victims had to perish in agony and terror so that he could possess them and seek vengeance on his killers. His true name was not Francesco, of course. He had heard once that the great clowns of Europe had taken a high-sounding name as a parody of royalty to which they paid court, so he'd done the same. People had laughed at him for doing so. Laughed! Not at his antics as Francesco, but at him for taking such a high fulleton name. He'd been mocked and scorned, so of course he'd had to strike back. The dull-witted bumpkins could easily beat him to a pulp if he came at them head on, so he had little recourse but to sneak up and slither his way into their houses, to introduce ground glass into their food and rat poison to their moonshine. Some had been strangled in their sleep, while others had been hacked to pieces with an axe. But it was their children who proved to be his undoing. The children he left until the last, under the mistaken impression that they would be the easiest victims. 
half a dozen of these little rats, along with the irritatingly yappy little dog, had undone his plans and brought him low. He'd nearly gotten them on more than one occasion, but time and time again, they'd wriggled free of his traps and eventually turned the tables on him. This very last one. The door he had rigged to be proof against opening by either the stronger of the boys or the crafty of the girls had held firm against him after he was decoyed in there. Even the tiniest of vents and exits had been sealed to prevent so much as a scraggly mutt from wriggling free and somehow fetching help. When the door had slammed shut on him and the children fled his wrath, the coal oil had spilled down through the holes in the ceiling as it had been intended to do. Even the auto-lighting feature of the trap had gone off perfectly, much as he could have wished it didn't. And so the house caught fire and burned, and him was in it. He had died, slowly and in great agony, just as he had desired for them. Some may have saluted them as worthy opponents and gone on to whatever reward they'd earned, but not Francesco. He wanted revenge. The years had flickered by like wisps of fog by the time he returned his essence to the mortal plane. Not very much to his surprise, he found that the house that had been built on foundations of ones that he'd perished in possessed harshly gothic lines. Even in the absence, his anger and pain had twisted the intent of the builders, so that the construction looked more like it belonged in a high mountain pass in Transylvania than in Middle America. In other words, it was perfect. Whoever ventured within was going to suffer terribly at his immaterial hands before they died. And speaking of which, it appeared he had already made victims at hand. Pushing aside the spiked gate, venturing up the non-Euclidean crazy paving, past the overgrown thorn bushes to the towering front door. Almost tumbling within anticipation, he drifted down into the front hallway, ready to see them close up for the first time. The door creaked open, sounding as though the carpenter had heard of oil but decided to have nothing to do with it. One by one, they trooped inside, a tall fit man looking around with fiery interest, his dark-haired wife surveying the room with a cool reserve and a mysterious smile. A girl all in black with twin plaits and a poker face that could rival any gambler Francesco had ever seen, and a fat boy with a glint in his eyes that screamed that he was the type to poke and pry into places he wasn't supposed to. A bald fat man with more than a hint of crazy in his expression, an ancient crone of a woman, and finally a seven-foot monster of a man who was carrying all of the suitcases. Ah! exclaimed the first man in ringing tones, throwing out his arms in a flourish. This is perfect! Guarada Maya! I could not think of a better vacation home. Francesco wondered if the newcomer had problems with his sight. All the furniture in the main hall had sheets thrown over it, and cobwebs stretched from the wall to ceiling. And yet, he'd called it perfect. Children, you may go explore, his wife suggested. Mother, perhaps you could find the kitchen while Lurch brings in the rest of the luggage. Before the sentence was fully out of her mouth, the fat boy had launched himself up the main staircase, yelling something about dibs in the best room. His sister followed, much less precipitately, with a deadpan, shall we see, brother, while her mother continued to give orders. Francesco followed the girl. If he could give her a fright early on, he reasoned, she would be easy to reduce to hysteria later. Ignoring the sound of a spooning smack followed by a, I'm okay, that suggested the boy had jumped on a mattress and a dead run and bounced off and hit the wall. The girl turned aside into what appeared to be the bathroom, a festooned with cobwebs as the main hall. It had mirrors on all three sides of the room. Francesco gathered his energy and focused his will. All the hate and anger that he felt at the world flowed into the mirrors. The temperature in the room dropped by a few degrees. The trickles of blood began to run down the glass, and the girl ignored it. It wasn't that she didn't see it. She seemed to peer at one of the blood runnels and frowned slightly before she turned away to investigate the bench. Running her fingertip over it, she examined the results, her finger 
was black with crime. Francesca concentrated even harder. When the girl turned around, paint in blood on the wall wall with the words, You will die here. It was really ectoplasm that he could remove in an instant if she called for an adult, but it definitely looked genuine. He waited for the fit of hysterics or even a scream of terror. If she tried to bolt from the room, he was going to slam the door and lock it, so she would be half mad from fear before anyone found her. She did none of that, strolling over to the blood writing. She dabbed her finger in it, then put her finger in her mouth. Hmm, she murmured to herself. Rude. Francesco struggled to understand why she was acting this way. Why she wasn't running or screaming. I have it. She's paralyzed with terror. After standing immobile before the warning message for a few seconds longer, the girl opened the bathroom door and leaned out into the hallway. Brother dear, she called in that same emotionless voice. Aha! Her wits have befuddled with fear and she is attempting to call for help. The boy's head popped out of the door further down. He looked altogether too happy for someone who festooned with spider webs and had a large black widow crawling on his face. Yeah, you may have first pick of bedrooms, but this bathroom is mine. What? That made no sense. What? Why? The boy apparently agreed with Francesco's query. He peered suspiciously past her into the bathroom, still oblivious to the black widow, which was investigating his left ear. It's haunted, therefore I claim it. What? He shoved past her into the bathroom. Ah, oh, man, you already got bleeding mirrors and a death threat. I want a cool haunted bathroom too. Well then, you are going to have to find your own. The boy looked like he wanted to cry. Mom, Wednesday won't share her haunted bathroom. Then mother's voice floated back up the staircase. Wednesday, dear, share your toys with your brother. Haunted bathrooms? The father sounded positively thrilled. Morticia, my darling, we scored a real bargain with this one. Wednesday, who even names their child that, gave her brother a narrow-eyed stare. You have prevailed this time, brother dear, but I will have my revenge. Despite actually being a ghost, Francesco felt goosebumps run down his immaterial spine at the menace in her voice. The children were clearly insane. He was likely to have better results with the adults. As he drifted down the staircase, he heard the girl say, You are aware that there is a black widow attempting to nest in your left ear, are you not? Oh yeah, her brother enthused. Isn't she pretty? I'm calling her Esmeralda. You call every spider you get Esmeralda. Even the boy wants utterly, utterly insane. Francesco drifted down through the house and found the parents unpacking some of the suitcases. There was a rack on one side of the room, now holding several weapons. Francesco decided not to try his knife with the battle axe, but the judging sabers caught his eye. After the mother, Morticia, left the room on some errand, he lifted one of the sabers from the stand. It strained his ectoplasmic energy to lift and move it, but he forced it onward, aiming it at the man's back. <laughs> with a twisting evasive move, these would-be victim moved aside from the attempted attack. Very nice dish! Come see this! Before Francesco could bring the saber around again, the man had taken another one of the weapons from the rack. Blade clashed against Blade, his opponent holding an arm behind his back as he moved forward and backwards. He seemed to be positively enjoying himself as he fended off Francesco's attack. Gomez, what is it? Morticia emerged from the other doorway. Oh, I see. How delightful. Francesco decided to change targets, turning the blade towards the woman. Perhaps if the man saw his wife hurt or killed, he would drop his guard. But before he could get to her, a saber blew past him. She caught it at royalty and fended off his blow. Where did you find this one, darling? She asked as Francesco tried again, but his every effort failed. She was clearly as adept at fencing as a husband. I don't know, he replied happily. It just showed up. Well, this house is certainly a keeper, Morticia declared. Parrying another determined assault, we might have to move here part-time. His ectoplasmic strength almost strained. Francesco moved back, the saber drooping. He had no idea what was going on, but these adults seemed almost as demented as the children. Confirming his thoughts, Gomez turned towards Patricia. And guard! he cried, his sword flickering out towards her. 
she responded to his sally with a flickering repost that sent him dancing backwards, with white teeth gleaming and a broad smile as the blades rang lightly against each other. If anything, Francesco thought Gomez was trying even harder to skewer her than his own poor efforts had managed. Drooping the saber so the point stuck to the floorboards, Francesco left the room. Behind him, Gomez and Matisha didn't seem to notice as they continued their impromptu saber duel. The sound of metal on metal was a reminder that no matter how hard he tried, his revenge on the living was forever out of reach. When he reached the kitchen, he found a large cauldron in the place of an oven. A fire had been lit under it, and the old woman was busy stirring something in it. He had no sense of smell, so he didn't know what it was, but the steam that rose looked somehow unpleasant. On the bench nearby were rows of bottles. Francesco looked more closely, and found to his delight that many bore warnings about poison and horrific death. When the old woman turned her back to get more firewood, he snatched up one bottle after another and emptied them into the cauldron. She returned to her stirring, occasionally dropping some dried root or herb into the mix, without ever seeming to notice the empty bottles. Chuckling to himself, Francesco slunk off into the dark recesses of the house. When the intruders into his domain tasted that dead brew, they would know his vengeance at last. Finally, he would be reborn into a new body. Time passed all too slowly, but eventually the family gathered around the long table, which had a row of candles on it. Gomez sat at one end with Matisha at his right hand. Wednesday with her brother sat across from each other with the old woman beside the boy, and the fat bald man at the far end. There was one empty chair, which Francesco figured would belong to the enormous manservant. What was he called? Lurch? It suited him. As if thinking of his name summoned him, Lurch appeared from the direction of the kitchen, bearing a tray with bowls of a concoction which he had been stewing in the cauldron. Everyone got a bowl, and the larger one was placed in the middle of the table. Francesco cackled quietly to himself. Nobody would survive to take seconds. Lurch seated himself, and each of the diners applied themselves to the meal. Only two or three spoonsfuls in, Morticia turned to the old woman, Mother, she exclaimed, the stew tastes positively divine. What have you done differently? The old woman appeared into the spoon she was holding, squinting, as though she could determine the ingredients merely by looking at it. I don't know, she said in a high-pitched cackle. I made it just the same as normal. Maybe because of the scorpion tails were dried instead of fresh. Well, I like it, Gomez said heartily. I vote you make it this way every time. At the end of the table, the fat man hiccuped and raised a finger. "'What is it, Festa?' asked Morticia. "'Was there something you wanted to say?' Festa nodded, then opened his mouth and belched a deep and long. The effusions from his erection struck the first candle, causing a blast of flame to erupt half the length of the table. When it died away, the candle was melted a good third of its length, and both children were holding cooked marshmallows on sticks. "'That was a good one, Uncle Festa!' The boy enthused, then dipped his marshmallow in the stew and ate it. Can you do it again? Can I? Fester had an annoying voice that managed to be both high-pitched and gravelly at the same time. Watch me! He began shoveling stew into his mouth as fast as he could. Lost in dismay and frustration, Francesco drifted away again. No matter what he tried, the inhabitants of this house took his deadliest attempts on their lives and sanity and positively encouraged them. What kind of people were they? Eventually, his meanderings left him back to the kitchen, where there was now a game of cards going on. Vesta was there, along with Lurch, Morticia's mother, and what looked like a disembodied hand. As he watched, the hand laid down his cards, snapped its fingers for attention, then tapped the table. Two cards, thing. Here you go. Vesta picked up the deck and skimmed two cards into the hand's hand then looked around directly at Francesco. Oh, hey, look, Granny, it's our house guest. You mean, it's my little kitchen helper, cackled Granny. I saw him poking around when I was cooking, but I never thought he added something to the stew. She smiled broadly, showing missing teeth, as she beckoned. Come on in, join the game. What, what? You can see me. Francesco was taken aback, but, but nobody can see me. We can all see you. 
Presta explained kindly, as he dealt out five cars to an empty spot. For Adamses, that's what makes us special. We just pretend not to when you're trying to be invisible. Uh, that's just manners. As if in a dream, Francesco drifted around the side of the table and exerted himself to pick up the cards. But I've been trying to kill you all. Lurch made a noise like a malfunctioning rock crusher. After a moment, Francesco figured out that the man mountain was laughing. Don't mind him, Esther said, pitching his voice quietly enough that they probably could have heard him no further than the third floor. Murder attempts are how we Adamses say hello. You'll fit right in here. I mean, I remember the time I was being pursued by a vampire in Transylvania Mountains. Night and day he chased me, all because I'd skipped out on the bar tab. What about that time that I had to fight the, the werewolf? Complained Granny. I mean, uh, it was Cousin Loretta, but she had this terrible thing about shedding all over the furniture. So one day I had enough. Loretta, I said, you're going to have to clean up after yourself. Insane, thought Francesco. They're all insane. But that's okay. Because I think I've gone mad too. End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons and channel members. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, it's difficult to pronounce, Lord Aristocrat, Dragzoon, WRE, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.